Hello. Hi, everybody, and welcome at the Azure Stack HCI Day 2020. We are very excited that you're joining us from all corners of the planet to hear amazing speakers from Microsoft, from the MVP community to talk about Azure Stack HCI. So to learn more about the event that we have lined up for today, what better way than to ask the creator himself? So Karsten Rachval, please come on the virtual stage. How are yeah, you? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? Hey, I'm doing hey very well. Yeah. Um, so Karsten, tell us about it. So you planned for this event for quite some time right now. Tell us what is Azure Stack HCI Day about? 
Yeah, um, Microsoft is uh, bringing out a new uh, member of the OS family. It's called Azure Stack HCI, and it's purpose built for uh, hyperconverged infrastructure. And I do this technology, the, the former technology, Storage Spaces Direct, now quite a while, and I'm very excited about it, even after five years uh, doing that. And I thought, uh, why not do an online event where Microsoft presenters can present all the great news about Azure Stack HCI. And we have so many great speakers. I'm so excited that uh, Microsoft Redmond, uh, the product group, uh, uh, decided to join us in this event and talk about the great stuff they built. That's amazing, Carson. So you mentioned uh, Microsoft speakers from uh, Redmond. I believe you have in total, you have 10 or 11 speakers, right? 11, yeah. 11, uh, yeah. So 12 speakers, but 11 are from Microsoft. 11 from Microsoft. Can you tell us a little bit more about the speakers and the expertise and, of course, the, the topics they will cover during the event today? Oh, that's a good one. So um, we have, for example, we have some new speakers from the Microsoft product group, but also some well-known one like uh, Cosmos Darwin or Jeff Woolsey, John Marlin, Matt McSpirit. Uh, they are known for years now in the area and um, um, they will talk all about Azure Stack HCI. There are some specialties, a hybrid. We have um, Azure, uh, how it's called, Kubernetes services for Azure Stack HCI, but also what's new in Hyper-V and Hyper-V management, benchmarking, how to deploy clusters. It's so much uh, that is going on there. Uh, and I don't have the agenda in front of me, but uh, we will look at it very soon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, it's going to be seven hours of uh, very exciting uh, content coming up. Like you already yeah. mentioned, right? You have amazing speakers uh, from Microsoft Redmond, uh, community speakers, and then speaking of the community, Carson. So we all know you're very passionate. You're very active when it comes to community. You run your own uh, conferences. Uh, you pivoted now due to the COVID situation to a virtual conference, and you actually involved people from the community in the planning. So can you please tell us a little bit more about the community supporters you have on board for this web conference? Yeah, so uh, I was uh, normally, um, or originally, I was planning a, set, um, a conference with a lot of community speakers, but there were so many Microsoft uh, presenters who wanted to present about their own products, who I said there is no room for MVPs. Uh, and I asked a lot of MVPs like you to help me with the <laughs> conference. And they will uh, they will answer the questions in the Q and A. So I hope that the attendees have a lot of questions. Answer them, uh, ask them in the Q and A. Uh, and uh, we have you. We have Didier van Hoye. He is my how you call it Hyper V amigo from Belgium. We have Daryl. Uh, Daryl is uh, responsible for the S two D Slack channel. We have Dave Kahula from. Um, Canada joining us. We we have Jan Torre um, from Norway. Uh, Norway, yes, it's Norway. Um, who else? We have Manfred, who is doing Manfred Helber, who is doing the show with me. I'm sitting actually in his uh, professional studio, and maybe you wonder about the background you see. <laughs> there is Manfred <laughs> in the picture. Um, who else do we have? I don't. I um, we have Jaro Helmut here. Otto from uh, Austria. He's doing a lot of S2D work and uh, a Microsoft PFE. He has now another title, uh, Jaromir Kasper. Uh, he has done great work with his uh, WS Lab uh, scenario and he's also a speaker at all the events. Who did I forget? Uh, me? I'm, I'm helping too. Um, they, we are nine. So, Izzy, do you see the speakers? Did I forget so, uh, one from my head? I will I quickly name them. I memorized all of them at the top of my head. So, we have Jan Tore, you mentioned, Didier, you mentioned, Manfred sitting next to you, yourself, of course, uh, me, you mentioned. Oh, uh, we have Jaromir Kaspar from Microsoft, right, who's joining us from uh, Czech Republic, um, Daryl van den Pel. And Helmut. So yeah, that's a great uh, that's a great squad of uh, community supporters that you have uh, helping out with the event. So just to amplify, you just mentioned the uh, Q and A, right, for the session. So we highly uh, motivate and encourage everybody who's uh, watching or who's listening to the event today. Feel free to ask your questions, right? Even though it's yeah. not an in-person event, we are online. 
However, the speakers are here um, 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 yeah, to answer your questions, as well as our amazing community supporters that we just showed. They're also here throughout the whole evening. They will be monitoring the chat. They will be answering questions, so don't be shy and shoot any uh, Azure Stack HCI questions you would like to uh, you would like to ask, right? That's true. And I also want to mention our our sponsors. Uh, we have uh, Microsoft and Lenovo as sponsors. And you know, there's a lot of stuff involved, building websites uh, and so on. So I'm very happy I have uh, those guys. I, I said only one sponsor session because I want to deliver or I want the Microsoft people talk about the product. And uh, honestly, they didn't have much time at Ignite this year. So Azure Stack HCI was not re really presented at uh, at Ignite. There were other stuff that, that was uh, in the focus. And um, so I'm very happy that they talk. I think that's, this is the most session we ever heard about this new product. Uh, and I'm also very interested in the sessions and we will learn some new stuff. Uh, at least one new thing will be here presented that was not never presented before and maybe there is more. So I'm I'm also very interested to hear about it. All right, so that's uh, that's very exciting, of course. And then what I also want to mention is uh, for our attendees around the world. So I believe you have registrations coming from like all different continents, from different countries. Uh, it's really the community uniting to uh, to attend the conference. So also stay active with us on social media, right? So if you're tweeting about the event, um, make sure you use uh, hashtag Azure Stack HCI Day. Um, and we will be monitoring and, of course, uh, uh, looking forward to seeing where in the world you're watching uh, the event from. So, yeah, speaking of Kirsten, you said you are in the studio, right? Um, to record, uh, uh, to, to well, to host the event today. Um, we are used to seeing you on stage in front of the class, yeah. giving workshops, giving trainings, uh, presenting at large uh, Microsoft events, as well as the smaller community events. And now you're actually sitting in a studio behind a small webcam, behind a microphone to do that. So to ask you, Kirsten, for the past few months, how has that been for you to pivot to this whole new online world? Yeah, to, uh, to be really honest, I, I love to be present in front of people. So I'm, I, I, love, I love to interact with the audience. And um, this year there were not much in-person conferences. I, I, I maybe attended two most. One was in Switzerland. It was uh, uh, your experts uh, live Switzerland event and yeah. it was it was different. It was nice to stay on stage again and interact with the people and uh, when they ask questions or on. But now online is all we have. It's not the same, but we have to cope with it. And I hope uh, I hope the pandemic will end next year, hopefully. So in 2022, we will hope uh, I hope we will have in person events again. Yeah. Yeah, let's yeah, uh, let's hope so. On, um, on experts live Europe, I had to skip on uh, on uh, Cloud and Data Center Conference Germany. So hopefully we have that again soon. Yeah, yeah, indeed. We all uh, we all feel the downsides, of course, of not not being able to uh, to host a Cloud and Data Center Conference or indeed Experts Live or other uh, community or large Microsoft uh, events. So indeed, I mean, I think um, also from a community perspective, uh, there there's a lot out there, right? We have a lot of content that's available, uh, a lot of session recordings, and I just love how you um, chose Azure Stack HCI because it is a topic that we don't have like a big focus on um, many events, right? So I love it how you really chose a topic specific and dive deep into that and got all the speakers from Microsoft to uh, to cover their sessions. So I think that's, um, yeah, it's going to be very exciting uh, seven hours ahead of us. I hope so. So I hope uh, our Microsoft speakers will will join us very soon. <laughs> I, they are not there. They are here. The they are already there. Are already here. <laughs> yes. Cool. Um, so uh, as Izzy said, we hope you engage in the Q&A and on social media so that maybe uh, people that didn't hear about Azure Stack HCI, we, we, we did what we can on social media, but maybe not all of it uh, learned it. So if you engage about it, they can always join the, the ongoing show. And there will be a recording here in Germany where I'm sitting now. It's already five in the afternoon, so the show will go until midnight or near midnight. And uh, some people have to work tomorrow. So if you pop out uh, 
and team will teams will not uh, uh, disappoint you. We will have a recording and we'll we'll publish it also soon. Yeah. All okay. right, then we have uh, we have a few more minutes right until uh, the first session is going to start. So before we go and dive deep into everything we want to know about Azure Stack HCI, is there anything else, Carson, that you would like to share uh, share with the attendees who are already now part of the event? The most important part is have fun, enjoy. I hope that sessions are technical. I, I asked the speakers about technical sessions, so I hope we will not have too much marketing here. Of course, a <laughs> bit, there will be a bit marketing, but I love technical sessions and I know people that uh, engage with me also love technical sessions. So I hope we learn a lot of new stuff and I'm very grateful that uh, all the Microsoft speakers joined in and also my community fellows helped a lot with the conference and now let's have fun and uh, I hope everything went well because we had we had some issues uh, yesterday and today with uh, with teams uh, how it's called teams teams live event what teams are using live screen, event yes. <laughs> uh, Manfred was really uh, sweating when I uh, when I came here uh, <laughs> And his his audio cards were not working and so on. But now it worked. And <laughs> don't it don't focus good. on that. That was yesterday. That was yesterday. So what happened yesterday is in the past. Now we're going to focus <laughs> on uh, on today on the upcoming seven hours. And also just for you guys there in the studio, if something goes wrong, it can happen. Okay, don't start sweating. Try of course to uh, to solve it. But we're all human. We're all trying our very best from wherever in the world we're tuning in from to present our sessions. Um, so also if your dog shows up in the background or if your cat jumps uh, in front of the computer, I think that's all. Um, that's all going to be fine. Yeah. So all right. So to be uh, exactly sharp on time, as uh, Swiss as I am right now, um, I'll I'll give the stage over to you, Carson, to introduce our first uh, speakers of today, and um, yeah, give it away. Have a great uh, have a great event. Yeah, thank you, Izzy, and uh, we will hear from you back uh, uh, at another session, right? Absolutely. The easy way to deploy Azure Stack HCI. I love it how you know all the titles. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Izzy. Um, I, I will not waste a lot of words. We now have uh, Cosmos Darwin and Karim Haif. I hope I hope I said the name correctly, and they will tell us all about hybrid is built in. How does it really work? So Cosmos and Karim, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Karsten. Let me just confirm that you can hear me all right. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. OK, cool. And you should also be able to see my screen. Is that right? That's right. All right, terrific. Well, thank you very much. And I guess good evening to the audience that I assume is mostly in Europe. Uh, it's morning for us over here. But thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about Azure Stack HCI. Uh, I won't waste very long on the introduction because we actually have a ton of content. And yes, Karsten, it is technical content. Uh, so we'll just dive right into it. Uh, suffice to say, my name is Cosmos. I'm a program manager at Microsoft. Uh, you'll be hearing throughout the session from a colleague of mine, Karim, who's also a program manager at Microsoft. And yeah, we're here to unpack how the hybrid functionality in Azure Stack HCI works. Now, our goal for this session is to really demystify one of the big new changes in Azure Stack HCI, which is this hybrid connectivity that's built natively into the operating system. And we're going to do that by diving deep into the internals of what actually goes on when you register. How does it work? And so we'll cover, you know, the experience of registering that you as a user need to know, but also what happens underneath when you register, what's actually going on, what are the internals doing. Then we'll talk about connectivity requirements. There's some frequently asked questions that we'll try to address. And we'll talk about data and privacy as well, because we know that people are super sensitive to that, especially with hybrid products like Azure Stack HCI. Now, I do think it's important to emphasize before we get too far into this content, that this is a deep dive, right? Karsten requested technical content. That's what we're delivering here. Uh, and so we're not going to start from the beginning of like what is Azure Stack HCI. We're not going to start with the 101 level content. And so in case you missed it, you can catch up on some of the announcements for Azure Stack HCI from earlier in the year. Uh, almost all of them are recorded and available online. For example, we did a session at Microsoft Inspire where we shared some pretty significant news about the next innovation coming for Azure Stack HCI. 
So if you missed it, I strongly encourage you, first of all, to watch the rest of this event because lots of other speakers are going to cover various parts of the news. Uh, but also to go check out the recording online. It's available on YouTube for the Inspire session. Uh, the, we also had some content at Microsoft Ignite. We've had a few blogs. So I want to just emphasize we're not going to cover that from the beginning. I'm not going to repeat all of this information. Uh, this session in particular is really going to be a deep dive into the internals of how hybrid connectivity works. So if you missed this news, you want to go back and watch that probably uh, to sort of understand the context for this talk. OK, without any further ado, then let's jump in. So the big news for Azure Stack HCI from July, right, spoiler, is that there is a new dedicated operating system specifically for Azure Stack HCI that Microsoft is making available. This is the latest version of the Azure hypervisor that you can get your hands on commercially with built in software defined storage and software defined networking and a reduced composition that is streamlined and tailored specifically to be a virtualization host. You can see here a few uh, screenshots essentially of using that product. You can tell it's got some common heritage with Windows Server, but it's also very different. This is no longer the Windows Server that uh, we've used to previously with the Azure Stack HCI program. This is now a, a special purpose built operating system that has some important differences and some similarities. Now on the similarities front, I just want to be very, very clear before we get into the hybrid stuff. This is still an OS that you run on your servers on your premises. I want to be super clear about that. You have your location, whether that's branch office or a data center or an enterprise server room, whatever your physical premises are. You order a set of servers from your favorite OEM. That could be Lenovo or it could be any of the leading global OEMs. And then you install the Azure Stack HCI operating system on those servers. It's a bare metal OS that runs on your servers on your premises. I know that seems basic, but I want to I want to emphasize that because we're going to talk about so many things that have changed in the next section. And I want to make sure we stay anchored on the things that are not changing. This is absolutely still what the Azure Stack HCI OS does. Now, that's what's that's what's common. Let's talk about some of the differences. The Azure Stack HCI operating system is delivered as an Azure hybrid service. And that actually has a number of different things that it means. One example is that there is no software license that you have to buy to use the Azure Stack HCI operating system. You do not go out and purchase a SKU upfront in order to use this. It is automatically billed to your Azure subscription. So it figures out how much it needs to cost based on how many cores you have, and then it automatically charges you. You don't need to keep track of how many licenses you have or figure out if you're properly licensed or worry about any of that. This is a big difference compared to Windows Server. There's also no standalone legal agreement that you need to read and sign. There's no end user license in this product. It is covered under your Azure online services terms. If you're a business that already uses Azure, then you have already signed all the paperwork that you need to use Azure Stack HCI. There's also no separate support contract number. So you, you, know, you don't have to make an agreement with Microsoft and then when you call support, it's like, okay, who are you? And you have to get your number and then prove that you, you have support. None of that applies to Azure Stack HCI. You get Azure support that just works seamlessly through the Azure portal. When you submit a request, we automatically know who you are and you'll get excellent su support and care from the Azure support team. And there's no versions that you need to, you know, go out and buy the next version and then worry about upgrading and migrating your data from one to the next. Instead, Azure Stack HCI has continuous feature updates so that it keeps getting better over time and everyone is always running the same and the latest version of Azure Stack HCI. So as you can see, there are some similarities, right? This is still fundamentally an OS that you install on your servers, on your premises, but it's pretty different too. There's some pretty big changes to how this product is packaged up. Now, all of these changes make it necessary for Azure Stack HCI to be registered in the context of your Azure subscription, right? How else would any of this work? How would we provide you Azure support? How would we cover you under the Azure terms? How would we bill your Azure subscription unless your cluster is registered in the context of your Azure account? And so to make that possible, the Azure Stack HCI OS includes new OS level native integration with Azure. Specifically, there is a new operating system component called HCI SVC 
If you're familiar with like CLUS SVC, the cluster service, this is the HCI SVC component. And this is the component that's responsible for securely storing your Azure registration and connection state within the HCI operating system. And it actually does a lot. It manages your projection into the Azure portal, your connection heartbeat, the automatic licensing and billing I described, certificate renewal, diagnostics, and actually a whole lot more. In other words, this is the, the make hybrid easy secret sauce is this HCI SVC component that's been added to the OS. I wanna be clear, this is not an agent and it's not an agent in the sense that none of the hassles that you might think of associated with an agent apply here. There's nothing you need to install or enable or start or troubleshoot. HCI SVC is updated together with the OS source code. It is a core part of the HCI OS. And it's an always on, always running protected process that you as the user don't need to worry about. It's just built in. It's also cluster aware. So if you add nodes to a cluster later, Azure State automatically propagates to the new nodes. And if you remove a node, then it automatically cleans up the Azure registration state. So we can actually see this component in action to really show you what I mean. So here's a quick demo of the HCI SVC component. Here I have a machine that I've just installed with the Azure Stack HCI operating system. Obviously I'm using Windows Admin Center to look at this machine. And in Admin Center, I can see, for example, the services that are running. And for a normal service like data deduplication, I would be able to stop it normally, right? But you'll see, I can look in this list for HCI. There's HCI SVC. This is the component I was describing. You can see from the description that it's you know, responsible for synchronizing Azure Stack HCI with Azure, uh, but actually I can't stop it. And also I didn't start it, right? This is completely just automatic and taken care of for me. It is a built-in, always running, protected process. Now, just to show you that this isn't like admin center magic, I can go into PowerShell and uh, I'll remote to this machine and then I can get the process for HCI SVC. There it is, right? It's just a normal protected process. Uh, and if I try to like stop it by its process ID, for example, that won't work, right? Access is denied. Even though I'm an administrator on this machine, this is a process that always needs to be running. And this is the process that makes it possible for me to run get Azure Stack HCI and see my registration and connection state, right? Because this is the process that's tracking that for me. Uh, and you can see that although I've made a cluster, I actually haven't registered yet, right? My registration status says out of policy. Uh, my connection status is blank. I have never connected. I have no last connected time. Uh, and that's, that's what I expect, right? Because I just set up this OS. I haven't done anything. Uh, so all that's happening is this component is there and it's running and it's keeping track of my state for me. Now, an important note is that, you know, this says out of policy, and it, it really does mean out of policy. For the Azure Stack HCI operating system, registering with Azure is required. Until you do so, the operating system's not validly licensed, it's not supported, and it actually has reduced functionality. You can't create virtual machines until you've registered with Azure. So that gives rise to an important question. How do you register? And uh, for this next portion, to answer that question, I'm gonna hand it over to Karim, are you there? Yes, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So thank you, thank you, Cosmos. So how do you register? And so there are actually two easy ways to register to uh, Azure, Azure, register Azure Stack HCI. And one of them is through Windows Admin Center, or you can actually use Azure PowerShell as well. And they both actually do the same thing uh, because Admin Center is actually calling the Azure Stack, uh, Azure PowerShell underneath anyway. Uh, but, and since it's a deep dive, we will be covering more on the Azure uh, PowerShell uh, portion today. So basically the experience is this way. So basically what you need to do is you need your Azure subscription, you need your Azure region, um, and then you actually need your sign-in information, right? And optionally, you can also, while you're registering, you can name your resource and resource group too. So to sign in, like let's just now now dive into like multiple of these, like and, and how, how we can actually get this information, right? So one of them we said was that you need your Azure subscription. So as you, Azure, to find your Azure, Azure subscription, of course, first thing you need to do is if you haven't, you need to sign up for Azure. If you have, then you know, like then you just go to portal.azure.com and you navigate to your uh, left hand side and you see your subscriptions there. You click on that and then you'll see a list of subscriptions. 
um, just find the one that you need. Uh, you may have multiple like this one, or you may have one. You just copy paste the subscription ID. That's 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 all you have to do. And then the second one is your Azure region. And for Azure region, um, today, as you can see from this map, we have actually have uh, support for uh, three Azure regions, East US, uh, Southeast Asia, and West Europe. And going forward in coming into the 2021, we want to open up to all the others, uh, all these others that you listed, you see the list there. And uh, just to note, uh, two of these are sovereign, uh, sovereign Azure clouds, like one of them is Azure Government uh, Virginia and China East 2. So what you do is you basically select, uh, select one of these uh, regions. And let's now see how you can do this in a demo. And we are going to be using, like I said, PowerShell, uh, Azure PowerShell. And for this, of course, what you need is your uh, Azure PowerShell. And uh, we didn't include this. This does is not included in the OS, uh, but you can easily go go to the PowerShell gallery and download it. The reason why it's not included is because uh, we are going to be updating it every uh, three weeks, um, so you will need a new one anyway. So you just need to download it, and then you do the install that dash module. And once you install this module, then you're ready. Okay, so what you'd first do is you do get cluster, you see your cluster, and then you get cluster node, you see that all your clusters are up and running, and then you can do get, get Azure Stack HCI, and you see that it's not registered yet. And now you use your register, register dash Azure Stack HCI. Of course, you, do, you need your subscription ID, and then you need your region, like we mentioned. And in this example, we are going to use West Europe. You click on it, and now it starts uh, install, install, installation. And now what you need to do is, this is the authentication part, and we use device login, Microsoft device login. You just copy this code, go to microsoft.com slash device login, and you need to enter your code that you just copied. You click next, and you, you sign in with your account, and now you signed in. Um, and now, you know, automatically the, the command that just continues. This whole thing takes around three to four minutes usually. And uh, and when you, once you register, you see your result in there like that. And you can just do the get uh, Azure Stack HCI again, and you see that you're registered. So the next thing you should do is now that you registered, uh, the fun part is you actually go to portal.azure.com and you can actually see your cluster right there, <coughs> uh, demo cluster. And, and when you look at it, you see a bunch of details and you see your uh, the version, uh, Azure Stack ACI preview, and you see your resource group, you see your region, and you also, of course, see your nodes uh, right there. So yeah, that's that's how you register. Back to you, Cosmos. Oh, one more part. Uh, <laughs> so here's like all the uh, commands that we used uh, in this uh, in this in this section, and so you can use this as rest reference and uh, register your Azure Stack ACI. Okay, now really back to you, Cosmos. All right, thank you so much, Kareem. That was awesome. Okay. So that's the user experience of registering. And I hope you agree that even the PowerShell experience is pretty simple, right? As Kareem told you, there are two parameters that you need. There's a few other optional ones, but there's two that you need, the subscription ID and the region. And they're both pretty easy to choose, both pretty easy to get. And as you saw, the commandlet just runs. It's all one shot, pretty straightforward. So I say all of that because we're gonna get into the details now of what happens underneath when you do that. But I think it's important to emphasize you don't need to know this. As a user, this is not essential information that I'm sharing because I know that the community that we have here today are, are very engaged and very interested in understanding how these technologies work. So we want to share that. But this is not what, I, what you're about to see is not something that the average customer actually needs to worry about. It's all the magic that happened in that easy little demo that Cream just showed you in like, you know, barely a couple minutes. Okay, so deep, being, deep dive into the details, what actually happens when you register? 
Uh, broadly speaking, there are four things that occur. The first is that we create an Azure AD app identity. This is an application identity within your, the, you know, the customer's Azure Active Directory tenant. You can think of an app identity a little bit like a service principal or uh, almost like a virtual user, if you will, a proxy user. This application identity is going to be used by the on-premises cluster so that it can have some permissions in the context of your Azure AD. This is important because the on-premises cluster is going to need to interact with the Azure Stack HCI cloud service and the Azure Stack HCI resource provider. And when it does that, it's going to be constrained by the role-based access control of Azure Active Directory. And so we need to have a proxy identity that we can assign permissions to. And to be clear, there are permissions that it needs, right? And so there are two permissions. You can actually see them in the screenshot here in the bottom left-hand side. Um, they're both pretty innocuous. One of them is we need to be able to sync billing information from the cluster up into the cloud. The other is that we need to be able to sync census information. This is the, the properties that get displayed in the Azure portal, right? This is so we can show you things like version and machine name. And so we need to be able to upload those two things from on-prem into Azure, and for that we need permission to do so. Now, if you are the administrator in your Azure Active Directory, you'll be able to grant these permissions directly. And that's what happened in the demo that Kareem just showed, right? So it was kind of the easy case, the smooth case. He is the administrator on the subscription that he used and, and more, more importantly on the AAD tenant that that subscription is in. And so he was able to just register and the permissions were granted automatically, right? Because that commandlet is designed to make it easy. If you aren't an AAD administrator in the tenant where you're registering, then you'll need to ask your admin to grant consent either directly to the application or they can delegate those permissions to you and then you can grant them to this app identity. Uh, if you experience this, then what you'll see is you need to navigate in the Azure portal, as you see on the left here, to Azure AD and then app registrations and then API permissions and then click grant consent. It's just one extra step. So this is the first thing that happens is we create this Azure AD app identity. Now, the whole point of that app identity is that the on-premises nodes are going to, from time to time, send information up into Azure using this identity, right? And so it's very important that this app identity can recognize and trust those on-premises machines that are going to do that. And for that, of course, we use certificates. So each cluster node, as you can see here in the illustration on the right, will generate a self-signed certificate, and then it will store the private key securely in HCI SVC, and transmit the public key up into that Azure AD app identity. Now, uh, the default experience is that this is completely managed by the cluster. So as I said, there's nothing that a user needs to do or worry about here. There's one certificate per cluster node. It's just an industry standard X509 cert. Uh, we self-sign it with an extremely long key length using RSA, uh, and the certificate is set to expire after one year, but it automatically rolls over and renews. All of this is handled for you by HCI SVC. And so we believe that this default behavior is completely secure enough for anyone, for Microsoft, for governments, for the military. Uh, this is what we recommend, is to stick with the simple default behavior where everything is taken care of. Now we know that some customers like to create opportunities to shoot themselves in the foot. I love you guys. And so we did design this so that you can bring your own certificate. Uh, if you have a favorite certificate authority and you'd prefer to have them sign the cert, uh, you can do that. You just need to bring the cert and put it into the local certificate store on each machine. And then when you register, there is a parameter, an optional parameter, where you can provide the thumbprint for that certificate. Of course, the challenge with that approach is it means you are responsible for renewing that certificate. And so that's why I make the joke about, you know, creating opportunities to shoot yourself in the foot because it's a lot of hassle compared to what we recommend, which is simply to let the cluster take care of it for you. So that's the second thing that happens. The third thing is we create an Azure resource. Now, so far we've been talking about Azure Active Directory, which is part of what goes on inside of your tenant in Azure. But there's also, of course, your subscription. And then within your subscription, there are resources which are organized into resource groups. Now, to make Azure Stack HCI possible, Microsoft created a new resource provider in Azure called the Azure Stack HCI resource provider. This is what provisions this new resource when you register. The resource gets that gets created, there's one per cluster that you register, and it has type Microsoft.AzureStackHCI slash cluster. And to be clear, it's a first class ARM object, right? So it's visible in the Azure portal, like Kareem showed you. 
It participates fully in Search and Microsoft Graph and things like that. You can organize your Azure Stack HCI resources with tags. You can place them into resource groups. It is, it is truly the Azure Resource Manager that Azure Stack HCI is participating with here. And this is important because it's what provides the foundation for hybrid management. So fleet scale monitoring, VM self-service, and all these other scenarios that we're so excited to be working on build on top of the presence of this HCI resource and this HCI resource provider in Azure. Now you can see here in the image on the right that not only does that resource get provisioned from the RP and placed into a resource group in your subscription, but of course it's also essential that uh, in order for that resource to have meaningful descriptive properties, some basic information does get sent from the cluster up into that resource as well to make that possible. And this is all the different things that are going on in that you know minute or so that that command line was running in the demo that Karima showed you. Okay, and then the fourth and final thing is uh, what we'll call first sync. And you can think of it a little bit like issuing a license. Now I should put license in quotation marks here because it's not really a license, strictly speaking, but it kind of behaves like one. Azure Stack HCI day to day will attempt to sync with Azure twice a day, meaning every 12 hours. Every time that it successfully syncs, it will check if your subscription is active, meaning you know your email address is still valid and you paid your bill and things like that. And if your subscription is active, then it will automatically refresh your, again, in quotes, license for using Azure Stack HCI. Now there is really a, an actual cryptographic license here that the cloud service pushes down onto each of the clustered nodes. And this is a license that uh, has a 30 day expiration period. And every time it gets refreshed, that clock essentially gets reset to 30 days. Now what this means is that Azure Stack HCI can go temporarily disconnected for an hour or a day or a week or even multiple weeks because all you need is at least every 30 days to successfully sync so that you get a refreshed license that resets the clock back to 30 days, right? And if ever then, if ever you're disconnected for a, an extremely long period of time, like far longer than 30 days, then this license will expire and you'll see that when you run get Azure Stack HCI, you'll be in the out of policy state that we were at at the beginning. It's like if you hadn't registered before. Now, in addition to this regular sync that goes on every 12 hours, of course, the first sync happens when you register. And so that's why it's the fourth step here. And you, the user, have the ability to sync whenever you want. And so in Windows Admin Center, you can go to settings and initiate a sync with just a click of a button. There's also a built-in sync dash Azure Stack HCI PowerShell commandlet, which you can use to initiate a sync. This is useful if, for example, you noticed that uh, it's actually not synced in a few days and you're wondering if something went something went wrong, you changed your firewall or something and now it's not working. You can easily troubleshoot by initiating syncs using the sync commandlet. And in get Azure Stack HCI, you, you can directly see the connection status, whether you are in fact connected or not. And if, if not, you'll be able to see when you last connected, which should usually be within the last day or so, because again, it will try twice a day. So this is really the fourth of the four things that happen behind the scenes when you register. We create the AAD app identity, we create certificates so that the app identity trusts the on-premises nodes. We create the Azure resource in the Azure Resource Manager in your subscription, place it into a resource group, and then we sync the on-premises cluster with that resource, which includes uploading basic information as well as you know, billing information that will be used later. And in exchange for that, a temporary license is sent down onto the nodes. That's what happens when you register in more detail than you'll ever really need to know. But hopefully this helps to demystify what's going on, right? There's no magic here. Um, it is a robust and convenient way to make hybrid easy. That's what we're building. Now, all this talk about sort of what information is flowing between on-premises and the cloud, I think gives rise to some pretty reasonable questions around what are the actual connectivity requirements for this product? Now, there's a few frequently asked questions that we can just run through quickly. Uh, the first one is like, does Azure Stack HCI require continuous connectivity? No, it's designed to handle periods of limited connectivity or even zero connectivity. And what happens if your connection temporarily goes down? Well, that's fine. All the host infrastructure keeps running, all the virtual machines keep running, everything works as normal, and you can use local tools to manage it during that time until your connection comes back up. How long can you go with the connection down? As I described on the previous slide, you can go up to a maximum of 30 consecutive days, which is a very long time. We've never seen outages uh, go on longer than that. Can you use Azure Stack HCI and never connect to Azure, meaning like in a completely air-gapped way? 
Um, no, you can't, right? This is how the automatic licensing works. It does need to periodically connect. And are there bandwidth or latency requirements between HCI and the cloud? For this connection up to the cloud, no, there's not. Uh, limited bandwidth connections like a T1 line or a cellular connection, those are fine. Uh, as you'll see in a moment, the amount of data we upload is just a few kilobytes. Now, I also want to emphasize that uh, Azure access, right, the fact that these nodes need to be able to access Azure, is very different from unlimited internet access. To be very precise, the connection that Azure Stack HCI needs is outbound only over port 443, meaning HTTPS only, to well-known Azure IP addresses only. Some of you may not know this. There's actually this concept called service tags, network service tags in Azure, where Azure publishes a, a list of every IP address used by Azure services that it keeps updated continuously. There's, new, there's a new version published every week. And you can specifically target exactly the Azure services that Azure Stack HCI needs to reach. It's not even all of Azure. It's a tiny slice of Azure. It's the ones you see here on the upper right hand side. Right, we need the Azure Resource Manager, Azure Active Directory, Azure Front Door, Azure Arc Infrastructure, Traffic Manager, and the PowerShell Gallery. Those are the things that Azure Stack HCI needs outbound HTTPS access to. And you can minimize risk by scoping very tightly the rules of your firewall to only allow access to those well-known endpoints, which again are published using network service tags. And coming soon, we're actually going to configure the Defender Firewall rules automatically for you. So you don't have to worry about that. You just have to worry about uh, if there's an external like perimeter firewall in your environment, then of course you'll need to configure that to allow this traffic. OK, now as we talk about data being exfiltrated and leaving your premises and going up to Azure, I think it gives rise to some reasonable questions around data and privacy. So for this part, I'm going to hand it back to Kareem. Thank you, Cosmos. Hi again, everyone. Um, so in this section, I want to talk a little bit about our ambitious goals for data privacy in Azure Stack HCI. And one of these goals is to be 100% transparent, and the other one is to raise the bar for data privacy. So in the table below, I want to um, compare Azure Stack HCI with Windows Server and the future of Azure Stack HCI product. And as you can see, Windows Server is licensed under a EULA. So it collects telemetry with Windows Telemetry, and you and you, you may also know that if you don't change anything, in Windows Telemetry is enabled by default in enhanced level in Windows. And like Cosmos mentioned, Azure Stack HCI is a purpose-built new operating system, and that is actually Azure service that you run on premises. So it's quite different than Windows. Most obvious difference is that it's not licensed under EULA. It's actually licensed under Azure Online Services Terms, Azure OST. So also the requirement and needs are quite different with Azure Stack ECI. Most importantly, uh, there's a great need to have a proper, really great uh, service health monitoring in place for Azure Stack ECI. This is needed so that we can keep our promise to our customers and keep Azure Stack ECI up to date, per, uh, performant and secure at all times. Therefore, we did a um, conscious decision and turned Windows Telemetry completely off by default in Azure Stack HCI. You can still turn it on after installation if you if you want, but it's off by default. And we created a very simple but effective service health monitoring service and collects bare minimum. And when I say bare minimum, I really be, mean bare minimum. We really kept the bar really high with, within the team. Um, as, uh, Cosmos, can you go back? One slide, yeah. So the um, going forward with Azure Stack HCI, what we are going to do is that we are going to get onboarded to DPSW. For those of you that didn't hear of DPSW, it's uh, it's short for Data Processor Service for Windows. It's the most in its most basic form. It's basically a new option for enterprise customers uh, to control their Windows diagnostics data. It was announced this summer. I think back in July, and it's in public preview right now. The beauty of DPSW that it makes uh, the customer the controller of their data instead of Microsoft. So um, this way they can see their data, they can delete, they can share, not share. They can choose whatever they want since they have the control of their data. Okay, can we go to the next slide? 
So with this information now, let's take a look at the questions that we hear most regarding the data and privacy. The first question is, does Azure Stack ACI sync with the cloud? We only sync minimal diagnostic data to keep uh, our service uh, working properly and secure. The second uh, and third actually is all about like personal data and personal identifiable information. Um, and very simply, I can say that we don't collect personally identifiable information. Therefore, we don't send or we don't store uh, data in the cloud, uh, personal PI data in the cloud. The closest thing we collect is cluster ID and hash of hardware ID. And then, you know, like we get questions like uh, how much uh, data is uh, sent to the cloud. It's very negligible, few kilobytes a day. And then, you know, like how is the diagnostics, diagnostics data is used. We retain the data 60 days in the United States and we only we use only the aggregates for analysis. So just to prove uh, that we are 100% transparent, we actually put this slide together to show you everything that we collect for service health monitoring. So this is everything we have. Uh, <laughs> and this actually has some results from our test server as well. I know it's hard to read, uh, but we want to show you all the information that we, it, it actually can fit all in one slide. So if you look closely, uh, and when you get the slides, then maybe you can see it, uh, we only uh, collect information like OEM information, TPM version, size and number of drives, uh, the, um, the network, uh, NICs, uh, etc. So uh, as a matter of fact, you can see exactly what you're sending. Um, you don't have to uh, read the slide like, uh, like the, the, the small, small letters. Uh, all you have to do is in your environment, you just need to enable diagnostics uh, event log. And like like in the first uh, commandlet, and after that you can uh, watch the diagnostic data collection and upload with this other commandlet. And lastly, if you want to export it and give it to your security team or anything like that for review, you can also do that in a tabular format with this command, with this last command. Okay, that's all I have. Uh, back to you, Cosmos. All right, are we out of time yet? Uh, it's pretty close. I think we're right on 35 minutes. Uh, and that's good news because we're about to wrap up. So thanks thanks for that, Kareem. Let's just recap some of the things we talked about, right? We've talked this whole time about how does the built-in hybrid capability actually work? We talked about sort of what that means with the new HCI SVC component. Kareem showed you how to register and how simple it is for a user. But then we also unpacked what happens when you register underneath. Everything from Azure AD to the ARM resource to the first sync and the temporary licenses that get issued. We talked about connectivity requirements and in particular how to prepare your firewall. And then Kareem just gave you a, a remarkably transparent look at exactly what we're collecting. As you can see, it's really not very much uh, for diagnostics just to ensure that Azure Stack HCI continues to run well for you. Now, I think it's important as we conclude here not to lose sight of the big picture. So we've talk talked a lot in this session about the what, if you will. Work a little bit about why maybe from a perspective but we've talked really about the details and it's important to keep in mind that this is all just the foundation believe me when i tell you if our whole you know we wouldn't have built all of this infrastructure if our goal was just to like switch to a subscription and stop the reason we're building all of this is there are so many exciting scenarios for hybrid management and hybrid capabilities in the azure stack hci operating system that are going to build on top of this foundation and that's partly why I think it's important for you to understand the foundation too, which is why we agreed to do this session. Going forward, I'm super excited to spend more time talking about these higher level scenarios, the things that actually matter more to a customer day to day. But now hopefully you have a feeling for how the underlying internals actually work to set up this hybrid that's built into HCI. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here, Karsten, and I will hand it back to you. Yes, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks Cosmos. Uh, so we had a lot of questions in the Q&A and uh, unfortunately we are running out of time. So I want to bring in Jan Torre to ask one question before we, one question before we go on. Jan Torre? You muted. Jan Torre, you have to unmute. JT, I can't, read your, I can't I, read your mind, I, man. 
Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> hey, Karim and Cosmos. Um, so one of the questions I wanted to ask is, uh, if you have a a solution where it's 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 the servers are not connected to Azure or to internet, can they use a proxy or is it possible via VPN or Express Route to Azure to send the the, um, the registration data? It's definitely possible via Express Route. We should talk about proxies to understand the specific requirements. If there's something that we don't support, then we will support it for you. Uh, the one thing that we don't have a plan for is like a sneaker net approach, like you know, putting the data on a thumb drive and mailing it to us or something. We don't have any plan to do that right now. But proxies and uh, VPNs, that's all totally reasonable, and we want to support it. If if there's something that doesn't work today, then we're committed to improving it. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have time for one more question? Carsten or uh, one quick one yeah in two minutes so the next session yeah another quick question uh, the private key for the Azure Stack HCI that connects the on-prem to Azure where is that protected in the on-prem solution is that in the um, secure part of the hypervisor or yeah it's stored in by HCI SVC which is a protected process and we use the TPM if it's available we uh, use secure boot if it's available um, so I mean, it's kind of like the hero story of all the security capabilities built into the OS chained together. So HCI SVC uses as many of the security features as are available on the system to protect that key. Perfect. So any modern server will have that feature. Yep. Perfect. And I have no idea, if, no idea if we've announced this yet, but we plan to make a bunch of that mandatory in the future anyway. So. Yep. Cool. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So thanks so much, Cosmos and Karim, for the first session. It was really great, and I learned a lot of new stuff. So cool. And also thank you, Jan Tore, for all the help in the chat. That I think we had over 40 questions asked. So, but now without further ado, we go to our next presentation. It's Matt uh, McSpirit, and he talks about Azure Kubernetes Service and Azure Arc enabled services on Azure on Azure Stack HCI. Quite a lot of Azure, right? So, uh, Matt, go on, please. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. I will just share my screen. Um, hang on a second. Let me know if you can see this. Yes, we can. Go on. Please. Excellent. Yeah, as you as you kindly introduced, it's the longest. I'm going for the longest uh, title of a presentation that I think I've ever delivered. So this is a, yeah, this is going to be a good one, hopefully. Um, so, without further ado, let me uh, let me introduce myself. For those who don't know me, I'm Matt McSpirit. I'm one of our PMs over in Redmond, uh, focused on helping our customers and our partners embrace some of these new technologies. New being emerging uh, incubation technologies that we're currently previewing and bringing to market very soon. Uh, one of these uh, we've been working on for a while, and Cosmos and Kareem have just uh, spent a lot of time talking about it um, around Azure Stack HCI. And the other that I'm focused on is this new service we're calling Azure Kubernetes Service on Azure Stack HCI. So we're going to spend the majority of the session, uh, the next half an hour, focusing in on that. I've got some demos to show. I've got some cool stuff to talk about. And I'll also introduce you, for those that are not familiar, to the new uh, Arc-enabled data services. But there's a lot of building blocks that make up all of these different technologies. All of them share something in common, and that's Azure. There's innovation being built into Azure, as you all know, in various shapes and different forms from IaaS and PaaS services to containers and, and much more. And what we want to do from a Microsoft standpoint is enable organizations to embrace that innovation wherever they may be, whether it's in a data center at the edge, whether that's in a remote branch office, whether that's in a retail store, wherever it may be, we want to bring the innovation where we're crafting in Azure to those different environments and enable you to run and benefit from those technologies wherever you are. And that's come to bear in the form of Azure Stack with Azure Stack Edge, Azure Stack Hub, and now uh, Azure Stack HCI. It comes to bear in the form of our IoT investments with IoT Hub, Edge, Sphere, and more. And it's also coming to bear through the power of Azure Arc, this control plane that exists in, in Azure, enabling you to consume Azure services in environments that are not in Azure. So for instance, running uh, data services in a uh, Google Cloud and managing them from Azure or running them on top of Azure Stack and managing them from Azure. And so throughout this session, there's gonna be references and I'm gonna talk more about this integration with Azure as we talk uh, specifically about what's coming on premises. So when we think about Kubernetes, 
Um, there's been a significant amount of investment made uh, by Microsoft on building the best solution for running container infrastructure on Azure in the public cloud. There's been significant investments in ensuring that we adhere to best practices, enabling organizations to embrace Kubernetes in the way that makes sense for them without having to worry about all of the complexity that is behind the scenes in a Kubernetes deployment. And let's let's be truthful here. Kubernetes is complex. Deploying it on premises using the open source bits is complex. And that's why there's a market for organizations to really simplify and and really bring a more managed experience uh, for organizations looking to, bring, to to embrace Kubernetes. And that's ultimately what we've delivered in Azure, a very secure, very well supported and very unified uh, Kubernetes infrastructure that you can consume for your containerized workloads. And we want to deliver that same experience as close as we can on premises. And that brings us to the Azure Kubernetes service on Azure Stack HCI. We are bringing to market, if you're not familiar, a Kubernetes platform that runs on top of the same Azure Stack HCI that Cosmos and Kareem have, have just uh, spent time talking about. We are bringing that solution, a solution down to that platform to enable you uh, from either the IT, the administration side or the development side to consume and run Kubernetes as easily and as streamlined as possible on your infrastructure within your environments in a way that is consistent with Azure, that integrates with Azure from a, a management perspective, that supports not just uh, Microsoft-based Windows workloads, uh, but also retains a huge amount of that security investment that we add in terms of value to Kubernetes uh, uh, in Azure. So we bring all of those key investments and we bring them down in a product we are currently in preview, but will release uh, next year called Azure Kubernetes Service on Azure Stack HCI. It's a little bit of a mouthful. We sometimes abbreviate it down to AKS HCI. So if you hear me use that term, I'm referring to this. So if we go through some of these, and I've got some demos to show as well uh, on the next uh, slide. This first one, I think for me, uh, is coming from a Hyper-V background, coming from a virtualization, which I know many of you will as well, coming from an infrastructure background. This one, uh, consistency and, and certainly ease of deployment is critical because as I said, Kubernetes is, is complex. And we want to bring a very powerful, very scalable, very high performance, very battle tested Kubernetes uh, solution using industry proven open source technology where we enhance and deliver back to, to the community as well. We wanna bring all that down to an on-premises environment and we wanna make it incredibly easy and almost automatic to deploy. So as you'll see shortly in, in the video demo that I'm gonna share, just how easy it is to either deploy through a UI, which I'll show or through PowerShell, which I know many of you will prefer to get this laid out in your environment and start actually providing to your developers or yourselves a, a platform to run your modern applications. But the nice thing about what we're doing here with, with this Azure Kubernetes service on HCI is we're building it and leveraging skills that you already have. I am by no means a Kubernetes expert. However, my skills in Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server and Hyper-V and Admin Center and my experiences with Azure enable me to deploy and consume this a lot more easily than it would be if I was to build this, this myself up from scratch. So enough talking for now in terms of slides. Let me show you the experience you go through to uh, deploy AKS HCI onto an environment. And it builds nicely on what, what Cosmos and Kareem have said in terms of uh, deploying your Azure Stack HCI clusters. So the first thing you've got to do, obviously, is it's a preview, so you're going to have to register. So register for that, register for the download, uh, simple form, and you'll download a zip file. The October release is the latest, November's will be coming soon. We release on a monthly cadence, ideally. And you'll find a number of files, a PowerShell set of modules, uh, some log collection utilities, and the key one is this um, Windows Admin Center extension uh, that I'm going to demonstrate. Obviously, if you're deploying, deploying through PowerShell, you don't need this extension. I've dropped that in a folder on my um, on my WAC machine, my Windows Admin machine, uh, Windows Admin Center machine, sorry. And then I'll go into settings, I'll go into extensions. For those of you who are already familiar with this and adding feeds, this shouldn't be anything new, but I've added a custom feed uh, and I would see the Azure Kubernetes service listed as an available extension. Uh, in my case, I've installed it already and it appears there. In the future, when this is a released product, you'll see it just listed in available extensions. You won't need to add it as a manual feed, but right now it's it's in preview. So once I've uh, I've downloaded the extension on my cluster, my HCI cluster, you'll see my extension listed down in the bottom corner here. So all I'll need to do 
is essentially, and, and this is a two node HCI cluster, so small scale in, in my case, great for uh, retail, remote sites, branch offices and so on. Um, now I've got the option to initially set up the management infrastructure on this HCI cluster. So to be clear, this is not the cluster that will run your workloads. This is not a Kubernetes cluster that will run your apps. This is the kind of stage one of this deployment. I, I lay down this management infrastructure. I make sure that I've got the relevant prereqs, admin center, enough space, the vSwitch. Uh, in the current release, we will support uh, VLANs and static IPs. Initially, it was, it was uh, DHCP only. Uh, for the networking, but we are working to unlock more uh, network um, integration points as well as we go forward in the preview process. But ultimately right now, this is where we are setting up this management infrastructure on this HCI cluster. And we only need to do this once per cluster. Obviously then if we wanna go ahead and deploy uh, new additional workload clusters, we perform that step as many times for as many clusters as, as we need. So. That's ticking along. We need once we've read our prerequisites. This this size here, these sizing, I think they're a a very relaxed estimate. I don't think you need quite as much as what it, what it's saying there. But certainly my environment doesn't have some of those. But I think uh, read the documentation and ensure that your environment is set up uh, correctly. So we'll check Windows Admin Center, check that it's got enough space. We're going to check your cluster to check uh, what's available to it to, to be used in terms of storage. We're going to make some changes to firewall as well, just to uh, enable the relevant services to talk out. We're going to check that certain things already exist, like obviously Hyper-V, uh, Hyper-V PowerShell is another. So relatively simple stuff. This is the WAC experience. Remember PowerShell, obviously you just run a couple of commands and, and you'll, you'll um, have your cluster deployed very, very quickly. So I'm going to give my cluster a name. In this case, just leave it as the default. I'm going to choose where I'm going to store my VMs that are going to power this Kubernetes management cluster and define any network settings, VLANs, DHCP static, um, which virtual switch I'd like to use, etc. And then I'm registering with Azure as part of this management cluster, but this doesn't incur any billing. There's no cost associated with this. It's purely for management integration. And then once all that's done, I review as with any good validation. I'm going to check everything over and check that it's uh, correct. And then I'm going to kick off the process. And that's going to take in my environment about half an hour. Most of that is to download the 40 gig of uh, images that this particular deployment will use. About 15 of that is the Windows container host. The rest are a couple of Linux images and other files and folders. So if you deploy with PowerShell, the Windows image is not pulled down by default. So you might find that setup is a little bit quicker. Um, but in this case, I'm using the, the WAC download approach. So we've got our, um, uh, that's where all of the, the size and the time, time can uh, be consumed. Your environment may differ. You may have a super fast internet connection. It may pull it down a lot more quickly, but in mine, unfortunately, it did not. Uh, and once all that's done, that's it. I can download the cube config file, which uh, programmatically allows me to uh, integrate uh, with this YAML file, which if I open it up, um, I'll show you what it looks like. It's not particularly exciting, but it contains some very important connectivity information for my management cluster. Remember, I reiterate, this is the cluster that is not going to run workloads specifically. This is the cluster that's going to kind of orchestrate the other clusters being created. So that's an important step one of this, this process. So that's our management cluster complete. So the next step that we want to go ahead and complete is actually starting to deploy our workload clusters and our workload clusters are ultimately the clusters that are going to run our Linux, our Windows uh, based containerized applications. And for that, as part of the extension, uh, in fact, before I show that, let me go back and show you uh, what gets deployed. Actually, just so behind the scenes, you can see that it's uh, that things have actually changed. Um, as part of that management cluster, you'll see just a couple of in this preview uh, state, a couple of VMs have been deployed. Control plane for management, a load balancer as well for the management operations. That's all that gets deployed as part of that management cluster. Now, going back to where I was going to go a second ago, in the with the extension added to WAC, we have this new uh, experience to show uh, creation of a workload cluster. And what's nice here and the interface, the experience is slightly different set of steps than it was for the management uh, cluster deployment. But you'll notice across the top the one through seven there. If I bring up the, the Azure portal very quickly. While it loads, let me close that. Obviously use Azure Advisor if you, if you like. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to go to um, 
let's go to Kubernetes. And I'm going to the native Azure Kubernetes here, so nothing to do with the on-prem uh, instance at this point. I'm just going to show you very briefly, look at, the ex look at the steps you would go through if you were doing this graphically, basics, authentication, networking. You've, we've tried to, where appropriate, match that experience as closely as we possibly can. So give a unified experience as much as possible. Um, there will obviously be changes based on this being on-prem. So we can optionally connect to Azure Arc, and I'll talk a bit more about Arc in a few minutes, but here I can choose to do that if I want to or not. And really this is if I want to go on and manage this Kubernetes cluster from Azure. I don't have to, but it's optional at this stage to enable that. I'm going to give this workload cluster a name. Uh, I'm going to choose to deploy this particular workload cluster onto a uh, a HCI cluster that's got the management infrastructure laid down, the Kubernetes management infrastructure. I need some credentials to enable me to do that. Obviously, I'm using password 123 like any good uh, IT admin will. Um, I'm not going to prove that, obviously. Um, and then I can also select my version of Kubernetes. Again, that consistency with Azure, that consistency with what's happening in the community, we want to ensure that we're matching that. We're not creating very bespoke, unique to Microsoft Kubernetes versions here. We're aligning with what's in the industry so you've got consistency for your applications. And finally, for, for uh, actually running the applications, we need to define some node pools. And these contain essentially VMs, container hosts that will run our applications. In this case, I'm going to create two pools one with Linux nodes, one with Windows nodes, and I can set the sizes based on consistent with Azure sizes. It's going to obviously select, it's going to create regular Hyper-V VMs, it's, but it's, we're presenting the, the sizing based on what people are used to in Azure here. So I'm going to create my Windows pool as well. As it stands in the preview, you can only have one Windows and one Linux pool in, in a particular uh, cluster, but you can have multiple nodes per, per pool. Uh, I've got some basic network settings here. I can obviously uh, customize a little bit more for my pods and uh, my Kubernetes services if I want to customize those, if I have a specific need. And load balances today is just HA proxy, but we're working on additional um, capabilities as we go forward. Remember, we're still we're still in the preview process. And then finally, we've done the hard work here to integrate with cluster shared volumes, so all of the storage can get provisioned as appropriately for the, for the clustered workloads, and off we go. And that is us now creating a Kubernetes cluster, which I think it took about five or six minutes in my environment, so not too long at all, significantly quicker than the download. And these are the connectivity bits that I would want to either provide to my development team if, if they hadn't uh, deployed this themselves or that I would want to use in order to uh, connect to this particular workload cluster to start deploying applications and services through my regular Kubernetes tooling. But by clicking that link in the uh, UI there, it takes me to the registered Kubernetes cluster in Azure, which we'll talk about in a few more minutes. So don't worry if you missed that. And then finally, on my Kubernetes, on my uh, Azure Stack HCI cluster, let's take a look uh, to again prove that something's actually happened in the background and it's not all just magic. Uh, and what you see here, if I expand this column, there we go. So you saw before there was just the management cluster, but now we've got load balancer, control plane, and the two um, pools containing Lin Linux and Windows uh, worker nodes. And that is my that's my kind of deployment demo. So obviously yours would be a little bit longer than that if you were doing it in real time. But that said, it's still a relatively streamlined and simple experience from the UI perspective. And PowerShell is just as straightforward, uh, only a couple of lines, and you would have uh, the necessary um, H Kubernetes cluster infrastructure up and running, which is awesome. And so to delve into the architecture a little bit more, at the base of that, we had Azure Stack HCI. And then once we deployed our workload clusters, so that kind of second part of the, the demo there, that's where our Windows and Linux host virtual machines, of which the images we provide you, Microsoft provides you, it's our Mariner OS for Linux, it's our Windows container host image that we've customized and delivered down from, from Azure for you. We manage and update that for you. And we integrate from the Kubernetes layer through to talking to the underlying HCI infrastructure through the development we've put in around our CSI, our, our cluster interfaces, our network interfaces, and our storage interfaces. And we've provided that back to the community. This isn't closed source here. This is an open source project. And we want to stay and ensure that we are benefiting the Kubernetes community as part of that. So you see in the, on the left-hand side there that AKS on HCI is all the value that Microsoft is bringing on top of Azure Stack HCI and 
Obviously, we then integrate with Azure Arc if you'd like to manage those at scale with, um, with uh, through the Azure portal. And that leads us nicely on to talk a bit about hybrid. And this has been engineered with hybrid in de by design. So whilst you don't have to manage your clusters, your workload clusters with Azure Arc, you could manage them through on-premises tools that you, you choose to use for Kubernetes. There is a lot of value to, to doing that. But just like Cosmos and, and Kareem mentioned around connectivity, this isn't a disconnected solution today. There still does need to be a, uh, a connection to Azure, at least now and again from, for billing purposes and so on. And obviously to keep the images updated as well uh, from Azure, that's a part of the service we provide. Uh, so this isn't a completely disconnected solution today. But that native integration with Arc is extremely powerful, especially if you're starting to deploy or seeing uh, in your environment lots of Kubernetes clusters pop up because you can get Kubernetes sprawl very easily, just like we've deal dealt with VM sprawl over a significant number of years. So management and control and compliance and policy on top of those is, is very, very important. And so I wanted to quickly show you how that translates a little bit at least into an Azure experience. So what you see here is that cluster that we registered earlier uh, back in the Azure Arc view. And what you can see in the top uh, left corner here there is the cluster name and Azure Arc preview. And we can hook into monitoring. We can start to apply configuration and policies. We can also start to integrate with automation as well. And this is my single cluster that I just, workload cluster that I just registered. So not hugely exciting. But if I go to one of my other environments that's got a significantly larger number of Kubernetes clusters. You'll see ones from running on other clouds. You'll see ones running on premises, and those are connected through Azure Arc into Azure. But you'll also see side by side native uh, AKS clusters running in Azure. So I get to see and visualize and manage all of those. I see the relevant Kubernetes versions, the resource group as to where they've been um, uh, registered and integrated. And then if I go into one of these in particular, I can start to then integrate with automation processes like GitOps. In this case, I've not got a, a configuration applied, but here's one for this EKS cluster. And you'll see it starts to integrate with things like GitHub repos where my application data is stored. I can integrate with obviously Helm charts as well. So I'm able to start to build these almost like templatized configurations that I apply on top of my Kubernetes clusters across the board, across Azure and non Azure based clusters and also apply compliancy through uh, Azure policy. So as you start to integrate your AKS clusters, whether they're in other clouds, whether they're on prem on HCI, integrate them with Arc and apply a standardized approach across the board in terms of configurations, governance policies and so on. It's, it becomes extremely powerful and you can really lock down how you manage uh, Kubernetes and prevent that sprawl from from ever occurring. So really cool stuff. So as we said, it's not just about um, it's not just about Windows containers, Windows and Microsoft workloads. It's about Linux as well. And Microsoft provides that Mariner operating system to run your applications and workloads. And you don't need to, as you saw in the demo, separate out a workload cluster based on Linux or Windows. You saw me combine those different node pools into a single cluster, which helps to streamline um, management of those uh, pieces there. And we take care of the security for you. We harden the host images. We patch and maintain the container host images. And we've hardened Kubernetes based on a variety of different um, uh, policies and, and um, uh, e security considerations and baselines. We ship it as part of our secure development lifecycle. We integrate with things like Active Directory and GMSA. So we're really aiming this to provide the best Kubernetes solution most integrated with enterprise environments. So extremely powerful. But why would you use it? Why bother? Because if you're an IT pro today like uh, like myself and you think, OK, well, I, I still like doing things in VMs. VMs give me plenty of flexibility. Do I need some of these uh, modernizing um, uh, areas of investment? Well, a lot of organizations are looking at different ways of modernizing and containers is one of the ways that we're seeing prove very popular. And as we said before, laying down a container infrastructure is complicated, but you've just seen how easy it can be with AKS on HCI. So from there, it does allow you to modernize your apps, embrace new cloud native apps. A lot of our ISV partners, our software developers are starting to write their applications in containers. So enabling you to consume those very easily from uh, secure repositories. And it also unlocks additional services, which we'll talk about in the form of um, data services, for example. 
So as we saw, uh, we can create Windows pools. We can create Windows pools with uh, various Windows uh, nodes in, and that really opens the door for you to modernize uh, legacy .NET applications that may be running on quite old um, Windows web servers today, potentially. So we've actually built some orchestration and tooling into the Windows Admin Center to capture and help you migrate uh, legacy web applications, .NET applications into containers, and then obviously you could deploy those to AKS HCI, you could deploy them to Azure if you like on AKS or, or an alternative Kubernetes platform, that's up to you. But either way, we've built tooling to really help the non-heavy developers invested in Kubernetes yet, but still wants to modernize applications. Windows Admin Center is a good way to get started there with that. And as I said, organizations are embracing new cloud native applications. So we want to ensure that you can do that as easily as possible. What if you're investing in cloud native apps in the data center, but the edge and the branch office in the retail site, you're finding quite a challenge to actually deploy those same cloud native applications that are containerized. Well, as we've shown, a simple two node cluster running Azure Stack HCI with AKS HCI on top could be a way to embrace those cloud native applications in those smaller locations, which would be pretty cool and wouldn't inhibit you as an organization really moving forward with uh, modernizing. And then finally, you've got Arc enabled data services. And this is where I'll spend the rest of the, uh, my time introducing uh, ArcDS and, and for those of you who are not familiar, because it's an incredibly powerful data platform to run on premises on top of Kubernetes. Because for those of you who are not familiar, um, if many of you, you know, your IT pros today, if somebody said to you, could, could you get me a SQL Server, please? I need, a, I need a database backend for my application. If you're anything like me, your first thought is, okay, Windows VM, install SQL, maybe a cluster, and then I'll provide them with the necessary information about that, that database server and we're good to go. Well, actually, in a modernizing sense, you can do that in Azure as well. You could deploy SQL in IaaS, but more and more organizations are looking at ways of um, removing some of the complexity from managing their database infrastructure and focus on consuming PaaS services, PaaS data services essentially to which they don't have to worry about updating, they don't have to worry about scale, that's a lot easier to scale up and down very efficiently. Management and billing is all uh, moving forward in, in a cloud manner. And with Azure Data Services powered by Azure Arc, we want to bring those same benefits down to any environment that's running Kubernetes. So imagine the scenario that I just talked about, or, or go back to the scenario that I just briefly talked about uh, a few minutes ago in the demo, where we had Azure Stack HCI, we had AKS for HCI, we've now got clusters, uh, Kubernetes clusters ready. They're integrated with Arc. We can use Azure Arc and Azure Arc data services specifically to push down SQL managed instances that are today are only available in Azure natively. Well, through Azure Arc, we can push them down to this Kubernetes environment. We could push down Postgres uh, in hyperscale instances down to run on premises in your environment on Kubernetes. And we can do that through the Azure Data Controller, through the portal, through Azure CLI. We've got all sorts of different ways of programmatically and graphically deploying uh, those data services down. But what's the benefit? Well, as shown here on the side, I don't have to worry about SQL versions anymore. If I'm deploying a managed instance from Azure down to my Kubernetes and my AKS HCI environment, it's an evergreen SQL. It's always up to date. It's always the latest version. I never have to worry about uh, extended support updates and so on. It's always the latest SQL server running in a managed instance visible from Azure. It's elastic. I can benefit from the same tools and settings that I have available to me in Azure natively to scale up additional uh, instances and scale back if, if need be. I've got unified management. I can manage from on-prem. I can manage from Azure and see my uh, database resources in both on-premises and in the cloud. And it takes advantage of the security and billing approaches that we've that we've got available in Azure. And what that can look like in, in a single resource group here, as an example, we've got our Arc Data Controller, which is really the, the orchestrator of the Arc Data Services down running on premises. And then I've deployed a couple of Postgres and SQL instances via Azure Arc running on my Kubernetes infrastructure running on premises. So again, to reiterate, I think I've got an architecture diagram that, that shows this a little bit clearly here or more clearly. You've got your hardware for Azure Stack HCI at the bottom here. You've got that new Azure Stack HCI operating system onto which you've deployed AKS on HCI. And then this final layer on top here 
aside from your own applications, is this data services layer, which is running SQL Manage Instance or Postgres and more in the future on top of Kubernetes, on top of HCI. So you have a completely supported stack by Microsoft running on premises, meeting your compliance needs, meeting your regulatory needs, and it's all managed and delivered uh, through Azure Arc in this case, as you get to the higher level services. So that's all I uh, wanted to cover as part of that it was just an intro to the data services side, but hopefully you've you found it useful. I've hopefully left a little bit of time for, for questions as well, but how can you get started ultimately? Well, register for the download. The links are in the slides if you, if you need to, or just search AKS HCI download. Register for the download. The October bits are available. November bits will be coming uh, fairly soon. Um, download the bits, run them on um, Azure Stack HCI and integrate with Windows Admin Center if you prefer that. And we've got some great documentation as well in our docs that walk you through some additional scenarios, deploying applications, um, integrating with Arc and, and so on. Uh, so that's the best advice I can give to get started. And also going back to my very first slide where I said we work as part of a, a team that helps organizations embrace these new technologies. If you're looking at this thinking, you know what, we could really benefit from running Kubernetes on-premises and we'd love to work with you Microsoft to to test it out in our environment. If that's sounding of interest, let me know and we'd love to talk to you about working with us as part of our private preview program, our, our early access program, uh, where you can get access to the engineers, work closely with us and, and help uh, you deploy the AKS infrastructure that you need within your environment. There's some good resources as well. So that is me. Um, so Carson, I guess back to you if there's any questions. Only the easy ones, please, uh, just so you know. Thanks so much. This was a great presentation and again, new stuff. And Helmut was asked, uh, answering most of the questions. So I will jump over to Helmut to ask you some of the Q&A questions. Helmut, are you there? Yeah. So I uh, can start with the first Q&A question. That's what about resilient clusters, e.g. stretched and AKS awareness of fault domains? From a stretch cluster, AKS uh, is fine running across the stretch cluster. That's that's fine as well. Uh, we haven't published an, uh, any specific guidance on running across a HCI stretch. So that's something that I think will come as we get further along uh, in the preview cycle. Uh, so I can't share much more at this point, but it's there's no reason as to why that that wouldn't be a, a supported configuration. I don't think necessarily it will have any awareness necessarily of fault domains at the Kubernetes layer, but the way we lay down the Kubernetes infrastructure if reflective of the underlying HCI cluster, we'll uh, do our best to separate those workloads across um, the different uh, fault domains to ensure that should a worker node go down, it doesn't impact other worker nodes in that cluster, for instance. So everything will get distributed appropriately and configured. Thank you. Great answer. The second question is, uh, if it's it evergreen, is there still some possibility to hold upgrades when it's not convenient? especially for critical business blockers. Yeah, so the, the evergreen elements I refer, I use the term specifically to talk to data services, which um, I, I imagine you are in control of your, your maintenance for that. I don't think it just happens automatically. And the same will be true of, of um, the AKS HCI. If you you will deem when you want to update the, pro, update the infrastructure, we wouldn't apply that without uh, permission and without you uh, orchestrating that. The key takeaway here is that we take care of the complexity of updating all of the different components and you will just give the green light as to when you when you want to do that. Thanks again. So then we have still two questions left and four minutes, so it's working great. So uh, one more cost related questions. Are there egress costs uh, on in image updates that were mentioned? Uh, so um, it's a good question. I don't believe so. I don't think I I don't have a definitive uh, no, but I would be incredibly surprised if we charge you to update your your images. The fact that we have to pull the updates from from Azure, I suspect. But I will I will have to double check on that one. I I I'd be highly surprised if they were. So apologies, yeah. I don't have an answer for that one specifically. But that wouldn't be uh, something I would expect to be in place. Yeah. Then we have uh, what are all the available SQL Server options with the pros and cons in SGI stack 
of Kubernetes. So perhaps we can find some link where you do this because I think yes, I can. I can bit. post that into the chat. I'll have a look while the next session is is running, and I'll I'll post something into the chat there because I think so um, I leave the question open that you can yes, reply. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's definitely a more of a irrespective of AKS HCI. That's more of a data services um, question. But that said, we do aim to support and the the arc data services aim to support as many of the native uh, SQL managed instance features as if they were running natively in Azure on AKS HCI or any or any Kubernetes platform that that said so uh, I think um, what you'll find is we'll tick most of the boxes of what's available in in native Azure and uh, there's a second question also about uh, docu needed documentation on how to use Azure Arc DS. I will leave it open also. So sure. if, if you yep. can post the, the, the links there. Yeah, yep. oh, yep. thank you. That's all for the special question. There's one more general question to all. What backup and restore software will be supported? Or is Good Azure question. Stack HCI compatible with the normal Windows 29 API and services? Yeah, I think, uh, well, there's there's two levels of backup there. There's at the HCI level, which uh, if Cosmos is on, he's, he's happy to answer. But we are working with a number of the um, common backup vendors, the popular backup vendors to integrate with HCI. From a Kubernetes perspective and backing up containers, it's a slightly different consideration. And some of those traditional backup vendors are working on more container focused protection uh, solutions. And as I said in the session, we're not trying to make it a very unique Kubernetes in terms of that it doesn't work with everything else that works with Kubernetes in the industry. So if there are solutions out there that can protect containers at the Kubernetes layer, there's no reason as to why that shouldn't work with, with the AKS HCI solution. We're really aiming to be compliant as much as we possibly can. Okay, thank you. That's all for the moment. Okay, uh, thanks Matt for the great session. And I have to look at it again. There was uh, a lot of information I didn't get and I was a little bit distracted with the Q&A and uh, all that is going on. But uh, I think very interesting that you push services from Azure to Azure Stack HCI. Um, I was thinking one question I have, do you know how much bandwidth you should have if you push down, for example, um, an image from Azure? Well, the, yeah, I mean, the, the, the images that are coming from for, for your actual container hosts um, can be quite large. The Linux ones are relatively small and we're, we're working on shrinking them down. The Windows ones are a little bit larger right now. So bandwidth is really just a, a time thing to get that initial cluster node deployed, that worker node. Your actual containers, though, they could come from the Azure Container Registry or, uh, or another uh, repository within your environment. and there it really just depends on how large they are so i don't think we have any specific bandwidth requirements it just the less bandwidth you have i guess this the, the longer it would take to push those images we can certainly look offline as to whether or not there's there are different ways of side loading images into the environment as well from a local repository so that's something i think we'll explore as we go forward in the preview yeah, i think that would be great so thanks so much so we are going back to uh, to izzy um izzy are you there I am. <laughs> Hi. So uh, I want to take the chance before our next talk. We have uh, Priya here, and I'm very excited uh, that Priya is presenting. Uh, you know, uh, we have a problem in the community or in the IT business. There are not enough women, right? And you are working on that. You have, <laughs> a, you have a nice thing going on in uh, um, online where you uh, present uh, with a Microsoft employee, also another woman, uh, cool initiatives uh, in the community. Yeah, Could yeah, that's right. a bit about that? Absolutely. So I'm always happy to uh, to talk about that as I uh, always love to advocate for more women in tech, more women in STEM, uh, more women on stage. I have to say I'm guilty as well because I would not get on that stage until it was actually Karsten who almost pushed me <laughs> to 
to do it. No, I will not say push me. Let's say he motivated me and he was a true ally um, uh, to force me into speaking at, uh, at, at one of his conferences. And I do have to say it really opened so many opportunities for me. So the first time that I actually really delivered my own breakout session was at Karsten's uh, Cloud and Data Center conference. And from that moment on, so many amazing things have happened, leading to actually receiving my MVP title this month, right? So thank you, Carson, for also being a uh, for that. That's really thank great. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, so speaking of women in tech, yeah, it's something I will uh, I will always advocate for. And together with Holly Lehman, who's a program manager on the Azure team in Redmond, uh, we together host Head in the Cloud, Heart in the Community. You can find us on uh, YouTube. And basically, so we have a video series uh, shining a light on all the amazing things our community members are doing. So of course, also we focus on women in tech, but also, uh, uh, yeah, all kinds of stories that we want to share uh, share from the community. So maybe one day uh, you can join us, Karsten. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. And you also did some, um, how you call it? You you went through, uh, you went to Vietnam to, uh, volunteer there and also to Bali and uh, this was also a very nice experience with young girls and, and technology, right? Absolutely, yes. So earlier this year, actually right before the pandemic hit in uh, yeah. Europe, I spent uh, one month. I took uh, unpaid leave uh, from work. I went to Indonesia, I went to Vietnam and there I was teaching uh, English and computer classes to underprivileged uh, children as well as to children with disabilities in an uh, orphanage in Vietnam. So that was one of the most amazing, rewarding um, experiences I had in my life. Um, I look back on with lots of joy. So I see we have uh, Priya coming on the call soon, right? So we have uh, two more minutes before her session uh, starts. So let's uh, let's tune back into you, Carson. How how is the event for you so far? Oh, I think it's great. Uh, I was a little bit nervous at the start. You maybe recognized that, and my wife said, "Oh, uh, Izzy really shined," but you were not so uh, crisp. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we had a little bit of technical problems here. So send her my best regards. Is going, uh, everything is going smoothly and I'm very happy that we are doing that. And Manfred is a big help and I will talk uh, with Manfred a little bit later in the show about what he is doing. So would you like to talk to Priya a little bit? Uh, yes. She is online, I saw, and then in one minute her session should start. Uh, the easy way to deploy Azure Stack HCI, and I know what she's talking about. That's great. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Kirsten. So over to Priya Satish, who is a senior program manager at Microsoft. Uh, she will today present the session, just like Karsten uh, mentioned, the easy way to deploy Azure Stack HCI. So Priya will talk about the capabilities that, wi uh, that Windows Admin Center brings in for Azure Stack HCI. So Priya. Come on stage, on the virtual stage. Okay. Hey, hi guys, uh, how are you hi. all doing today? Good, very well, how about yourself? Oh, doing great. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today. There's so much interest and so much questions and uh, uh, people are so engaged in all these sessions. Um, I, I'm seeing so much happening around in the chat sessions and I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. Wonderful. We're also super excited to have you here. We're very thankful. And just like I said, I, I love to amplify women in tech. So it's a true honor to, uh, to, to introduce you for the next session. So if you're all ready, then uh, I would say take it away. Good luck, have fun, and happy sharing uh, of your knowledge. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, nice introduction. Um, very happy to be here. And let's get started. Uh, I'm going to get going with my presentation I'm sharing now. Can you see it? Not yet. Did you share your screen, Priya? Oh, yes, I, I did share my screen. Uh, do you see oh, it now? Oh, it shows up, yes. Yes, yeah. oh, great. Perfect. Thank you. Take the stage. All right. Good evening, folks. Uh, thanks for being here for this session. I'm really, really um, excited to be part of this whole uh, 
online event uh, focused on Azure Stack HCI. Um, let, uh, to in today's, I'm, I'm Priya Satish. I'm part of the uh, Windows Admin Center team. Um, our team uh, primarily focus on giving a wonderful experience as part of Windows Admin Center for the users who like who want to get started with Azure Stack HCI and be able to easily get them deployed, manage and also uh, you know, complete operations that could be all done using the Windows Admin Center. Uh, my colleagues Cosmos, uh, Kareem and uh, Matt uh, did talk and uh, did demos using Windows Admin Center, so I, I don't think it specifically needs a lot of introduction and I'm sure the folks in this call are, are already using Windows Admin Center for a lot of their uh, uh, data center management, uh, their lab management, uh, uh, and, and so I'm just going to give a very quick introduction on what Windows Admin Center is, just a couple of minutes, and then we'll get into a more interesting part on how to get, how to deploy Azure Stack HCI using Windows Admin Center. So Windows Admin Center is a locally deployed browser-based management tool. Um, you could easily download, install, and get started in just a couple of minutes. Uh, it's, it's more designed to be a manage a modern evolution um, of your inbox management tools like your be it your server manager tools or, or your MM, MMC tools. A lot of these capabilities have been brought in as a more as a modern UI as part of the Windows Admin Center. Um, definitely there's zero learning curve. Uh, it it will it's so easy to use with all and it, you could actually reuse a lot of it since it has a lot of familiarity to the existing server management tools. It, it is really easy to get started uh, with Windows Admin Center. And it's designed uh, to coexist with some of your existing tools, be it uh, System Center or Azure uh, Update uh, uh, Update Manager, uh, any of your existing or any of your th other third party tools. It can actually coexist and co uh, co manage your infrastructure with it and um, you could get it installed on even uh, even a you know windows uh, client pc or you could install it on a windows server and be able to uh, remotely manage uh, your servers in a very secure manner um, last but not the least and it provides an easy way to discover and add Azure services that make sense to your infrastructure so if you if you like uh, uh, to get started with Azure backup uh, service or if you want to uh, connect to ASR, um, your um, Azure uh, network extension or any of these, all of these are all available in Windows Admin Center and it provides a seamless integration to uh, integrate with these Azure service. That's that's a quick introduction on Azure uh, on Windows Admin Center. So let's uh, quickly move into the the crux of today's uh, session, getting started and an easy way to deploy Azure Stack HCI. Um, today, if you need to get a, a cluster environment deployed in uh, in any of your server uh, server host machines, uh, these are the 25 elaborate steps that we each of us need to go through. Getting you, we need to. Um, get start get rack and stack them and then make those servers available online. Make them domain join if they are not already domain join. Get the required uh, features installed and make sure you have the required updates uh, uh, both from Microsoft and also from the OEMs and then uh, also piece in the uh, the networking requirements that you would need for your cluster, be it a single site cluster or a stretch cluster, multi site clusters and then have all of this validated so that you make sure that all your best practices and the uh, recommended settings are all in there before you can actually get the cluster created and it and it just doesn't stop there right so even after your cluster is created you need to make sure your storage is all uh, is, is all validated, it's clean, and then you you enable uh, storage spaces direct. And last, if, if you if you also would like to have the SDN piece, uh, the uh, software defined networking piece, then you have to take care of uh, 
uh, deploying uh, network controller VNs, uh, uh, clustering the VNs again, and then making that uh, network VNs available for the uh, guest tenants that's going to run on these clusters. So these 25 or more steps today, how do we do them? So all of these steps are today are done using partial. I'm not joking here. So this is going to be a really, really tedious, complicated task for a lot of admins who want to get their clusters started. And, and not all and not many of the, the admins out there who want to do this are are all uh, you know uh, experts in the partial scripting and the way the best practices and and know the nuances that the best practices that needs to be incorporated as part of the cluster deployment right so this is this is not easy and what we are trying to do here is to bring in a little bit simplicity a little bit of intuitiveness and a little bit of of guided experience as part of the Windows Admin Center. That's the primary goal of providing this experience as part of Windows Admin Center. So let's let's see um, in terms of how in, I'm going to have a quick demo to show you how the all of this happens. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to uh, you know re-emphasis that this experience, though uh, it's going to be a click-through experience, a, a no-brainer for a lot of a uh, uh, lot of people who are, who are planning to use there, is going to take away a lot of these challenges of managing complex uh, scripts and keeping them updated, and then having multiple scripts to manage multiple scenarios uh, and more scripts uh, to deploy in different uh, uh, environments, setups and things like that. And tedious troubleshooting procedures. The, the procedures, if something goes wrong, something fails, something rollbacks, how, how it needs to be handled. Is my environment clean? Can I, can I restart from where I left? So those kind of uh, uh, ambiguity that, that today exists when we are using these scripts, and also making sure that the best practices that's recommended as part of the cluster deployment is all incorporated into the uh, the experience that Windows Admin Center brings to table. Um, without any further delay, let me quickly show how what it looks like. So I'm I'm having a recorded demo and I'm going to voice over it. So here we go. So Windows Admin Center gets uh, you started with the cluster create in, in a wizard format. You go ahead and uh, select the type of cluster that you would like to install, be it a regular cluster or a multi-site cluster, and it shows a, a stage-wise uh, wizard that, that uh, takes care of those 25 steps that I showed in my previous uh, slide. So you get your servers added on which you have the Azure Stack HCI downloaded, have them domain joined as part of this, pro as part of the wizard itself. The wizard also installs the required Windows features that's needed for the cluster, uh, for the clustering capabilities. And it also ensures that we bring the uh, updates both from Microsoft and also the solution updates from the OEMs depending on the make and model that your servers are in. So this is a very important aspect of this entire flow and I will spend a little more uh, time in my late, later side slides. In the networking piece, we go ahead and uh, list the available adapters uh, and we it is mandatory today as part of the wizard to select at least one management adapter in each of your nodes. So this is how the wizard works today, but we are constantly working to improvise this flow and be able to uh, roll over this in our forthcoming releases. And then we allow the user to select the kind of a switch configuration that he would want to see in his environment, be it a, a convert switch for his compute and storage, or be it could be a separate switch for his compute and storage, or it could just be a switch for his storage and then still use a physical adapters for his uh, storage. So those are the three different uh, configurations we allow. Then we enable RDMA as part of this flow uh, to optimize the network utilization and then last we also allow them to provide the clustering 
uh, cluster networking IP addresses as part of this wizard. So this this is a, a slightly uh, long uh, uh, long tail of this entire wizard. This you might see when you're using it. You might see that this takes a few minutes. Then the rest of the steps. This is because a lot of connectivity checks and and um, 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 validations happen behind this step. So please be a little bit patient in case you see that this is not coming through immediately, but it's, it's a very um, important step of this entire wizard. Then we go ahead and validate the wizard for the invent inventory for the networking and also the system configurations. So basically behind scenes, the, this step runs the test cluster to validate each of these categories and the different tests within these categories. And it also provides a report that you could actually download and use it for your later reference. So in case you, you deploy a cluster in a remote office and you want the same cluster to be deployed on another remote office, you could actually use this report as a reference to see how this cluster was, def was uh, deployed in your uh, remote office one. So you could actually mimic the same in another office two. Now, now that you, our cluster validation is done, we go ahead and give a cluster name and then the advanced property also opens up to give any specific settings that we might want the cluster networking to be taken care of. you you want to uh, you know um, ignore certain networks for some reason which are local to the network and not new, not used for clustering use and things like that could be specified in the advanced settings and once you uh, say create cluster the the new cluster gets uh, created in in uh, behind the scenes with all the configurations that's been uh, given by the user till till this point in time. So the, the cluster is created and all the cluster objects are also uh, created in the uh, in, in the active directory and it's all it's all uh, propagated and available for uh, for uh, for the Windows Admin Center to connect back. So this is a, an end to end flow of cluster create. We have the other flows on storage and SDN also being covered as part of the uh, other sessions that's coming through. So I, I haven't I haven't shown them explicitly here, but uh, post clustering we also support enabling um, storage spaces direct and then we have a specific uh, stage where we also support uh, uh, SDN. So on, on SDN today, we support uh, the uh, network controller deployment as part of the wizard. Um, the wizard does not support uh, uh, gateway uh, provisioning and uh, uh, software load balancing yet, but uh, 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 we promise that these are going to be in our uh, product roadmap and it will it will be coming soon. So that's a very quick demo uh, into what the um, how the cl cluster deployment using Windows Admin Center looks like uh, before we. Uh, yeah, so bef uh, the the before I move on to uh, the cluster management, how do now that we got our clusters deployed, uh, how do we manage them? How do we keep them updated? Uh, how do I know my cluster infrastructure is doing healthy and things like that? I would like to quickly touch upon the different cluster types that the wizard supports today. Uh, we get a lot of questions around it, uh, so I like to pre-emit uh, some of the questions around it. So. Today we uh, support the hyperconverged uh, cluster deployment. Uh, it could be on a single site, same on a multi-site. Uh, we we support both these scenarios for for Azure Stack HCI, and we also support the same uh, when hyperconverged infrastructure cluster deployment with SDN on a single site and with SDN on multi-site. So these are the different uh, combinations. All of this available in a single wizard. Um, it's all available in box. You do not have to do even a single step out out of the box to get any of these deployed. And um, it's it's going to be a really easy experience. I promise you should definitely give it a shot. Um, so let's move on to the uh, section two of my session, which is uh, which is more focused about on uh, cluster management. Uh, 
Sure, again, I'm going to have a very quick demo uh, uh, using Windows Admin Center how we could manage clusters. You, you saw that I had created a cluster through Windows Admin Center and here I went ahead and added the cluster to the uh, cluster manager. And now the OU uh, page shows a lot of the high level details on how what are the cluster nodes that's that's available, the status of the cluster and the settings page allows you to do a lot the the generic settings that's required at a cluster context level and uh, the registration also shows if your cluster is already registered to Azure and if it's not uh, it's not registered yet, it allows you to register uh, the nodes. The node section of course uh, details out the different nodes that's in your cluster and also the the status of the nodes. And, and the virtual switches uh, gives insights into the different virtual switch configurations that's been uh, set in your cluster as part of the wizard. So it also shows which of the physical adapters got teamed up to create the virtual switches and also the status of the virtual switches. And, and here you see the uh, uh, cluster networking configurations uh, uh, that's used for uh, the cluster communication. So all of this, it's all available in a single pane uh, view. Uh, you could you could do so, uh, a quick check or in health check using some of these and also be able to change some of these settings uh, depending upon uh, uh, you know what what you what exactly want to change and um, the updates tool that's available in Windows Admin Center allows you to keep your uh, clusters uh, updated uh, all the time and here it allows you to list out the uh, what what uh, uh, Microsoft updates are are available or what updates that's available in the feed and it's still not uh, um, installed in your uh, installed in your cluster. Uh, so that's about uh, the cluster management. Uh, we we're doing a lot of um, work and investments in this area. Um, we're doing a lot of performance improvements and we're doing uh, new capability additions uh, in this area. So definitely stay tuned here. If even if you're not seeing some of uh, some of the um, requested tools or uh, uh, infrastructure visibility here, uh, do send us a request and we will definitely take a look at it and see uh, if we could accommodate that in our future releases. So. Um, this is also uh, one quick thing that I wanted to show you uh, before we move on to the extensibility piece. Uh, the, the cluster manager, the cluster to management tool within Windows Admin Center also allows us to get uh, the uh, Azure connection status. So Azure connect uh, connection status uh, is, is uh, uh, going to be visible in the dashboard and if it's not already registered, Windows Admin Center will also allow you to register and be um, uh, to, to connect with the uh, Azure portal uh, for for the uh, to keep up the connection status and also to keep the uh, you know the uh, capabilities of your Azure Stack HCI cluster uh, fully operational and fully functional uh, is only when we at, it at least connects uh, once in every 30 days. So that's about uh, the cluster management and um, I'm going to go to the extensibility piece of my uh, presentation here. Um, Windows Admin Center uh, allows uh, a lot of uh, by, by nature and by the framework of Windows Admin Center, we allow a lot of partner extensions uh, and developer extensions to be available uh, to the users of Windows Admin Center. So what it means uh, in the perspective of, Win of Azure Stack HCI. So uh, Microsoft has collaborated with a lot of our OEM partners uh, and allowed them to uh, develop Windows Admin Center extensions uh, which which would bring in the appropriate firmware driver solutions uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, Azure Stack HCI uh, nodes that that have that are deployed that are being deployed through Windows Admin Center. So if you see here this uh, solution updates specifically, this particular state would allow the users uh, to check if there is any firmware drivers that's been published 
and available in the feed that that is relevant to the make and model that uh, make and model of the Azure uh, of the hardware on which they are running Azure Stack HCI. So this uh, clears a lot of uh, ambiguity that the uh, administrators today have to go through in order to keep their clusters updated, not just with respect to Microsoft updates, but also in terms of keeping it updated from the uh, OEM perspectives. So if it's there, if it's published by the OEM and if it's available uh, uh, in the catalog feed, it's going to be it's going to show up as part of this flow and you're going to see it here. And this is um, uh, I would say this is a uh, definitely a mock mock up that I'm showing here. Um, I'm we, we are not it's, since it's not released publicly and it's not officially released. It's it's mocked up here to show how this experience would look like, but uh, soon you would see all of this in action. So here you'd see that the uh, Contiso, uh, which is a fictitious company, has actually in uh, uh, published a. Extension Windows Admin Center extension, which would bring in the firmware driver extensions, which is specific and uh, um, exclusive for this make and model that is being used as part of this uh, cluster creator. So this uh, this takes a, we we've. Uh, um, we have discussed this with few few of our M MVPs already and some of our NDA partners, and they have shown so much interest around this. It kind of takes a lot of uh, additional uh, manual work that the admins and the um, ad administrators that need to keep up uh, to do in order to keep their clusters up to date. So this is coming. Um, it's uh, our uh, collaboration with our OEMs are uh, going uh, really, really in a very fast pace, and you should see a lot coming around in this space. That's about the extensibility. Um, I have uh, mostly come to the end of my uh, presentation, so I would definitely encourage you, if you're not already using Admin Center, to download it from aka.ms slash Windows Admin Center, uh, Windows Admin Center, and please do give us feedback uh, in aka.ms, SWAC feedback, uh, and you can always reach out to us in user voice uh, uh, under um, server management uh, uh, and now we could open up for questions. We cannot hear you, Karsten. Uh, verifying the cluster or creating the cluster there there are some I'm errors so sorry i think you have to, to repeat your question there was an issue with audio i've seen so oh should... sorry sorry uh, we had an issue with audio so i will start again hi thank you priya for for the presentation i have a question myself and then we come to some q a questions um do you hear me priya yes i do now okay uh priya um I use the cluster creation uh, wizard a lot with Azure Stack HCI and Storage Spaces Direct. So mm -hmm. um, I have sometimes problems to verify a cluster or to create a cluster. So um, it would be great if if we could skip over those processes if you know how you do it with PowerShell and then go on with the storage and maybe with the SDN part. So um, have you maybe thought about that? Oh yeah, uh, definitely. Uh uh, Carson, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, OK, yeah, so I was saying, uh, yeah, we we have uh, heard this uh, feedback uh, from quite a uh, quite a few users who, who tried our uh, preview, private preview and public preview. Uh, definitely, we are trying to see if we could make uh, the validation as an optional step rather than uh, having a hard stop there and say that get all your uh, errors rectified and then on and then you can go ahead. So we're it's seeing if we could actually make that as an optional step so that the user if he knows that he has done everything uh, the right way and the way it has to be done, then he could actually skip that uh, phase, uh, skip the validation 
uh, and uh, get this cluster created and go ahead with the uh, storage spaces direct. Yes, we are, we are already working on that. Yeah, that's cool. So I myself, I wanted to play with uh, software defined networking and I know we have a we have a presentation about that later. But mm -hmm. if, if you're not, uh, as far as I know, if you don't uh, do it with a cluster creation uh, um, uh, wizard, you can't do it afterwards. So that would also be great to have it uh, separately uh, so that you can, if you decide later do you, want, you want to have SDN, you can uh, create it later. That would be great. So maybe another uh, thing to think about. Uh, yes, uh, uh, we've, we've heard this again uh, from some of our users who, who are not yet ready for SDN, but would la later get that added uh, to their cluster. They just want to see that as an additional tool that's available on the left panel and they could just make use of it. Uh, right now, uh, we, we don't have that uh, available uh, and we, we're trying to see uh, once we, uh, we we could do some additional iterations to see, make it available. Yep, that's a cool. famous request. Yeah, cool. So you mentioned that all the things that uh, Windows Admin Center is doing are PowerShell commands, and there were questions about can you see these PowerShell uh, commands that are uh, sent from the uh, Admin Center or Windows Admin Center to, to the host? Is, is there a possibility? Oh yes, uh, of course. Uh, we we do have a, a way to uh, see what what is actually being executed by the admin center. Uh, I'm sure there's a, a documentation link on it. I can look up for it and share it in the uh, chat. Okay, that would be cool. So we can publish it. Mm -hmm. So. Um, um, Jan Torre, you were monitoring the session uh, and are answering a, a lot of Q&A questions. Are there more questions you want to mention? Uh, yes, one of the questions I got was um, if there is a possibility to have a proxy for Windows Admin Center, uh, like in a DM set where it connects to, to, the, to, to, to the Azure services and for instance to get extensions because some are on a enclosed system and cannot have internet out from that system. Is that something that you're talk working about? Working on? Um, I don't think so. We are yet working on it. Uh, uh, but yeah, I would uh, de definitely be interested to hear a little more about it uh, to see um, how it would uh, benefit a lot more customers and see uh, we could we could definitely uh, keep the track on it if to see if we could get that in our roadmap. Yeah, and 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 like everything with with Windows Admin Center, use the user voice, right? Yes, everything is through the user voice, and uh, that that's what I shared in the last slide. Uh, how they could help uh, connect with us. Yeah. Uh, another question we got was um, how about supporting multiple clusters in Windows Admin Center? Um, supporting multiple clusters uh, in terms of uh, the deployment or the management? Management, for instance? Yeah, we do uh, allow, uh, we do support uh, managing uh, multiple clusters within uh, Windows Admin Center. You could you could uh, just add as many uh, clusters uh, you'd like to manage uh, to the connection list, uh, be able to connect and man manage all of them uh, ind independent individually. Uh, if it's about uh, scale at scale management, um, then we would have to uh, fall back to the Azure portal. Yep. Okay. I think that's what we had for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have an additional question, uh, Priya. Mm -hmm. um, people, we are now talking about the great new operating system, Azure Stack HCI, but people also care about Storage Spaces Direct. So I, I hope you uh, also still develop um, Windows Admin Center for Storage Spaces Direct. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, so there is, uh, we, we, um, the, though the primary focus and investments will be around the HCI capabilities, we will definitely continue to make our investments and efforts uh, to support uh, storage spaces direct. We know several million customers are currently using them out there, and uh, we don't just want to drop the ball in that. Quote, right, so uh, 
definitely that will also be as part of our uh, agenda and uh, uh, it will also uh, be taken care in the windows admin center okay priya thank you so much for your presentation and great to hear that you also care about the 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 other solution um, so thank you and uh, there are no more questions so uh, maybe i take the chance to talk with manfred a little bit and uh, there were some uh, questions about what what does this mean the wbsc talk I know it, yeah. but Manfred, what is it? You know it because he was a guest yes, uh, there I was. in the past. So the, the WBC is a community in Germany, the Windows Business Solution Club and the Windows Business Solution Club Talk is a format where we stream every 14 days on YouTube. It's a live streaming format and where we have different guests. Carson was one of the guests in the past and we talk about actual topics uh, at uh, Microsoft technologies on premises cloud and so on. And it's uh, the audience is typical German language. So this is the reason why we have the WBSC talk and it's the Sprechstunde. <laughs> so the talking time uh, and the, the background is physical. So we have here a video studio with uh, um, yeah, video <laughs> switching technologies, different cameras so we can uh, switch between these cameras. So now for example, Carson is in focus and this was the reason why we decided to stream from yeah. here, but it was not possible to remove the background because it's physical, it's <laughs> on the wall. And so this is the reason why you can see WBSC. If you are interested in this, our preferred platform is LinkedIn. So when you go to LinkedIn and search for Windows Business Solution Club community, then you find will find this German language community. Yeah. yeah. So and we we do some other thing. Yes, uh, we uh, Manfred and I we are both uh, not the youngest guys, and we care a lot about on-premise technology. And we are very happy that uh, Azure is now coming to on-premises with Azure Stack HCI. So Manfred, what are we doing on with on-premises? Yeah, we are doing the on-prem show. So we are we did it two times already, yeah. and we will continue this on-prem show. There we have a different background because we are not in a studio. We are <laughs> using the virtual Teams background, and yeah, there in the first session we talked about news from Microsoft Ignite. Um, yeah. Last time we discussed about Windows Admin Center. Yeah. So what's in there? Maybe what's missing? And we will continue this because we had a lot of very very positive feedback on this format. Yes. Yeah. So and now it's uh, time. You see. I um, I redressed myself because I took a, a T-shirt uh, that is a bit older, and uh, I believe in Hyper-V, and I think that's uh, that's a good segue to our next uh, session that will start in a min minute. It's called "What's New in Hyper-V and in VM Management," and uh, I hope we hear some new stuff from Pradesh Arora and Alvin Morales. I hope I did the names right. Uh, guys, are you there? Yep, I'm right here. Yep, I'm here. That's cool. So um, I would say uh, we can start the session, or or should we wait another minute? Uh, oh, I think we can start. We can start. Session, yeah. So the stage is yours. Please share share your screen. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Perfect. Now you're live. All right. Hey, welcome everyone. Glad to be here. Um, very excited to talk about Hyper-V and VM management in Windows Admin Center. Um, I am Prasid Aurora. I am a program manager on the Windows Admin Center team. Um, and I'm joined here by Alvin. Alvin, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, sure will. Um, Alvin Morales, I um, worked with the Hyper-V team. Um, and very happy to be here and share some news. Awesome, let's get started. All right, so let me um, let me go ahead and uh, start. Uh, if you want to skip to the next one, Prasid. So we'll talk about new what's new in Hyper V. Uh, there are a couple of items that we want to cover, but first I want to really reiterate our investments in Hyper V. Um, we continue to hear or be asked the question, "Hey, are, are we are you investing in Hyper V? Um, what's the story there? What are we doing?" Um, so we we continue we have this continuous motion of investing in Hyper-V. Hyper-V is used in, in Azure, um, in Azure Stack HCI, um, and 
in Windows Server. So it's it's still present, it's still active. We're still working on it. Um, so just just have that in mind. I wanted to start this conversation because I wanted to really set the set the tone there that we want that that really we are working on it. And and you'll see it throughout the slide deck. Um, so the next uh, to a segue to that, we we're bringing innovations from Azure. So Azure is a, is a very large platform, as we all know. They they use Hyper-V. The code base is exactly the same as Windows Server. Um, so any innovations uh, that, that are done in Azure are brought over to to Hyper-V in all platforms. Um, the advantage that we get with having Hyper-V in uh, in Azure is that we have a large scale uh, platform that we're we're testing. We are uh, building quality, um, resiliency, uh, fixing you know, issues that we find along the way, um, if any, and we continue to evolve. And and that's important to to uh, to bring to the table and and understand, because as as we bring more innovations into Azure, these will be replicated down to um, to our our halfway platform, and leveraged by by all. Um, so just wanted to um, make that clear. Um, we have a concept. For example, one one example is predictable performance, which is the, the next slide. Um, and basically, what this means is we want to have the same performance. But when you when you get a VM in, in Azure, you get this this guaranteed set of performance of the machine, and we bring that over to all the platforms. So that's that's a good example to bring to understand that that you get this this performance throughout. We try to to replicate what we do in one platform, and even in a large scale as Azure, we want to bring that down to all platforms. And I and I, re, I want to reiterate that. Um, the next topic um, I really want to touch on is the quality. And um, here we we are investing heavily in quality. Um, basically, I'll, I'll give you just um, an understanding. We have a weekly meeting um, with different teams uh, doing internal testing, um, filing bugs, filing issues. And the idea here is to improve in what we're offering with within Hyper-V and within clustering and other platforms. Um, we are committed to this. We we want to continue um, to work on, on quality and we and with it's our it's a number one uh, priority right now. So a lot of the the uh, items that we're looking into to include or work on um, will flow around quality as well. Um, I've had uh, conversations with customers around um, they, they come up and say, hey, you know, Hyper-V is not working as expected. And what we found is that a lot of times is it is working. It's just that there are other layers that are that are not performing or they're not working uh, or not enabled and not configured properly. Um, some examples have been uh, people going and enabling WAS policies that are probably uh, too too aggressive or are not enabling some of the um, technologies that are that exist for offloading and uh, these all replicate down to um, not having the it hyper v is seen as the one that's the culprit but there's other layers down and i and i don't want to sound like i'm blaming anybody but it's it's hyper v is a platform that works on top of all other components as well so that's what you see in, in hci um, so we continue to to work and um, work with customers, work with the platform to make that experience even better. Um, the next one I want to talk talk about is AMD nested virtualization. So there was a uh, feedback around we need a nested virtualization AMD. Um, there was a built, uh, I think, in the summer time frame that we offered a a preview of of nested um, and AMD, so of uh, customers can can test it, you can get a feel for it. Um, this continues on to be offered in in server and and throughout the Hyper-V platform. Um, there was some uh, work on performance uh, to be able to have a better experience in in the platform. So we we continue to to um, to develop and 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 work on these uh, to make to not just have 
have our different uh, vendor partners, CPU providers have the same uh, um, experience and be able to work with Hyper-V. Um, next uh, item I wanted to, to talk about is resilient change tracking. So um, we heard you loud and clear. Uh, we, we got a lot of feedback in terms of I'm having performance. Uh, there's some performance issues with RCT and um, we are in the middle of investigating this. Um, we I can't say that uh, we do have a solution. This is one of those items where we need to start to peel the onion and understand more that we have other interdependencies in the platform. So we're starting that process right now and we're working little by little understanding what are these components, fixing things, um, adding and adding these. And uh, so far, um, the prototype that we've been seeing is is positive. We, we have more, um, we have improved on, on what we have. Um, we continue to work on it and um, so expect more around these and around this area. But uh, but it will it will take us some time. But I just wanted to reiterate the feedback. I've heard the feedback. We know, we understand the what what has been uh, expressed, and and we will continue to um, uh, develop and, and work on it. Uh, it's going to take. I, I just want to set the 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 tone that it's going to take some time, as as other components need to be um, tested and and worked on. All right. Moving along to other components. So this is one that um, this is this is this feature is a kind of close to me. Um, prior to to joining the Hyper-V team, I, I did work on on Hyper-V and and the data center and um, different areas, um, different data centers that we had across the world. I and um, I always came across this CPU compatibility. So CPU compatibility. Um, the, the idea back then was you enabled it to migrate within a, a same family of, of, of CPUs and it will allow you to help you migrate to, to another um, hardware platform. Um, what happened there was that we weren't able to detect what CPU components you had available at the time. So they were you were brought back into a platform into a layer that we knew it was compatible with with the whole family. Um, that wasn't ideal for for all the uh, all the scenarios. And as I started talking to different MVPs, different uh, data center uh, admins, uh, I started to, to understand that this was sort of enabled by default in, in all the uh, the platforms. And uh, um, in my own experience, that happened to me as well. Um, so we decided to take the 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 approach of working on this component and being able to be a, take take a uh, give a better experience in terms of the vm of what the components of the cpu is going to use so basically in a cluster environment for example you will have different um you can have your migrating the scenario will be you're migrating uh, from one hardware to the other maybe your cpu vendor gave you a new cpu that you're replacing um and you want to migrate those vms over so the, the basically what's going to happen is Hyper-V will detect that mini, minimal a minimal denominator um, that's available throughout the nodes, and will provide that to the C, to the um, to the VM. So this will give you um, not bring you back into a platform that we we think it's um, what it's available in the platform, but actually this is what uh, the minimum path that you have or uh, offerings from the CPU to the VM. Um, so the idea here is to optimize the, the VM for the use that you have at the time. Um, this is something that we are uh, working on um, and hopefully we will have uh, for the next upcoming uh, releases of, of, of Hyper-V and, and Windows. But it's, uh, it, it, it's, you won't be penalized this time to be, um, having it enabled because we, we we've seen it that you have it enabled all the time um maybe you are encouraged to enable it now and be able to to have that uh, a, a minimal denominator for you for your cpus so this is very important to to our platform um 
next topic, something that we, um, another one that we're working on and, and thinking about um, thoroughly. So a couple of years ago, Cluster um, uh, removed their dependency for Active Directory. And um, you can bring up a, a cluster pretty much um, uh, self-contained. Uh, you can bring up Hyper-V, but the, the problem there is that you didn't, you didn't have um, live migration. You only had quick migration, so your machine had to go down um, and move it across nodes. Um, because of the scenarios that we see with Azure Stack HCI, we, we understand that a lot of uh, our customers are probably going to place some of these nodes in in areas um, that are not they don't have constant connectivity. Uh, it could be, I don't know, some some the back of a truck or a, a retail store or something. I don't know some some uh, some building that has very limited access. Um, so it's, it's, if you have a VM and you want to migrate it across the nodes and you don't want to lose um, the you don't want uh, you want to reduce your downtime. Uh, we want to be able to to provide you with the, with with a live migration component that you can do that, and that's what we're thinking about. Um, I don't have a, an ETA for this one. It's something that we're we're in the process of understanding and and, and working on, but basically, it will give you that uh, flexibility to um, remove that dependency for um, of of live migration of Active Directory and be able to move your your VM around. Um, this is um this is to and with this we complete the scenario this offline scenario right and um, hopefully it will be a better experience uh, for for our HCI customers moving forward when they have to to bring these hardware into these remote areas or um, or have the different nodes in in the field. All right, next uh, next slide. GPUs. We've heard you loud and clear. Um, feedback for a GPU has been, um, I think, in all the conversations I've had with customers and MVPs, is one of the, the topics that comes up. And um, just want to uh, be able to say that we are um, looking into uh, the work with GPU. Um, we have right now uh, DDA um, that, is, that is available. And we are thinking of more in-depth scenarios um, that we can use GPUs, uh, GPU, GPUP, but also uh, bringing them into cluster environments um, and and looking at ways to to migrate. So it's 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 something that um, uh, the feedback that we've gotten is, hey, we need we we want GPU, we want it to be able to to migrate around. Uh, we want to leverage this technology, and there's several scenarios as to why uh, you will want to use it. Um, so this is something that we are uh, investigating and, and working on, and um, hopefully um, in the in the next uh, couple of versions, uh, we, we we have we will have something that you can 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 leverage. Um, so stay tuned there. Another component that is important to us is security. So we are we are investing in security. Uh, it continues to be uh, an important uh, area. Um, we want to continue uh, to we, we there's plenty of CPU attacks occurring, uh, different vectors of, of attacks that are coming up. Uh, so we have to continue to be um, in in our in our in our toes to to understand what's what 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 we do, what investments we do in security. So we continue to invest in this area. Um, but at the same time, we also want to have integration um, with with Azure components and leverage this the the hybrid story and continue to have ease of use and and uh, and not be a burden to to configure. Um, so we we're trying to understand more this this platform and how do we move forward. Um, on having uh, integration, um, more security comp integration with uh, with its security in in Azure, um, and leverage those investments within our on premise. Um, so these are areas that we continue to to look into, and uh, uh, these are uh, super complex, 
but at the same time, it will help us understand more the the bring more of of investments that. Again, going back to to what we were I was mentioning earlier, investments that we do in Azure can trickle down to to on premise and that's and this is one of those areas. So um, we we're looking uh, more into this. And uh, last but not least. Windows Admin Center, so we continue to. Work together with with the Admin Center. Um, proceed. We'll talk more about Windows Admin Center in, in the next couple of minutes. Um, we uh, when I joined the team um, this year, uh, Proceed and I were. Proceed was the first PM probably that I worked with, and and we we had long conversations and meetings about what needs to be in in, in Windows Admin Center to manage Hyper V. So we we work together to develop a, a good roadmap and 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 proceed has done a great job um, moving those items forward. So there's a lot of excitement um, of having Windows Admin Center be the, the single pane of glass um, for administrators to use. Um, so so expect more uh, to come there. We continue to to um, work with the with the admin team. So Hyper-V has a very strong relationship with Windows Admin Center. To the point that when um, new, if if new APIs or anything that's available, we always have a direct contact of the Windows Admin Center to to talk to and, and let them know, hey, uh, this is coming, so for you to leverage. So this is the path forward for us, moving towards Windows Admin Center to be that platform that manages Hyper-V. Um, so in summary, basically, hybrid cloud. Um, Shipping to Azure and then Windows Server. That's that's what's the the expectation. Innovations in Azure will apply to Windows Server as we use the same base. Focus on quality and focus on security. Um, so stay tuned for. Um, we'll probably um, in next announcements that we that we make we will we'll make some progress on these and um, we'll let you know. For now, I'll. Segue to um, I'll hand it off to proceed to talk about uh, Windows Admin Center. Awesome, thank you so much, Alvin. Uh, yeah, as Alvin mentioned, um, Windows Admin Center is is going to be the future of virtual machine management, or, or even currently is what you should be using for Windows for virtual machine management when it comes to Azure Stack HCI. Um, in the last presentation, Priya talked a little bit about what Windows Admin Center is, so I'm not really going to repeat any of that, uh, but instead focus here on virtual machine management in Windows Admin Center. Um, and since we're here, obviously, to talk about Azure Stack ATI, let's talk about what people do when it comes to cluster management and what it really does look like in Windows Admin Center. Um, so here I'm going to connect to a two node cluster, and I just want to show you the value and elegance that we have brought and added with Windows Admin Center. Um, so this is a two node cluster with um, eight total drives. It has 37 virtual machines, um, 18 of which are running. Um, so even with two nodes, you can just see how powerful you can deliver an HCI system. Um, an admin center makes it easy and elegant to manage. Uh, for example, I can see uh, my cluster performance over the course of an hour, um, over the course of a day, over the course of a week, um, giving me quick insight into the performance of my system. Of course, let's focus on the Virtual Machines tool. Um, the Virtual Machine tool in Windows Admin Center includes high-level Hyper-V host resource monitoring. Um, again, I have 18 virtual machines running here. Six of them are turned off, 13 that are saved. Um, and I can immediately see which of these are taking the most amount of memory, the most amount of CPU. Um, I can see IO performance metrics, uh, virtual machine health alerts, and events for the Hyper-V host server um, or the entire cluster in a single dashboard. And of course, I'm going to be spending most of my time here on the inventory page. Um, Admin Center brings a unified experience, bringing together Hyper V Manager and Failover Cluster Manager capabilities together. Um, I can view all of the virtual machines that are running across a cluster. I mean, if I want, I can drill down into a single virtual machine uh, for advanced management and troubleshooting. Uh, we released a virtual machine tool about uh, a couple of years ago, and since then we've built a whole ton of new tools from from basic capabilities like creating a new VM, connecting to it, turning it on and off, to all the way um, to adding in new functionality that never existed with Hyper-V Manager. So of course, given the importance of virtual machine management for clusters, we are constantly building on new Hyper-V management tools in Windows Admin Center. Um, our telemetry has shown that Windows, that our virtual machine tool is the highest used tool, and of course we understand why. 
Uh, we have customers that tell us that they, they practically spend their entire day working on this tool. Um, so we were really focused on improving the features we have and really reducing the need to use Hyper Me Manager and uh, really focusing on the virtual machine management in, in Windows Admin Center. Um, so for the first, although very simple change that we made, and, and um, once again, I'm actually going to be focusing um, in this presentation about stuff that we released here in the VM tool over the last couple of uh, last couple of months, um, and just kind of show that we, we are continuously investing in this tool. Um, so the first, although simple yet very useful change that we made uh, was with a new drop down menu. Uh, we realized that as we kept growing our management tools, um, searching through this list has gotten very long and cumbersome. Um, so we did some research and we grouped these tasks accordingly. Um, and as we continue to add new features, um, these drop downs will, will continue to grow um, and hopefully not grow too much. Um, so it's still easy enough for, for you, know, you to manage your VMs here. Next, I want to talk about one of our most requested features for the VM tool. Um, live storage migration. So under manage, um, I will see the move command here, um, giving me the ability to live migrate the entire cluster or the entire VM um, or just its storage to another location. Um, last year at Ignite, we introduced um, live VM migration where you're able to move between uh, clusters, between servers, uh, really more things than Hyper-V Manager ever could. Uh, but this time we've introduced now live storage migration. Um, and just as Hyper-V or failover cluster manager did, live storage migration in Admin Center allows for um, redistributing due to new storage capabilities, uh, defragmenting VM storage space, uh, migrating from local storage to network storage, um, and really many other things that, that IT administrators are used to. Um, and this task really, as you saw here, just takes a few minutes um, and a few button clicks in Admin Center. Next, in version 2009, uh, we bring in some new capabilities to manage the actual operating system of your virtual machine. Um, let's start with, with giving multiple people access to your VM by joining a domain. So under the Manage tab here, um, you'll see a new button to join a new domain. Um, normally, this, is, this task would require me to um, RDP, navigate to computer settings, um, to join the domain and then give other users in the domain access to the VM. Uh, but actually not anymore by just entering uh, my domain name here, uh, my credentials of the domain, and of course uh, the credentials for the actual virtual machine, um, I'm able to connect this VM straight to a domain. Um, and of course, uh, connecting to the name will require uh, the VM itself to restart, which Admin Center will also take care, take care of it for you. Um, and as we continue to talk about actually managing managing the, the actual operating system of your VM. Um, it brings us to our next feature, which is uh, managing any virtual machine using Windows Admin Center tools. Um, so under connect, what we've had before, um, you're able to connect to uh, the actual virtual machine, so um, an RDP session in the browser, um, or you're able to download an RDP file. Um, but really what, blurs the differences between whether you're managing a VM with or without um, is now you're able to manage your VM using standard Windows Admin Center tools uh, right from within the inventory page here. Um, truly bringing in complete granular management uh, configuration, troubleshooting, and maintenance functionality to your VMs that are running on-prem. Um, as you can see here, we already connected to the Redmond domain, so it says connect to the Redmond. Um, and on the left hand side, you'll see this whole list of tools that you're used to when it comes to managing VMs or managing any servers in Windows Admin Center. So I'm going to actually um, hop back here into the inventory page um, and talk about our next feature. Um, we released virtual machine cloning uh, back in Windows Admin Center uh, version 2007 back in July. Uh, but we've made a whole bunch of bug fixes and improvements um, in our latest release of it in version 2009 this past Ignite. I and mean, for those of you that, that may not have ever seen this feature before, um, I'm going to quickly show you what it looked like in the past to clone uh, in Hyper-V Manager. So if I were in, in Hyper-V Manager, uh, you know, first I was RDP into my server. Uh, in this case, this is a, a server on a, on a Windows Server 2019 HCI cluster. Um, I would open Hyper-V Manager, um, and I would um, create a checkpoint. I would have to sysprep my machine. Um, in, in this case, I'd, I'd want to have a golden VM that I'd want to clone. 
So um, I named my, my checkpoint here pre-syspep. I'm going to RDP into my VM. I'm going to sysprep my VM. Um, and I'll eventually have to you know, shut this down. I'll have to export it into a temporary folder, re-import it back in. Um, I'll delete my temporary folder, rename it, cluster it if I want to, uh, restore an old checkpoint on my parent VM, delete checkpoints, and, and really all of the things that um, there's a long video here that I'm, I'm really not going to go through. But um, in, in reality, actually recording this video that I've, I've sped up here you know, three or four times would take me over an hour. Um, and really after an hour later of, of going through all of these steps of me actively clicking, um, I'll finally be able to um, get a new uh, VM that is a clone of my original VM. Um, as you can see, this is a, a rather cumbersome process and I really knew all of the steps that I had to do to get here. Um, I had them all written down and I followed them in order just so I could record that particular video. Um, and so the goal here is to actually make this significantly easier in Windows Admin Center. So let's see what this looks like here in Windows Admin Center. Um, under Manage, um, there is a clone button that I clicked. And if I click that clone button, um, all it'll ask me here is for a the name of my cloned VM that I, that I want, um, the location of where I want it to be. This is the same as if you were creating a new VM. Um, there'll be a checkbox here that asks if I want um, us, so Windows Admin Center, to run sysprep on the virtual machine. Um, or if I already have the sysprep golden image, um, I can hit that checkbox and we won't sysprep it for you. Um, and that's it. Um, I'll hit the clone button. Um, in this case, since I want to sysprep it, um, it's going to ask me for the admin credentials for the actual uh, virtual machine so we can run sysprep. Um, and that's it. Um, in, in about five or ten minutes, um, the cloning process will complete and there will be a new VM um, that would be, you know, in this case, demo VM clone that I can start using. Um, I didn't have to, you know, constantly sit there and uh, talk and and click a bunch of buttons. Um, I could go and get a cup of coffee. Um, and we're actually working to to make this even better uh, by adding functionality to create multiple clones at the same time. Um, so stay tuned for that particular improvement. The next improvement we've made um, is actually introducing a UI uh, for you to manage your affinity and anti-affinity rules. Um, so this is introduced in Azure Stack ATI and also uh, Windows Server vNext. Um, so you can use Windows Admin Center to easily create um, your affinity and anti-affinity rules for your virtual machine in a cluster. Uh, for those of you that, that may not be uh, aware yet, affinity um, is a rule that establishes a relationship between two or more resource groups or roles. Um, so in this case, virtual machines to keep them together on the same server um, or a cluster or a site. Um, and anti-affinity is then in that case is the opposite. Um, it's used to keep um, specified VMs or resource groups apart from each other. Um, so if you want, you know, two domain controllers placed on separate servers or separate sites for disaster recovery. Um, this affinity and anti-affinity is rather similar to the way um, Azure uses availability stones. Um, so in Windows Admin Center, uh, you can manage these affinity rules either in a particular virtual machine settings um, or you can go to your cluster wide settings that I have in the screenshot here um, to uh, manage, create or delete these affinity rules for your Azure Stack ATI cluster. Um, lastly, I want to talk about a feature that we haven't released just yet, uh, but it actually builds on some of the stuff that Alvin was talking about when it comes to GPU management. Um, so we, we again, we haven't released this just yet. We're very excited to do it pretty soon. Um, so take this demo uh, up here as a simple sneak peek as to what is coming. Uh, we know that that um, as Alvin mentioned, DDA discrete direct assignment of GPUs to virtual machines has been present in PowerShell since uh, Windows Server 2016. Um, and so Windows Admin Center has built a, a user interface to make this assignment easy and elegant to manage. Um, of course, the investments that that Alvin talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, will also continue to be lit up um, in this uh, GPU tool. Um, so let's quickly take a look at what this looks like. Um, here I'm going to connect to uh, one of my Azure Stack ATI nodes. Um, so you can see here that this is um, an Azure Stack ATI node. And if I scroll down here on my list of tools, um, I'll see this new extension, which is the GPU extension. Uh, here um, I can see a list of all the GPUs that are present on this machine. Um, in this case, the first one here is the Microsoft Basic Display Adapter, which is the integrated GPU. Um, in this case, you'll see that this particular GPU is not assignable. Um, it's an old style PCI device, and the tool tells you that. Um, second GPU here, um, here what it's called the 3D Video Controller. 
um, is in fact an NVIDIA GPU uh, for which I haven't installed the drivers for just yet. And this is intentional um, just for, for this particular demo. Um, and so it's going to say that it's in the error state. Um, and uh, it says here that this is um, available for assignment, um, but it's not assigned just yet. So I can click on this particular GPU. Um, I can click on the assign button. Um, in this case, we support DDA assignment, so um, that, that's sort of grayed out, but you can choose the GPU um, and a VM you want to assign this GPU to. Um, in this case, since I have not installed the drivers for this NVIDIA GPU, um, I'll need to assign it without a mitigation driver, uh, which is what this checkbox here is an under advanced. Um, and so uh, all of these kind of steps that you would have to go through, whether in the past you would have to use PowerShell, uh, we've kind of created a UI here for you to be able to assign these GPUs to your virtual machines. Um, so in this case, I'll just hit assign um, and it takes just a couple seconds um, and this GPU will be assigned to your VM. Um, the page here will of course update and let you know that it's assigned to um, a particular VM um, and the device status here changes to unknown. Um, so now here, if you decide to go to uh, your particular VM, you'll be able to use this GPU on that VM. Um, Currently, uh, we, we plan to release this tool um, in the next few months here, and uh, it'll be available for managing Azure Stack HCI servers. Um, and you'll also be able to do uh, this GPU assignment, not only um, here in a separate GPU tool, but also in the virtual machine tool itself. Um, so that's all we have for virtual machine management um, in Windows Admin Center. Um, as, as Ellen and I mentioned, we are constantly building on these new tools, and we really we understand and know the importance of VM management. Uh, so thank you all for tuning in. Um, if you have a few minutes, we'd actually love to hear from you from a quick survey uh, to let us know what you're looking for when it comes to VM management in Windows Admin Center and Hyper-V. Um, so if you have a few minutes, feel free to, to fill out that form. It'd be um, helpful to both Alvin and I. But other than that, I think uh, we're ready to take on some questions. Yeah, uh, thanks Pradesh and Alvin. Uh, great presentation. And I heard some very exciting stuff uh, about Hyper-V. You mentioned uh, nested AMD support. You mentioned GPU, you are thinking about it. So I, I guess Didier has some que questions from uh, the audience. So Didier, yes. are, are you ready to share them? Yes, I am. Can you hear me, old guy? I can hear you. OK, cool. So I, I made sure to note that the AMD question was going to be asked. So that is really coming and uh, maybe a general remark about all the questions that I'm going to share is people would love to hear some sort of a time frame and also where it will be available because there is a concern with both the AMD Epic support for uh, nested as with GPU enhancements. Will it only be available with Azure Stack HCI or also with Windows Server vNext? Uh, what will be backported? All that sort of questions is something that I think will help uh, bring the message over to people that Hyper-V isn't dead, right? So <laughs> that's kind of important uh, that people get an answer, get those questions answered. Uh, another question from the audience there was, uh, if Hyper-V or, or let's say the enhancement with Hyper-V, if, if there will be something like uh, new high performance storage options via the SPDK, the same way you had it with uh, the, what they call it uh, networking uh, via DDPK, I think they mean D, DPDK actually for high throughput. So they are really asking for, are there any optimizations to be done for high performance storage? Maybe they are talking about P persistent memory uh, evolutions in that. Uh, that also ties into AMD. What's the roadmap with AMD when it comes to persistent memory? Uh, because at the moment, yeah, persistent memory doesn't seem to be making uh, so many advancements as people had hoped. Uh, I have a question also about Linux machines. If SSH over the VM bus would be possible in the future, Did and you, then one. Yeah. Let them let them answer one of the questions. I'm, yeah, I'm, the going, questions. I'm going to let them answer. I'm just uh, iterating them so everybody knows I'm not forgetting them, and I'm getting them. And then yeah. the last one somebody would like to have answered is about the cloning, if it also works perfectly with differencing disks. So let's go. The AMD question I think is clear. Hey, hey, this is this is Jeff Wolsey. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Hey, let me let me quickly chime in on the AMD one. I I, I heard that um, um, yeah, it was covered already, um, um, but by Alvin. But I just wanted to. I I I thought I responded in the in the chat window, and I'm not sure that I clicked publish, and I'm not sure it actually got published. So I, I just typing. 
I, I just wanted to chime in and say, um, again, reiterate what Alvin said was, yeah, we put AMD nested support in Windows 10 um, and we are there's some additional performance and scalability work that we have to do on server. Keep in mind that servers ship with, you know, dozens and dozens of cores, which is a lot of bit. There's a difference performance and scalability profile than we see on a laptop or a client system. And so that's why we're taking a little bit longer to make sure that we really have our ducks lined up in a row. But I can tell you personally, I am in the process of building a 16 core AMD Ryzen system with 128 gigs of RAM uh, filled with a bunch of NVMe flash, and I promise I will regularly ping the developer to make sure that nested support is coming. So do you have nothing to worry about? It's absolutely 100% coming on AMD, um, and that is something that we'll have in uh, in upcoming releases of server. Okay. So just want to okay. reiterate, it's on the way. Yeah, Jeff, thank you for, for the answer, Jeff. So uh, just to confirm, the next server will probably have nested on AMD. You heard me say upcoming release. So next server, Up next Azure Stack HCI, yes. OK, thank you very much. And there is a great session at the end with uh, Jeff. I'm looking forward to that. But now let's answer the other questions from DDA. What what was it again? Well, there was the one question about uh, the, the uh, future for high performance storage options uh, via an SPDK, for example, from Intel, I guess. I think the question evolves around what what is happening here to optimize the performance of the high performance storage like persistent memory so uh, i think we should just take a quick moment to just talk about storage and i know we got to get on to the next session so i want to make sure that you know keep a close eye on time video here but when it comes to storage we are super closely involved with all of the high persistent flash storage so i'm kind of i'm a little per perplexed by the question right off the bat because we've been doing this you know we've been doing a whole bunch of close you know stuff with optane for example and we demonstrated over 13 million uh, iops you know 2 years ago um, with Hyper-V, so we have been the leaders when it comes to persistent flash memory and virtualization. Um, and in fact, we leverage that in Azure, we leverage that on premises, and absolutely we are continuing to drive that forward. We're actually very excited about the new enhancements coming in hardware. Um, it seems like it's taken forever, but PCIe Gen 4 is finally really, really, you know, it's it's here on AMD, it's it's coming on, on Intel, um, and we're, we're really excited to see more of that that, you know, in, in the server platform, in more server platforms as well. But you you should just understand, no, no, we we are we are when it comes to high speed storage, we're we're at the forefront in leadership role there. Um, because quite honestly, we have a number of our our, our own interests have been, have been there forever, like SQL. Um, SQL absolutely wants the, the highest performing, lowest latency storage out there. And in fact, we're we're absolutely looking at, at optimizations that we're working with them on on the futures that we can't talk about today. But yeah, when it comes to persistent memory flash storage. Yeah, there's a there's a ton we're already doing there, and we're going to continue to do more. Um, in terms of specifics, like the uh, DDK, uh, SPDK, and stuff like that, I'm not sure we're ready to talk about that quite yet. Uh, if Alvin wants to say something, I'll, I will let him, but I, I'm not sure we're ready to get into that today. Correct. Alvin? Yeah. Uh, something that um, I will be uh, happy to take some information. I mean, if you go down the form that Proceed mentioned, and you want to. It, kind of ask the question or describe the scenarios, that'll be great to, to have more information about. Maybe quick, uh, everybody is very happy about the GPU efforts, of course, and it has been long, long awaited, let's put it that way. So time frame is also V next, I guess, for everything. Um, we're not talking about right now when it comes to GPU, we're talking about the DDA enhancements that we're doing in 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 an admin center. And I don't want to I don't want to talk about any surprises or anything happening in GPU right now. But the important thing to understand is we, we clearly know how important it is. We're using it in Azure. We're using it, in fact, in some of the other Azure Stack products. And of course, you're going to see it in Stack HCI as well. OK, then the question for from the person that might want to see SSH over VM bus. Any any work being done there? I don't know about anyone looking at SSH over VM bus at the moment. However, I that that 
I, I don't want to speak out of turn because I know that the Azure guys, um, uh, there's a very good chance that someone could actually be working on that right now uh, over in Azure. So at the moment, um, specifically, it's not something we're targeting in Stack HCI, but uh, I'd like very much to know more about the scenario. So if, if there's more information you want to provide, you know, the more the better would be great. Put it in the chat, so I would say that we can pass it on. That or would you be can great. pass yeah, it on via the survey. Could, it, expand on the scenario would be great. And then the cloning question, uh, the, the, the WAG demo, does it work perfectly with differencing disk as well? I would say yes, why not? But let's hear Microsoft confirm or deny this. Yeah, so it absolutely should. Um, if it doesn't, um, put it up on user voice. I kind of triage those once a week and I'll, I'll start looking into it. Okay, so there we have it. So that's most of the questions. Uh, if anybody else has one, it's your last chance to to ask them, and I will see if something new popped up. Uh, ah, so so the question again is about the persistent memory. Please talk about all the platforms, both for AMD and Intel. That's something I already mentioned. It's been a bit, it, the let's say the alternatives, the the non CPU tied versions of PMEM seem to have been delayed a bit, and a lot of people are awaiting that, and they also want a roadmap for. It. AMD because it would be kind of sad for them to benefit from all the cores in AMD and, and have to miss out on the PMEM fund. Let's put it that way. Yeah, uh, I, I guess the one comment I would make is I, I can't speak for other hardware partners in some of their time frame, so I'm going to I'm going to politely push that to the side. My, my point would be is we are very much committed to all of the high speed storage. Quite honestly, we've been pushing these vendors to speed this up for a while now, so we're very excited about what they're doing. And as fast as it's coming to market, we are working to make sure that we are enabling it on all of our platforms. So whether it's NVMe, whether it's um, uh, Optane, whether it's actually sitting in a dim socket, trust me, we're working with all of them. Yeah. So I think okay. we have to wait a bit longer for to see it to see it happen. But I think uh, from the answers from Jeff that they are coming. They are working on it. Uh, so I will uh, take the opportunity to talk a bit to Didier. Didier is a fellow MVP of mine for. Um, camera back on then. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? You are an MVP. I think ten years than like I am, right? We are uh, we are dinosaurs. Six right? months, six months less than you are, of course. But that's seniority <laughs> for you. That's seniority for yes, you. Thank you. So, Did you? We doing? Uh, we are doing also some stuff together. Uh, I want to mention the um, Hyper V Amigos show. Yes, we tend to, we tend to get together and uh, record all our musings and experiments uh, it's uh, pretty fun to do and we tend to dive into some of the let's say the more interesting aspects of running hyper-v clusters and doing all kinds of funky stuff with them yeah also also a backup uh, backup is a big one we do uh, we are just in the moment working on some secret white paper that is uh, that is uh, taking a lot of time of us right yes <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but it, it's it's kind of fun. We, we're trying to see where we, what 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 the, the platform can deliver, because some people out there still think that well, Hyper-V is for the people that don't need performance or don't have a budget. But I think if you you can build fantastically well-performing solutions with with a with a budget that is economically feasible, so there's there's all kinds of stuff still to be done uh, on-prem in hybrid scenarios. Uh, so. That that need is still out there. Uh, the focus sometimes might not be there in, in in the marketing messages, but there is so much to talk about that almost everything is drowning in, let's say the the noise. It's it's a, it's a negative mm -hmm. word, I know, but in the noise everybody else makes, right? Yeah. So did you mention your blog, please? Because there are people out there they like that like to read deep technical stuff. So please <laughs> mention your blog. So it's working hard in IT dot work basically so that that's easy to remember uh, you can find all kinds of musings of me both on technical issues and non-technical issues backup storage networking uh, all the kinds kind of fun stuff we we run into while uh, let's say supporting and designing and building and deploying this stuff in in real life because okay. uh, it's not it's not a it's not as esoteric as the marketing uh, brochures would like uh, like it to be, but it's it's uh, it's amazing to see, and I can really say this with the hand on my heart, uh, the awesome solutions we've been able to build over the past decade, uh, starting with Hyper-V when it was still in beta, 
uh, that product has really delivered for us. Yeah. So Didi, thank you so much with the questions and supporting uh, supporting the ongoing show. And thank you to Alvin uh, and Pradesh for the presentation. And we now switch over to our sponsor and uh, I have it uh, I have it here and Manfred also redressed Manfred great so uh, uh, Udo you, you you stole our Lenovo moment on the show we're oh, sharing sorry. your screen <laughs> <laughs> okay. so uh, I hand over to uh, Udo uh, Udo also is someone I know very well Udo and I we do the Hyper-V community in Germany quite for 10 years now or, or nine or so. But today we yeah. don't want to talk about that. That We want to talk about the awesome solutions you do for Azure Stack HCI, right? Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. And uh, I try the best to shorten the marketing stuff, you know, but you uh, ask me to deliver some technical stuff. But of course, there are some uh, Lenovo messages in it, but I try to shorten it. And most of the things I try to show are from also our best practices or our trainings we do with partners and all the situations I have uh, every day. So yeah, I'm a German speaking expert. So or more in the south of Germany, so Bavarian. So excuse my Bavarian style English, so I hope everybody gets it. But otherwise, as we said, uh, just write me an email and try to answer. So I'm responsible for the German speaking area, so also Switzerland and Austria, and I work with Carsten quite a long time and also with, uh, with Microsoft guys, of course, around the globe. So let's start what I want to show you. So we go through, you know, just a quick how we fit into the ecosystem for Microsoft and we spend more time on the hardware piece uh, because all the other sessions are, are software related. Uh, I will spend a little bit time on, on the hardware piece, what you need to buy or what you can use and so on and what, what I prefer, let's say my, my personal uh, favor and uh, also what's new coming to Azure Stack HCI from a, from a, a hardware point of view. So on what our solutions are uh, changing and on the end, just quick what where you find more information uh, when you look for it. And yeah, just for for a starting, you know, uh, why HCI? Not the long story, so the short story why, why I like uh, HCI. So uh, I also started, you know, quite long time ago, like Carsten, so 30 years ago with IT, 1988. And uh, all we had, of course, the last decades have been like uh, converged or three tier or legacy, whatever you call it. And uh, my, my topic here is that uh, you can reduce the footprint. Of course, you do virtualization and before maybe you have done it or half half or so. And in the new world, you do everything on virtual machines uh, and uh, then you shrink also your, your equipment. And of course, you concentrate more on special features in the software stack or what I call the Microsoft stack here is like a, a, the magic software. So you, you use standard servers, a couple of switches with some features you need and then the magic software, which is uh, Windows Server 2019 or Azure Stack HC iOS. And also what I saw when I was a customer and a, uh, also a partner in the, in the last decades. So it helped me also a little bit to simplify it because you reduce the skills, let's say the areas of skills you need, okay? Then you go deeper or you can go deeper also with a smaller team. And uh, my special uh, plus is to standardize it. So I always try to also in my early days to standardize on, on a few uh, hardware stacks and, and have some building blocks, whatever you call it, and do more with that, you know. And on the end, it should also end to, to save you some money, you know, dollars or euros, whatever you like. And um, moving on to, to our, how we relate or how Lenovo is, is adding value in the ecosystem. So first I need to introduce a, a, a quick uh, brand name we have uh, created. So it's Think HL and all Think HL solutions we have are this software defined infra integrated system. So there are a couple of, you know, HCI, uh, hyperconverged infrastructure or SDI or whatever. And each vendor of course has its own brand for that. And then we have said Think HL. So we generated that Sync HR brand. So uh, moving away from single servers, of course, you plug into a storage network or so, which is like converged or what I call Lego sometimes because 
afterwards uh, you 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 got the, the equipment you find out what works with what uh, together and uh, the think agile brand also should deliver something for you as a partner and customer to ease it and to you know not spend hours or days on some um, um, supportability metrics is also what works exactly with with uh, with the components and the hci part here for think agile is like okay you get a, a complete uh created car right you don't go out and buy different components from different vendors and then find out how it works together so the think agile brand is our brand for for everything software defined and and how that maps into the microsoft uh, hybrid view so here a picture for you so we have also an azure stack hub uh, offering so we call that think hl sxm for the hybrid cloud stuff kind of which started 2017 with the azure stack name without something added and now it's converted to or added with, with the hub which makes also some more sense as an hub site to to public azure and what we focus on today is the, the two on the left you know, I have stolen the Microsoft view on the Edge on the left side. That's not the server you, you rent from Microsoft. So the Edge, what we provide, is also an HCI, so an Azure Stack HCI for the Edge, but you will see more details in, in short. And in the middle, what we, you know, our daily work we did the last uh, years with starting with Windows Server 2016 with storage spaces in Windows Server. Uh, that's what we call Think HL MX. And of course, there are two options hybrid in terms of the storage combination. I will show you in a minute and the all flash um, where Carsten and I especially are always looking for the latest, greatest technology and to do the performance testing. So that's our view in, in them from the Microsoft point of uh, world. And as we had already a few questions in the chats and we also I responded and as we work with Carsten and all the other MVPs on the call in some community to spread the message, the important thing for you as a customer and partner should always be, you know, start with the Azure Stack HCI catalog. There you get all the certified systems. So it's not just a few clicks. So we get systems onto that map. Uh, you need to run a special test for it. And uh, it tells you as a customer and partner that all the components which are in are certified, like, you know, uh, completely uh, created car and not not just pieces and you find out what works together so here you have a few like okay we have 30 uh, to uh, 30 uh, 23 uh, results when you look for lenovo but you can build more uh, combinations of course so that's just like the starting you know you start with 23 different combinations small ones you know big ones with a lot of storage with flash and and you see here also the batches microsoft created for us and and that's just uh, to to recap from from cosmos talks he had the last couple of uh, years uh, around hci now we have this uh, six batches you know we have this branch office and edge where we have a server i will show you some details uh, and then the other ones like vdi and scale out storage and so on and just to have you see, okay, we have a mapping here also with some Microsoft. So, and to start quickly with some hardware details. So, our Think HLMX, so Think HL, as I said, software defined platforms, M from Microsoft, uh, totally easy, and X comes from this old x68. IBM times, you know, we, we uh, server, Lenovo server grew up in, in, in IBM. And so now we are like, like a Lenovo laptops, you know, a different company. And to start with a quick last few on the complete stack. Okay, you have certified nodes, what we call it normally. And now with Azure Stack HCI, you buy your, uh, let's say, branded certified hardware, which is tested this five days. I guess it takes normally to run the test for certification. In the old days, you would have uh, used Windows Server 2019, but it's still valid. So confusion in my customer area and partners and, and, and customers are calling me always. Does it, is it a new version? No, it's like a second version you can use, you know, and we still have not found out uh, what will be the branding and the naming, you know, so let's call it data center HCI because it's based on Windows Server 2019 data center and call the new, new stuff uh, Azure Stack HCI. So it's just my personal opinion. So. We will see later how it works out. <clears throat> and then you use the admin center for configuring it, for managing it, and and, and you use it for connect it to uh, 
Azure services, which makes sense for the hybrid, you know, like a site recovery, backup, and so on. So, but let's let's move on with with what we do. So in the in the Think HLMX, so we do that testing. Of course, it's everything is uh, is running through that certification test, and then it will end up on the certification website, and you can be sure that everything is you know like uh, tested really in in, in deep tests and that network cards are running and so on. So it's like a if you look on a generic server, uh, like most of our friends are using, you know, this typical 2U server, um, you have maybe, if you have 100 options for the Azure Stack HCI, you maybe just have 10 or 20 options, which are make sense for HCI and plus are tested and and have uh, uh, fulfilling the requirements. So, so it's pre-certified. So we also have some uh, plugins for the admin center, which we will see a little bit more details. So it's easy to order because it's like, you know, one server which includes out of the box all the certified components. Of course, you can uh, decide what um, what numbers are you have on NVMEs and network cards and so on, but everything you can select is like pre-tested and uh, it should help you to, to start faster, you know, like, okay, it's, uh, accelerate time to value is that nice wording uh, and but it, it helps you really uh, buy it you know you get shipped and you can start out of the uh, unbox it and then after it's it's cabled correctly then you really can deploy it what you have already seen with Windows Admin Center the data center HCI most of the time Gosten and I of course train the partners and customers how to use it or how to deploy it on PowerShell because that was the way uh, the easiest way and, and fast uh, fastest way since Windows Server 2016 uh, when S2D started how I, how we call it in short but now you have a bunch of you know options you can use for your Azure Stack HCI you can use the Azure portal you can use the Windows Admin Center you still can use the tools you know you can use PowerShell of course so all options are there and also the hardware options uh, uh, processors CPUs storage are still kind of the same so everybody who has already worked with S2D the last uh, 10 years so everything you learned you just add new skills, but that's our normal IT life, right? So you 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 always have to add new skills to your pocket to be able to handle the new stuff. But all you learned, or Carsten trained a lot of people and had webinars, so tons of webinars. Manfred did great job on on training uh, through the last months. You know, I have a lot of online trainings for that. So everything you learned is still here, and as you see here, as a start with uh, the hybrid storage options. Um, so you still can uh, do the same and everything is like certified for the Azure Stack HCI operating system in the same way. So <clears throat> you can use that option if you need like, say high capacity, I would say if you need a few hundred terabytes, maybe then you would maybe need to start with uh, high capacity HDDs. So most combinations we see is just the left one. So you put NVMEs because fastest flash in front of the HDDs. Uh, and then run it. Same for the flash only, how I call it, you know, and my personal favors are the left and the right. So I try to use always capacity only because when I have already super fast flash systems, uh, there is an easy advantage of the combinations or is if that you only use one tier, so you, you easily can add your know, storage devices. So if you need more storage, just add a couple of NVMEs or a couple of SSDs, and you don't need to uh, check on that uh, ratio on, on uh, cache to capacity, so from the numbers uh, of the drives or from the percentage. So it, it gives you an easy uh, uh, option to, to add storage, so that's why my personal, uh, you know, uh, star is the SSD or NVMe only, and just add storage capacity later. So, and of course, we had the discussion with the persistent memory. So maybe the more official name or the generic name would be the storage class memory, and and you see from the logo from the icon, so it's like flash in the in the in the slot of the RAM. Uh, in the machine and we have it also in the lab, but uh, the requests from the customers have not been so high. So um, we see just a few, 
a few requests per year. I guess it will also change, as, as Didier mentioned, in the future when new uh, motherboards came, new generations, next Intel platform, next AMD platform, which has maybe more options and you don't lose maybe uh, slots for, uh, for, for RAM, so to use it for PMEM, but let's see. And as you know, the, the combinations are just, you know, uh, fast with fast, uh, so for HDDs it's not possible because HDDs is uh, far away from, from the performance, but uh, uh, that's a combination you can do also for system memory. And the new star, which I'd like to introduce to you if you have not seen it, uh, so we have uh, certified like a another type of server. So we, we created last year and we also certified that this year for uh, S2D or data center HCI and Azure Stack HCI brings you a really funny uh, momentum to the to the possible configuration. So you have a small server, uh, as you see, it also had a tenor, so you also can see uh, use it for for like Wi-Fi. And here the first thing, how how big is it? So it's uh, as small as it can be. So you can have two servers on on one U. So you have also redundant power supply, as you see on the end of the picture on the rear. So you have two uh, external power supplies and there are different of options you can mount it. So I really like this small thing. The first time when I saw it and said, okay, you really want to use that for storage space direct, but uh, it turned out I'm really a fan now of it uh, because you mount, can mount it somewhere you like it. Uh, so you can have it like a tower can just put it on a desk, of course, and um, other options here for industry, especially when you when you go into productions area. Uh, and it's really a funny, funny piece of hardware because it it uh, allows you to put it also where it's a little bit more hotter. Uh, it it uh, can handle a little bit more dust because you have filters on it, and also you can shake it a little bit because in production areas you sometimes have a lot of more vibrations what the normal server maybe cannot handle. So the easy start for that system uh, we normally use it for is that classic two node, so for edge, branch office, robo, whatever you call it. So uh, the switchless option, as Microsoft calls it, so you use the storage uh, backend with direct cables, so there are no need also like in the discussions what switches or you need special switches. So for the storage uh, sync, it's just our two direct connected cables and a regular virtual machine traffic or to the internet goes out to standard one gigabit ethernet. There are also other options with more 10 gigs, but as you can see from the, from the size of the servers, there are not too many options. We have a slot in it uh, where normally the guys would, the customer would ask, is it possible to put something like a GPU in it? Yes, but first we need to have the support in Azure Stack HCI for that. Right now we use that as a kind of storage extension, so the, the system can handle four NVMEs inside and on the PCI slot you can add another network card, of course, or you can put in four NVMEs additionally. Why it's so sexy? Uh, it's sexy because also the price, so Microsoft worked together with us and other OEMs to be able to create a really sexy pricing start point under 20,000 euros, dollars, whatever, where you, where you live. And because Microsoft did use the, the uh, or brought the option to have a half price eight core CPU data center version. So it's, you just can get it if you have a server like this uh, and you get it from your, your from your vendor. So today from us and you can put in a few storage options of course and uh, also can extend it a little bit and then you have a really sexy two node system under 20,000 euros or dollars which really helps the customers to have a little bit HA uh, on site uh, on premise like you saw from from Matt you have a small you know container system a small system for for edge uh, designs if you need to produce uh, to 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 work on data or whatever as a, as a bridge to, to Azure. So millions of options to use that. And also Cosmos had shown it a few times on, on stage because you just can put it in your laptop bag, right? So also what I like, you can use it with uh, Wi-Fi. So uh, if your area of usage in your robo or edge site, if you don't have you know cabled clients like laptops, of course, you also can run virtual machine traffic through uh, through Wi-Fi, so you can put in two antennas per node and just the uh, storage traffic, as you see here in the picture, is cross-connected, of course, and then everything else is is working with a, with a small router. So 
you have seen a lot of admin center sessions already. So the good thing on admin center is the extensions. So here a quick uh, uh, a few shots from uh, from our integration. So as most of the, the vendors have, we have also our we call it X Clarity. So as we I showed you the name uh, like Think HL. So for all management tools, we have the branding like X Clarity. Uh, the the baseboard management controller inside the service called like X Clarity controller and the uh, administration of multiple servers is called the X Clarity administrator and the integrator no brainer integrates two things, right? It integrates the admin center to work with the Xclarity administrator. So you can see everything, uh, also the hardware related stuff from the admin center. So it's a single pane. Uh, so you don't need to leave the admin center view. I just screenshotted a few things for you so that you have some ideas how it looks like. Of course, if you click on the hardware dashboard, you see, oh, I have four servers. Everything looks green. Green is always a good thing, right? Uh, temperature is OK. Fans are OK. Power supply, OK. And when you go down this list, it would show you that's a normal, regular. So my lab uh, uh, system I have, um, uh, where I work with, with, with customers and partners for POCs and, and workshops. So we have set a mix of SSDs and NVMe, so I can show both of my lovely configurations. And uh, so you see the disks, of course, you can switch on the lights if somebody else is a few hundred kilometers away and, and replacing some disks, so he don't uh, change the wrong disk. So easy feature everybody should have. And then you see the server list. Of course, if you want to see more details of that server, you can drill down and see all the details, which is inside the server. And I just want to highlight the important things. You know, you need to run, uh, what you need to know when you run HCI on it. And one thing is like, okay, through the admin center, you also can control the firmware. And here is a quick view that's an important component, especially on the HCI, uh, is like the HBA, which is, you know, your storage controller and the storage NIC, which would be your uh, RDMA capable NIC. So in my, my case, that's the guys know it who use it. It's a uh, Mellanox system. So uh, you see that uh, the firmware is correct. And of and the important thing is it's consistent across the cluster. And also uh, when it comes to rolling upgrades, so Admin Center also enables you to do this rolling upgrade as you have seen. And of course, you need to have also kind of because the best recipe. So it's a combination of firmware and driver, uh, which is tested and is also um, coming back to that certification run we do, you know, so you land on the uh, Azure Stack HCI catalog, you need to have kind of as this best recipe system in place. So you, you give that to your customer and you feed that in the tools. So every customer has a supported system. So what's coming next to Azure Stack HCI? As I said, everything you learn from Storage Spaces Direct from whoever uh, in the community or trainings is still valid. What's added? So basically it's still kind of certified node. Uh, we have set new brand like it's an MX appliance because you can preload already the Azure Stack HCI operating system. So Microsoft is working with us and others together to preload set already. The D and U integration is from the uh, Windows Admin Center. So you, the deployment integration and the update integration, as you have seen in the session before, you also can integrate uh, things from your hardware vendor, which is basically drivers, firmware, and things like uh, things like that. So you can uh, run it in a certified. Uh, uh, status and of course uh, in the appliance or in the Azure Stack HCI run you need to ongoing validate and test it again for the next upgrade you also need to test and validate the new firmware versions and so on so it's an ongoing process it's not just uh, fire and forgot forget and so you need to do it quite often uh, to make sure that you as a customer or partner have a really supported a machine and of course with the Azure Stack HCI as you learned today you have a software support also included which is also a plus for us sometimes because partner and customers sometimes answer the question do you have a Microsoft support agreement with I can use my search engine of choice and find an answer which is maybe good for a lab but it's maybe not good for production usage so the good thing on the Azure Stack HCI solution is that you have already included a support from from the Azure team 
and so forth, it gets a little bit easier if, if there are problems, you know. And as, as Cosmos mentioned, they know who are you and know the configuration already, what you're working on it. But you still, of course, you have your validated system, MX35 node, because you still can run Windows Server 2019 HCI or data center HCI, however we call it, uh, it's not going away. It also will stay in the Windows Server, as you heard or could see in the chat a few times, and we have seen it on on a few other sessions already from Microsoft that uh, it will be in the next uh, server version. And if it gets, let's say, uh, uh, thrown away, then you will hear it uh, version before and not, you know, oh, in January it's removed. So we are good to go for the next version. Windows Server 2019 will stay a long time and also in the next server version. So here a quick overview what is, let's say, different. So in short, it's the same hardware stack kind of. Uh, maybe we, we test uh, a, a little bit more if it's coming new options to the Azure Stack HCI. On the right side, you see that combination. OK, you have this deployment and update feature in the admin center. So the extensibility of the admin center for the hardware vendors to bring on boards at uh, the certified firmware and drivers and then during the uh, deployment process then you have the windows update patches and so on and you and the azure stack hdi updates and you also get the hardware updates uh, if the, when the catalog is you know enabled so you download that as same as the extensions from the admin center kind of and then everything good to go you know uh, the difference is just okay we created a different queue because you can have uh, the operating system preloaded and it also goes a different route for the for the support of course but on the end and that question have been also quite often in the chat and other discussions what about the virtual machines you still use the windows server data center a rock license to to handle that or you have different license agreements with microsoft doesn't matter but on the end it's a the data center license so for the virtual machines on the left side data center mode uh, you have everything in the box, right, which made it sexy the last years and you have called, let's call it basic, whatever, uh, uh, HCI stack. And then now we have the advanced HCI stack in the HCI operating system, but everything stays kind of the same. You use the Windows Server Data Center license if you have above 10 uh, virtual machines and for really small ones, uh, as I showed you, you can use that. Uh, smaller eight eight core uh, edition. So we also train a lot of partners. You know, we have come along with some short list. Okay, what the Windows Server version can do, and the HCI server, uh, 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 Azure HCI version can do. Of course, it starts with you can do everything with PowerShell Admin Center and so on. Data Center, you have already all the virtualization rights to, to just to highlight the big ones, and uh, what you also can use uh, things we had a little bit in the chat. You could run two additional workloads on uh, Windows Server based HCI. You can also use it for a, C a really freaky fast SQL Server cl uh, cluster. And you can install that scale out files over role. And this too, if you want to do that two options, you need to go for the Windows Server based uh, HCI and, and a few other things. So, but still, the Windows Rock license gives you all the freedom for the virtual machines. And on the other hand, okay, a few new features are coming to the Azure Stack HCI stack, which are not uh, available today in the Windows Server version, like the stretch cluster. If you want to go for stretch cluster, I also work with a lot of enterprise customers. You need to go for the Azure Stack HCI. Comes it in the next Windows Server version? Nobody knows, right? So for Azure, Azure Stack HCI, it's like with Office, if you go with the newest things, you want to go with the newest things and go for like an office Microsoft 365 and uh, use the Azure Stack HCI for your HCI infrastructure. Just for reverence, so we, we just edit, you know, uh, if you have, a, you have been a Lenovo customer or partner, we just edit a couple of new names and, uh, and, and versions of the appliance, but on the end, it's the kind of same hardware, right? To finish it up, where you get new or more information, so we have a one-stop shop, so you go to the Lenovo press.com, uh, you find everything I tried to tell you, so what details are in the service. Uh, uh, we also have a bunch of deployment guides and also this best recipe things you find and to summarize it, so we work, we are like Carsten and uh, Manfred and other MVPs, we are working always with this deployment guides. So we know what all the steps uh, our guys are, have been tested and which tools and commands you need to run. 
uh, to, to get it uh, easily online. And the, the starting point is always is called best recipes. So where you get the list, first you get the list of certified firmware and drivers, but also important, you get all the extensions to run that with your tool of choice. You know, if you run it with uh, System Center Configuration Manager, uh, you deploy the nodes there, or you run it, you know, manually with PowerShell and so on. So you get all the details there, and you, then you adjust it uh, on the system how you like it to run. So that would be the end of, let's say, my presentation. Uh, so a little bit marketing, sorry for, for that, guys, but uh, I guess there also are some details in it, what you can use for any kind of solution, right? So, and uh, maybe you also learned a few new things. Yeah, Udo, thanks so much. Uh, Jan Torre has some questions uh, from uh, the Q&A. Um, 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 part, but before that, I, I want to ask you, um, you mentioned trainings uh, multiple times and uh, we do trainings for uh, Lenovo partners. So there, there are maybe some upcoming events in the future because it's very important that the people are trained to, to deploy uh, Azure Stack uh, HCI and Storage Spaces Direct correctly. There's a little bit uh, knowledge and uh, necessary, especially when it comes uh, uh, around the network things. Do you do you want to share something here, or are you not ready to do that? Of course. So as I said, so we did a lot of trainings for partners, for Lenovo partners, because uh, uh, it's always better to know, as most of the MVPs know, to know a little bit more details what's going on, right? And to be able to really uh, install that uh, in in, a, in the correct way. So we started last year already to do some uh, hands-on training, so three days, as uh, as you know. So not right now we have to had to stop set on, on March and uh, we start now over with some uh, remote online training. So uh, if you're a Lenovo partner, keep an eye on your, your newsletter you get every week or, or every two weeks from the partner ladies. And then you see the links for registering uh, the training. So just have a look and yeah. We see you together, so Karsten and me see you in the next session. So we will have the next one in December, and of course we will start over in January until we need to stay home with the online version, and we will move on also with the new stuff, the HCI, SSH Stack HCI. We did already a small uh, try uh, yesterday and, and the day before, and uh, but in the future we will have like two separate ways to go, you know, like the data center version and the uh, Azure Stack HCI version, whatever is your choice. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yes, uh, so far, thank you, Udo. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to the new trainings. Uh, I will also have a promotion later for my trainings in uh, in the event, but now we don't have time for that. Uh, um, we go directly to Jan Torre. You have some questions from the Q&A about the Lenovo solution, right? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so one of the, I actually got three questions ab about this. When will Lenovo support AMD CPUs in the Think Agile MX solutions? Is there any plans for that? Uh, yeah, the uh, official is uh, that there, they, we, we look into, but there are no, let's say, no date. So it's not like in two, three months we are ready. So we have set servers in place, you know, for regular servers, for standard servers. But for the HCI piece, we also need to have a detailed look uh, how many customers want to buy it. I also personally request that in the product management every week because as I said, Carsten and me are this performance junkies, right? So we want to have the 200 gigabit card in the PCI Express 4 slot. But as of <laughs> now, the answer is, and Carsten has some laying on his desk and we cannot use it since a couple of weeks and months. But the answer today, the official answer is we are looking into, but there's nothing what you can buy today. So hopefully we can see it next year, but that's just my personal hope. Right. Yeah, hopefully we, we will get it big because as we are limited to like eight enemies in a node uh, of course. today. So with, with PCI Express 4, we, we can do a lot more. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah, another question I have. Yeah. 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 So um, is the X365 M5s 
also supported on 2019? This is a question I get a lot. Which one? I forgot. Uh, I didn't. The M5, the X36, the first story space direct cluster uh, hardware. So uh, we have, a, because it was certified for 2016 and not for 2019, if I'm correct. So when I started, uh, it uh, everything was based on the SR650. Uh, I would say it's supported in the kind of Lego way, how I call it, you know. So you have like a do-it-yourself system. So if you have certified components in it, like the Mellanox yep. cards or whatever, then it's good to go. Uh, but it will not show up in the HCI catalog because it will not, you know, uh, be recertified with Azure Stick yeah. HCI. And these nodes come up as the S as SXM certified solutions in correct. the Correct. So the, the, the nodes. Correct. Uh, you know yes. it because you install it quite often. <laughs> and uh, so it's uh, the hardware is certified. If, so if you keep uh, an eye on the components, we also have a list which components have been certified the last years. So yep. like the le like what I call this Lego approach. If you stay, you stick to that list, then it's good to go. But uh, it's more like uh, you don't get the full Azure Stack HDI support. Yeah. So my last question is. Uh, in one of your screenshots, in one of your your slides, you showed a new Think Agile MX Best Rest MP, and there was two new models there I've not seen before. What are those? Yes, that is uh, the, the preloaded Azure Stack HCI OS version. So nothing for you, technically nothing new, right? Uh, okay. It's it's just that uh, uh, think about it like okay. If you sell it with Windows Server Data Center license or with Azure Stack HCI iOS, you want to track it differently. That's why it has a different name, but it's the same piece of hardware. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Yep. Yes. I don't have any other questions. Cool. So thank you, Odo, for uh, for the presentation. And it was uh, surprising, surprisingly technical for a sponsor session, and I like that a lot. So, and uh, I have to say, uh, we work together a lot, uh, but we do all kinds of installations with different hardware and the white papers from Lenovo are really good. Uh, even if you install a solution with another vendor, have a look at the Lenovo white papers because they are quite detailed and um, all is in there that you really need. And there are some vendors that don't that they don't have so detailed installation instructions. But OK, so I want to talk a little bit with uh, Jan Torre. Jan Torre, um, do you prefer Jan or Jan Torre? When speaking English, J JT is fine. JT is but, fine, OK. Yeah, JT, but what? Is, you can pronounce my name, so. <laughs> so JT, you are from Norway. And uh, tell us a little bit about you. You are an MVP now for three years, I, no. I think. Two, huh? One, one year. What? But it turns up only one year. Unbelievable. Yes. Yes. I think I think I know you forever now. <laughs> yeah, three four years I think. Yeah. So, yeah. So what are you doing? Uh, what are you doing mainly with Storage Basis Direct or Azure Stack HCI? So I focus a lot on hybrid uh, and the hybrid uh, path for for our for our clients. So. It is combining the story spaces direct Azure Stack and building that for the future for our clients and taking ad ad advantage of all the new features that we are getting. And I'm looking especially into the new Azure Stack HCI OS and what that, uh, what the new features there can benefit our clients. So um, it's going to be an interesting year for sure for sure and it's going to be very interesting for us as well and for our clients and for any of all, of all our clients basic basically to uh, see what we're what we're getting um so yeah basically anything doing with Azure Stack H hci and system center i do um yeah, you are still still a big system center fan. I, I especially I virtual am. machine manager, right? You am. I know that. Uh, me not so, but uh, we have different opinions about that. Jan Tor, we see we see you maybe later because um, we are one minute up to our next session, and the next two sessions are very important to me. They are about networking. And oh, the next speaker too. is Dan Cuomo, and Dan and I we did a nice webinar about uh, the new things in uh, in Hyper-V networking and uh, it was quite a good one. So I was, uh, I'm thinking about Dan, we, we uh, at first, Dan, are you there? Can you hear me? 
Dan was here, but actually he is not. He dropped now out. Now he's back. He's now back. I am back. Introduce him again. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Dan. Are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. There was a, a, a slight uh, jump in my heart when Manfred said Dan <laughs> is not here. Yes, mine as well. So then I was, uh, I had some I was telling issues. On my yeah. side. Sorry and about you are that. from Microsoft. You can't have issues with Teams. Come on. <laughs> not true. <laughs> you know how to to do the networking stuff, so you also cannot have networking issues. Well, I, I didn't say it was a network issue with Teams. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So then I was just telling the audience that we did a nice webinar, um, I think last year about the new stuff in uh, networking and Hyper-V and it was really a good one. It is available at YouTube, so I encourage everyone who is doing Hyper-V and especially Azure Stack HCI or Storage Spaces Direct to watch into that. I learned a lot uh, about it and I'm thinking maybe we should redo or do a new one about uh, the new networking stuff in Hyper-V and the great work the team is doing there. But this time you are talking about some new features that will come in the future, right? That's right. Um, so I will uh, take the. I'll start uh, sharing as soon as uh, as soon as possible. Here, I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, yeah. I think it's going to really make things a lot easier for everybody. So, so share now. Then the stage is yours. Uh, let's see here. Give me one second, folks. And just let me know when you can all see that. Yeah, now we can see it. Yes. OK, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us today virtually. Of course, we'd, <laughs> you know, we'd much prefer seeing everyone in person. Uh, it's one of our uh, various events throughout the year. But of course, we all know that's, you know, we're, we're a little bit stuck behind our computers right now. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you today about uh, something we've been working pretty hard on called Network ATC. Um, it's an intent based host network management solution on Azure Stack HCI. I'll dive into what exactly that means. Um, so uh, this is a future looking technology. Uh, um, I will mention that a couple times throughout just to remind you, um, but this is part of uh, what will be coming with a with your subscription with Azure Stack HCI. So as you uh, update and you continually stay on the subscription, you'll you will see this as part of Azure Stack HCI in the future. Uh, so my name is Dan Kumo. As already mentioned, I'm a program manager on the core networking team at Microsoft. Um, I've, uh, you know, I own various technologies like RDMA, the virtual switch, all the NIC offloads, and of course, Network ATC, which we're about to talk about today. Um, if your data is in Azure, Windows, or Azure Stack HCI, it goes through almost all of my components or various levels of my components. So um, I, ho I hope that makes you happy and not angry. <laughs> So uh, today is kind of a special day for me. For me, uh, I've, special, I've spent about seven years at Microsoft, and uh, today is actually my three-year anniversary on the core networking team. And before that, uh, I spent four years supporting Azure Stack HCI, albeit on Windows Server 2016, 2019. Um, and so I've spent, you know, several years in the field even before I joined Microsoft supporting these technologies. And so one thing that has always challenged us is network deployment. Now, there are various challenges you run into uh, with networking on Azure Stack HCI. Uh, deployment time is one, right? It takes a long time to actually just get it off the ground. Um, you know, and if you think about it, well, test cluster is one command, new cluster is another command, enable cluster S2D is a third command, and you probably ran a fourth command to just install all the Windows features, but to do the host networking, there's many commands. There's quite a few more commands, and each one has a decision that needs to be made, right? And it it's kind of dependent on your environment. There's a lot of uh, complexity that comes along with that length of deployment time, right? So you don't just have a long deployment time, which you know we've been told it can take up to four hours usually just to get the 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 uh, cluster off the ground because of the host networking capabilities, but it's also complex because of all the little knobs that need to be turned and all the decisions that have to make that have to be made. Um, and of course, because of all those decisions that have to be made, it's very error prone, right? It's very easy to make a mistake. Um, it's very easy. You don't necessarily know 
what defaults changed between operating systems. You don't necessarily know what new capabilities are there, right? VMQ is the, the one that everybody, uh, <laughs> that I probably answer at least once a month, uh, where you know it's changed so much for, since its inception. And if you ha aren't up to date on the latest blogs and techniques, then uh, you know, you've probably configured it incorrectly. Um, and so again, just to summarize, it takes a long time because there's so much to do. Because there's so much to do, it's very complex. There's a lot of, and there's a lot of mistakes uh, made in this process. So Network ATC aims to help with this. And what it actually is, is a host management service on Azure Stack HCI. So you would install this on your nodes through install Windows feature uh, and just specify Network ATC. And it'll be a Windows service that just runs on your on each one of your nodes um, and is cluster aware. As I mentioned before, it is available in uh, Azure Stack HCI to subscribers uh, via a feature update. We're expecting that to land in 2021. Um, so it's not going to be there in V1, but it will uh, uh, come in a upgrade uh, to a future release, right? You'll get it in a, as part of the upgrade and subscription that you have uh, with uh, Azure Stack HCI. So let's actually dive in and talk about what it's going to do. And I just want to rehash this problem just a little bit, right? Here's just the simplest network example that we have on Azure Stack HCI, two physical NICs, right? We have a default operating system with two physical NICs, and our goal, the, the intent, is to use those two physical NICs for Azure Stack HCI. Now, to deploy that, it actually looks a lot like this, right? And you say, wow, there, there was a very simple picture and it became somewhat complex, right? I need to team those two NICs and put a virtual switch on top of them. Because I'm using those two virtual NICs, I have to create host, host virtual NICs in the management parti partition for uh, management so I can connect to it over remote desktop or Active Directory um, connections. I have to create SMB NICs so that my storage, you know, I can talk east-west to my other nodes in the cluster. Um, I have to make sure that those are team mapped. I have to set VLANs. I set jumbo frames. Well, did I set the jumbo frame on the PNIC as well as the host VNIC? That all has to happen before I can create a virtual machine and, uh, and run some guests and the actual workload. So again, we have this simplicity, right? We start out here with the, these two physical NICs, and our intent is to get here. And to actually do that, there's quite a few steps, right? If I just briefly go through this, right? You might rename the adapters. You configure, you know, net adapter advanced property. You have a new VM switch. Um, you, again, you modify the next adapter, then you set up VMQ. And again, we already talked about how that can, that can be uh, slightly difficult. Um, and varying experience. You have uh, VM network adapters that have to be made. You have to move your IP addresses up there, set up VLANs, team map them. By the way, we have two VLAN uh, commandlets. Which one are you using? Right? That's another decision you have to make. You have to team map them. Did you remember to disable DNS so it doesn't rep, uh, uh, register uh, your storage adapters in Active Directory? Um, create the second or more VNICs, you know, right? You need one per uh, physical NIC. And then, of course, we're almost there, but now we have to uh, configure data center bridging for the storage NICs, right? So if you have Rocky-based RDMA adapters, um, you absolutely need to have data center bridging configured on your system. Um, of course, I'll, I'll put a plug in there. It is optional for iWARP. It improves iWARP as well, um, but it is required for Rocky. So, <laughs> um, the But there are so many different decisions here, and every little everything that is uh, represented on the screen as white or gray is a decision and a parameter you need to add uh, in order to get this all configured right. And then by the way, you actually have to go and, and add data center bridging settings onto the fabric as well, right? So to kind of summarize there, we have over 30 commandlets, right? We talked about install Windows feature, test cluster, new cluster, enable cluster S2D. There's four, cluster, uh, four commandlets right there. But then just for the host networking, there's probably 30 or more commandlets. There's over 90 parameters, right? You have to match these settings on the switch as well, right? You, you can't just configure a VLAN on the host. You actually have to put it, push it onto the switch. And then, of course, you have to repeat that exactly uh, on nodes 2, 3, and 4 
so that they all have the same configuration and uh, everything works as expected across that cluster. But you know, what if you bought multiple clusters? Well, then that becomes compounded again, right? We have to do the same thing. We might have the exact same configuration, but there's no real easy way to replicate that configuration across cluster A, B, C, D, dot, 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 right? So you have all of these, all of these uh, knobs that need to be turned. You have to make all the right decisions. Um, and by the way, you know, Priya gave a, a great uh, presentation on Windows Admin Center earlier today, but that's to deploy one cluster. Right, so it still doesn't uh, solve this last portion where we have multiple clusters. You know, if you have a hundred clusters, it's still probably better to script it, right? So again, thirty commandlets, ninety parameters. Um, that doesn't include your logic and your own validations and things that you do on your nodes. Um, so it becomes a fairly long, complicated script. Uh, so network ATC again, it aims to solve this, and what it really does, we'll have a demo here in a second but it allows you to deploy your network host through only a few commands. Now I've resisted the urge to say one command. Um, there are some scenarios that can be deployed with one command, um, but to you know, eliminate as much of the marketing, market wear as possible, I, I did put uh, a few commands, right? On the upper end, um, the most complex scenarios we've seen here are about five or six commands, right, for host networking. You don't have to worry about turning every knob. You don't have to worry about you know, did the default OS uh, or did the OS, you know, Hyper-V load balancing uh, mode change from dynamic to Hyper-V port? Um, how do I modify VMQ and, and manage VMQ and RSS? Um, you know, how do I, what should I do or what's the default bandwidth reservations? And, you know, now I need to go run validate DCB and all these other test tools. You don't really need to worry about that. Of course, we could still, you can still run the validation tools, but you don't have to worry about turning every knob. You don't have to worry about the changes between default OS, um, and you don't have to worry about staying up to date with the latest best practices. Of course, keep reading the blogs, right? They're going to tell you what we're doing under the hood and why. Um, you know, one other aspect that is, uh, you know, I think actually a critical portion of network ATC is the remediation of configuration drift. Once we deploy it, we'll manage it. Right, so it's not a once and done. It's not just a day zero uh, capability or solution. It uh, we will manage it consistently for you from from there on. Right, of course, you can always override our settings. Right, we're not going to force you down into a specific uh, path that well Dan Kumo said it needs to be that way. So it, we're gonna you know you're either gonna use it this way or you can't use ATC. No, that's not true. We can insert overrides into the default configuration so that you remain in control, but fundamentally you have enough to worry about, right? And we really wanna take these over 30 commandlets, 90 some odd parameters across every node in your cluster, across every cluster in your data center. And we wanna simplify that down to only a few commands. Uh, so let's take a look at what it is. Again, this at the top of the screen is what we're trying to deploy here. And this is what the commandlet looks like, right? We have add net intent. We give it one or more. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my my uh, my mouse here, but uh, we have one or more intents. So the intents are management, compute, and storage. Those are the three options. You can add them all on the same adapters. You can slice and dice them however you'd like. We target the cluster, right? In this case, we targeted the cluster. You can of course target standalone nodes if you choose. Um, and then you give us the adapter names that would be found on every uh, node in the cluster. Now keep in mind, this is the one key, right? The adapter names are currently the one key that is needed with uh, network ATC. So you'd have to have an, an adapter named the same on every node in the cluster, but this is it. This is the command. So again, we took those four power, those four uh, slides of PowerShell commands where you have to team the NICs, create the embedded team, uh, add the host vNIC, set up VLANs, configure your uh, jumbo frames, set your uh, DCB settings and make sure you add that cluster, that cluster reservation network, right? Because, uh, uh, excuse me, traffic class, many people forget to do that, right? All of that will be done through this one command. Okay, so let's take a look at it. Uh, we will show you how to do an override. And um, if you're a Bing desktop fan, I'm, I'm sure you know the day that I actually took this demo. Um, so here is cluster node one, and you can see there is no virtual switch on the node currently. There are no NetQuas policies. All we have 
are these two physical network adapters, right? Now, of course, those network adapters can be in some varied state, right? In this case, they have uh, VLANs on them, right? But who knows what else has been done to them, right? Maybe they're on different they're on different VLANs here. Maybe the jumbo frames have been uh, configured incorrectly. A um, whole bunch of different things could could be wrong. Well, we have the network ATC feature installed here. And so uh, one quick comment on the commandlets. The commandlet names are highly subject to change, right, <laughs> before release. Uh, so don't necessarily focus in on what they are. Uh, same thing with the overrides, but uh, set net intent here. It would is already changed to add net intent. We give it the cluster name. We give it a friendly name and we specify the intents for the adapters. The intents here are compute and storage. Now, of course, it returns immediately, so you have to go and get status. Of course, it didn't provision that already. We have to go and check the status of the provisioning. Um, and first thing we're going to do is run it again. We're again going to run it against the cluster. So a cluster name is AZ stack HCI01. And you can see that I have this is a two node cluster. And even though I ran this on node one, it knows that it's in the cluster and that there are two nodes there that need provisioning. So if we give it a few more seconds, um, it will eventually turn from provisioning to success on both nodes, you'll notice. So let's take, take a look at what happened on node one first. Here's get VM switch. Again, the, the titles and names and everything are still subject to change. You can see it provisioned the VM switch. It created uh, storage adapters, the host storage adapters, because we added the storage and compute tags to these PNICs. So we have the storage and compute tags. We needed a vSwitch, which meant we needed to put host VNICs on there. Those host VNICs were automatically created for you. Um, and now we see that we also have VLANs configured, default VLANs. Now you may choose not to use the default VLANs that we have, that is your prerogative. And all it really takes is an override. That's another one or two commands to add the overrides for the storage adapters. Um, here we have default NetQuas policies. So these are your DCB settings, right? We've provisioned the default policy set and default traffic classes. So now we're not done yet because we had a cluster and in order to make sure that this cluster is functioning properly and it's in its best reliable state, we want, whoops, we want to make sure that we configure, let me just fast forward this. Uh, we wanna make sure that we configure this uh, exactly the same on all nodes in the cluster. And so here you see, uh, we check just the VM switch. You can trust me, everything else is there. Obviously the V switch is there. We're not gonna waste time and go through every uh, little detail there. But you know, I also mentioned that we manage configuration drifts. So maybe your DNS settings uh, were updated incorrectly and you accidentally remoted into the wrong machine and removed the V switch on the wrong node. Um, you know, you didn't mean to be doing this, but you did, right? You made a mistake and now, oh my goodness, we have a massive problem because we just deleted the virtual switch and when you delete the virtual switch, it actually deletes those host VNICs that we all work so hard to put up there uh, to create and uh, add the VLANs and all this other stuff, right? So don't worry, ATC is here again to help. Uh, it stored those VLANs that were set up for the Azure, for the, uh, it stored the, the VLANs for the storage adapters. And if we just give it a few minutes here, the next time it does a consistency check, it'll realize that this node is missing the vSwitch that it's supposed to have and it puts it back. You can see here we have success and the vSwitch is automatically returned. So that's network ATC at its core, right? We have the ability to deploy in a single command, we deployed the configuration across the entire cluster, not one node in the cluster, every node in the cluster, okay? Now, of course, as we mentioned, not everything hits the default, right? Maybe you have well-established storage VLANs already in your data center or uh, in your environment, you want to manage the data center bridging traffic class reservations. So let's take a look at how we would do that and override one of the default policies. So here you can see RDMA has a 50% bandwidth reservation, right? Or SMB direct. All we do is we, we run the command that new net intent clause policy overrides. Now that's a mouthful. Uh, the important thing is that everything starts with new net intent and has the word overrides in it. So when you get the access to this, you can just run get command and get all of the commands back that have the override uh, word in it. You know, it starts with new net intent overrides in it, and it automatically provisions the possible entries into this 
uh, configuration. Now you can see we're modifying the SMB bandwidth uh, percentage uh, to 60, right? Currently it's 50, we're, we wanna change it to 60. And this is how easy it is. So now again, the commandlet has changed since uh, I took this video just a couple weeks ago, uh, but set net intent override is run. We target again the cluster. We target the friendly name in that cluster. And we now just enter in the quas policy override. Of course, it will take a few minutes, right? We, you know, things aren't instant, just like if you had done it manually. So we provision the update. And what you can see is that there's a progress bar. You can see down here, progress three of four, right? So we return both nodes from the cluster and both of them say, hey, I've got an update. This is not the, the number of changes that need to be made, but it is the uh, actual uh, number of entries you've configured in, in your, to your intent. Right, so we have one new modification to the intent that needs to be provisioned. And you can see, of course, I've fast forwarded this a little bit for uh, to keep it action packed here. Um, now both nodes are actually show success. And if we just want run get net clause traffic class again, there it is. Let's check out cluster node two, because again, we have to make sure that it's the same on both nodes. And of course it is. So there you have it. We can deploy the entire cluster in one command, if you're if you uh, don't use the built-in defaults that we will document heavily, uh, I promise <laughs> uh, you can just override that very easily easily through another one or two or three commands. So if we go back to our networking challenges in Azure Stack HCI, uh, we had deployment time, which was you know could take upwards of four hours based on a, a, a quick poll that we had taken uh, through the MVP channels. Um, it could take up to four hours to actually deploy. Well, now it only takes, you know, 15 or 20 minutes at max. And that's assuming that there are things that we don't know about your environment, right? We don't necessarily know the IP addresses you want to use on those storage networks. Um, maybe you want to uh, modify something that we're not managing. All of that will be done within, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes tops, right? So we've taken it from four hours all the way down to just a few commands. Uh, we've removed all that complexity that you know in part caused the deployment time but it also made it error prone right so not just the deployment time is knocked down from four hours to i mean at the best case you know 5 10 15 minutes worst case 30 minutes right um we've not just reduced the deployment time but we've simplified everything down to two or three commands and because we've simplified it you can be assured that it's been deployed with the latest best practices that Microsoft validates in its uh, data centers. So here we go, here's the summary. We have an intent-based host network deployment, right? You don't sit there and say, well, I wanna make a host VNIC. You say, here's my goal, right? Here's the intent for this system, compute, management, storage, what have you, right? Intent-based system. We deploy the whole cluster with around one or two commands. And of course you can easily replicate this from one cluster to the next. Right, that was one of the key portions that we called out uh, in keeping consistent configuration across multiple nodes or even multiple data centers. Well, we work at the cluster level, uh, a standalone level, a cluster level, and we can replicate that configuration to another cluster if you so choose. Um, again, this is outcome driven, so you don't have to worry about defaults in the OS changing like the load balancing mode of the team or uh, updates to how we implement VMQ or RSS. And you can be assured that we always deploy with the latest Microsoft supported and validated best practices. Um, you can of course stay in control with the overrides, right? So we don't force you down uh, a path that says this is the only way that you can deploy it. We allow you to override that default behavior. Um, and of course, if a mistake is made, right? Because we are, we're all human, um, if a mistake is made, ATC will come back in and remediate that drift. Uh, as a quick reminder, this is coming soon, right? It's not going to be in uh, the uh, or initial version that you receive with Azure Stack HCI, but it comes as a free update, uh, you know, a free feature update with your HCI subscription. So, so long as you still have that subscription active um, and you just continually upgrade, similar to how Windows 10 is continuously upgraded, uh, or updated, you know, that, that license is perpetual and you'll get access to this feature. 
All right, so now I'm going to change gears. I'm going to change gears and talk about one last. Uh, I have one more slide, so I'm going to change gears and um, talk about network switches in Azure Stack HCI. So when you uh, in the next uh, in the near future, actually, we'll be updating this networking portion of the documentation to talk about switches. What we have found is that um, in many cases, customers, you know, they they you you have a variety of switches in your data center. You don't know if those are the you know are capable of the technologies or protocols that Microsoft uses uh, or requires. Right? We talked about data center bridging. We talked about VLANs. We talked about a variety of different things that actually have to be matched on the fabric. And so uh, we have some switch requirements being documented for Azure Stack HCI. Um, these requirements. Uh, will outline the protocols that Microsoft validates. Uh, I want to be crystal clear here. Other protocols may work. OK, this is not to say that this is the only way that you have to deploy it. Other protocols may work, um, but these are the ones the ones we document are the ones that are uh, the ones that we see as required uh, for success based on our testing. Right again, it may work, but it is uh, you know something that we have not tested. Um, we do we will provide recommendations for switches. So we will have a list of switches from various vendors uh, that have confirmed. Now that list will grow over time. Um, some switches may be added or removed as we find out more information from them. But the goal here is that you can make informed uh, purchases when you uh, go to purchase your switches and um, the vendors have the vendors, the switch vendors, um, have confirmed that their switches meet the uh, IEEE protocol guidance or requirements for whatever specification that we have uh, said is required for Azure Stack HCI. And on that same page, we will also add, or uh, you know, another page in the list uh, under this networking section, we will also provide guidance for selecting network adapters. Um, so that's it. Uh, that's it for me. I've got Network ATC. Um, an intent based host network management service and uh, look forward to those HCI uh, switch requirements and uh, adapter documentation. All right. Yeah. Ben, great presentation and I know Helmut has a lot of question queued and uh, there are even some from me, so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> but, but before that, I, I was asked about, uh, there was a question in the Q&A about training for Azure Stack HCI, and I will take the chance to um, make some noise about something I'm doing. Uh, I deliver Storage Spaces Direct and Azure Stack HCI trainings in Germany. Um, Lenovo, uh, uh, Lenovo's Udo mentioned that before. So I came up uh, with a promotion for the next uh, Storage Spaces uh, and Azure Stack HCI course. It will happen in December. It's a hybrid course, so you can attend in person um, and over Teams. So uh, if people are interested in training for that, I offer a course and I will post a link in the chat and you can mail me about it. And if there is enough interest in an English speaking course, I um, will maybe translate it and do a five day English speaking course. If there is interest and if you are interested, please mail me. Uh, I will send my mail address too. So um, now switching over to Helmut, you have a lot of what? But I think you have a special Carson for it. Oh, I have a special. I have to. I have to press uh, press a space bar. So I suck at marketing and selling. You just you just <laughs> saw it. So <laughs> who is attending this uh, this uh, event? Uh, um, uh, mention the Azure Stack HCI Day special, and you will get uh, 500 euro. Uh, of the normal price. But now uh, to Helmut. Helmut, you have a lot of questions queued, right? Yeah. Hello, Dan. There are a lot of questions in the Q&A all about networking, so more questions Great. than after every other <laughs> session. <laughs> <laughs> I try to bring it together uh, in, in several blocks. So uh, one block of these questions is if ATC is coming into Windows Admin Center or uh, also other tools that's coming out of so like VMM, so that's coming out of the MVP community. Sure, that's a great question. Yeah, so the you know the initial uh, goal is going to be PowerShell, right? But 
um, you know, again, simple PowerShell example, but of course we do want to integrate with Windows Admin Center and Virtual Machine Manager. We have uh, talked to those teams. Um, it's not going to be, uh, it's not there yet today, um, meaning we don't have it uh, in, right now, uh, but it will be coming at, at a later date. So. Then I come to Carsten's questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, you're breaking up. Can't hear you. <laughs> 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 then come on, Can why you ask you him? Me out? <laughs> Ed Helmut, it seems that the cluster has to be there normally first network, then cluster. Can you ask him to current, confirm that it's possible without the cluster? <laughs> it is possible without the cluster, yes. So you can do a, a standalone deployment um, where you don't have a cluster, right? So you, where you would have to run that adnet intent on each node in, in that would eventually be in the cluster. Um, but you could also uh, create the cluster, right? And just have management access with the other adapters that are sitting in the cluster um, yeah. and are configured and then modify it from there. So again, you can modify the uh, management intent as well. There's There are three intents, management, compute, and storage. And again, you can slice and dice it however you want there, um, you know, up to you. But again, you can do it either standalone, as I mentioned, or in a cluster-based solution. And Jan Doris questions, can you do still manually config? Of course, yes, you can always do it the hard way if you'd like. <laughs> we would <laughs> greatly love to see you use this. Uh, but just to be I, honest, it's not the hard way. It's the normal, easy way as we do it, it for years now. I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there might be folks on the call that would disagree with that, but yeah, it, it is it is the existing way is probably yeah. the right way to say it. The existing way, has many different configuration options required, whereas you know you can do it this way with you know far less, of course. Um, we I, I would make a cautionary statement out there, which is to say that everyone always say, oh, I've got it. I've already written my script. I don't need this, right? Um, it's already done. It's already deployed. I don't have to worry about it. We know that's not true, right? Eventually you land in my inbox and I have to help you troubleshoot it, right? So let's just be honest here. Um, and, I try and, to avoid to land in your inbox. You do. You're very rarely in my inbox helmet, actually. I'll give it. I'll give you that. Um, but uh, everybody ends up there eventually, right? There's always eventually a problem. And the interesting part is ATC provides you the advantage of configuration drift. So it's not just, I want to make sure you understand, it's not just about day zero when you deploy. It also provides day 100, you know, configuration management. And, you know, that confidence that we're going to manage it programmatically for you. Look, I have world class developers that I work with and they have bugs. Surprise, right? You also will have bugs in your configuration script. OK, yeah, so. Helmut, just, just to <laughs> jump in, I have to support Dan a bit because uh, I see a lot of problems with networking uh, out and about when we when we help people with their clusters and I'm sure you do too. Uh, networking is the hardest part in, uh, in Azure Stack HCI or storage spaces direct. If you don't know what you're doing, if you know what you're doing and Helmut and I, we know um, it's not too hard, but I think it's a great tool for the people. No, I, but I, I like, I I like before it. Helmut is, uh, is asking my other question. I hope it is also supported in Azure Stack HCI to do it uh, the old way, uh, because I fear maybe Microsoft has not the view on, on every network possibility that customers are doing. Um, and there are so many different ways you have to integrate this stuff in uh, in a network. Sure. So I hope it's still possible and supported to do it manually in the future. It, it is still possible to do it and support it however you would like in that regard. We don't have a, uh, this is not a support requirement to use Network ATC. Uh, much to my chagrin, I would love to make it one. <laughs> no. Uh, but we, for, for the same reason, uh, 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 Karsten, the, for the same reason that uh, that you just outlined, we don't make it required because there are many scenarios that, you know, I'm sure we will learn over time um, and we'll want to close those gaps with ATC, right? But we may not know them right now. And so we don't want to stop you from uh, having su success with Azure Stack HCI just because this service wasn't able to do something. But that said, we're not aware of any of those today. Um, so by all means, let us know uh, if you do come across one that it can't do. Uh, that's a great reason to be in my inbox. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, 
but yeah, at this time, I mean, there's no support requirement to use ATC. Um, again, we think it provides many benefits, uh, so we hope you will. Just to be honest, I like it and also the remediation and so will be a great help for everybody. So yeah. it's just, we know that there always are always some configuration which sure. are really strange. Uh, some simple questions. Will be a preview phase for ATC? A preview phase. Uh, yeah. This will be, so I don't actually know how to answer that. Is Cosmos here? No, okay. No, not so, at the moment. Yeah, so I think, I. I I'm not sure how the uh, updates to Azure Stack HCI are previewed, but this would be part of one of the preview updates if there is one. Yeah. Uh, Another simple question will be, did there be a backport to Windows Server 2019 or former versions? Another great question. Unfortunately, no. Um, this will be an Azure Stack HCI exclusive service. Um, there are some technical reasons for that, uh, but this would be limited to Azure Stack HCI. Okay, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, there are some more questions in Q&A, but I think we're a bit over time so that Carsten gets on with his schedule then. Perhaps you can have a look into the Q&A. There are questions like Rocky and uh, switch performance and things like that. Okay. So perhaps you can answer some, them, uh, some of them in the Q&A. Okay. Great. Yeah, Guest RDMA over, over VXLAN, for instance. <laughs> uh, I can end that one right, right now. There's no support for that. I'd love to do another that. talk with you, uh, sure. a webinar maybe about all the network stuff. There are so many questions about networking. Uh, maybe we can do that. Certainly. Okay. Yeah. So, Helmut, uh, we still have some minutes uh, uh, until the next great uh, network session. It will be about software defined networking, and I'm really looking forward to, to that because it's it's an area where I need a lot of, lot of knowledge uh, that I'm missing so far. Um, but first, Helmut, uh, let's talk a bit about uh, you. What are you doing in, uh, in Austria? You have a nice company that is also doing Azure Stack HCI solutions, right? Yeah, we, we, I am managing director of a small company in Austria where we do uh, Azure Stack HCI solutions. Uh, also do Azure Stack HCI only certifications for different OEMs and development of WAC plugins so that you get validated solutions or even integrated solutions and playing around with these things like uh, uh, yeah, doing clusters in a wooden box for Cosmos. So unfortunately, yeah. I couldn't present it personally to him in, in March, but it's an interesting how to downsize a cluster to the minimum extent so we took uh, uh, batteries out of our avionics products that it's running around three hours and put in some really small embedded amd chipsets on mini atx ports and in a briefcase style handbag hand luggage sized environment so they the, the full running cluster with an access a point and, and a 10 gig switch in there. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, Helmut, and that, that's because you do a lot of stuff also around certification. So with you work with other OEMs and uh, yeah. if they need help with the Azure Stack HCI certification, uh, you help them, right? Yeah, so we do certifications for a um, lot of other companies. We did it, do it till since S2T. So we did S2T certifications also. And since there's a lot of, of German OEMs there, we help some of them with the certifications. We also can do white label certifications if someone just wants to produce his own product based with on a certified a validated note. In that case, not yeah. integrated because it's a bit of a problem. Yeah, so and there is an event coming up in uh, early January where uh, also Azure Stack HCI will, will take a part in. Uh, tell yeah, us in early, 30 seconds about this event. Um, yes. Yeah, Experts Live Austria is doing an event on Friday, the 8th of January uh, in three tracks. And one of the tracks is specially dedicated to Azure Stack HCI and hybrid solutions. So, uh, we are really uh, proud to have uh, Cosmos there as keynote speaker starting the event like you did today. 
<laughs> and <laughs> and yeah, uh, also uh, would have some of the uh, local um, companies and ID integrators there speaking about uh, their environment and what they are doing at the moment and also some other MVPs like Mr. Rachfall speaking about the good, the bad and the fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and and some of the community uh, supporters we have today uh, also speakers there. So it's it's in that case, it's an, an day event at European time and it we are running three tracks. And uh, yeah. I hope we, we like. can we can do it in person. I would I would really look forward to that. But now it's time for our next uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, thanks, Dan, so far for the network part mm -hmm. and uh, Helmut. Uh, and now um, we have uh, something I'm really interested in. It's software-defined networking, and we have an. I hope I I, I pronounce it right. Anriban, uh, Paul. Anriban, are you there? Yeah. Hi, Carsten. It's Anirban, actually. <laughs> Okay. I know it's difficult to pronounce it, but yeah, it's Anirban. Anirban, I, I will remember that, I hope. <laughs> so Anirban, you are ready to present. The stage is yours, and I'm very curious about um, your session. Great, happy to be here and very excited to talk to you folks. Um, let me start my production. Just give me a sec. So now you are online with your presentation. Go uh, on, please. So, so can you see the presentation in full screen? Yes, yes. we can. Great, awesome. OK, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anirban Paul, and I'm a program manager with the HCI networking and SDN team. Today, I'm very excited to be here. And for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about some of the network security challenges that you might commonly face with your HCI infrastructure and workloads and how Azure Stack HCI can help secure you against some of these attacks. So let's get down to the agenda for today. I will st start by briefly talking about software-defined networking in Azure Stack HCI and how it is different or similar to Windows Server. And then we will dive into the main topic for today. Basically, what is the need for network security in HCI and what are some of the common HCI scenarios where this is applicable? Then we'll talk more about the solution, how, how you as customers can provide network security for your HCI workloads. And we'll talk more about details about that. And then uh, we I'll show you a few demos, how to deploy uh, network security for Azure Stack HCI and how to see this all in n 4 And finally, after you have applied these policies, what are some of the other networking services that you can use um, with SDN? on Azure Stack HCI. So um, let's get started. Uh, this, you must have seen this slide many times before, uh, but I wanted to start by showing a composition of Azure Stack HCI and how SDN fits into the big picture. So what comprises HCI? First, you have validated hardware from a set of industry partners. These are servers that you get from your favorite OEMs like Dell, Lenovo, HP. On that hardware, we install the Azure Stack HCI OS. This OS is purpose o built OS for virtualization. It could be compute with Hyper-V, storage with Storage Spaces Direct, and network with SDN. For HCI v1, this is the same SDN stack which you have with Windows Server 2019. But going forward, we, we expect to have more differentiation in the HCI product and Windows Server will slowly catch up. All of this is best managed with Windows Admin Center. Using Windows Admin Center, you can connect to Azure Arc and other Azure hybrid services. Moving on, um, before we get into the main agenda for today, I just wanted to give, um, have a quick discussion on the high level and common SDN capabilities that we support today. So at the very fundamental level, you can bring your own virtual networks and subnets into your HCI infrastructure. You can bring in your own private IP address space, and that can coexist with other customers bringing in the same address spaces as well. We will ensure that you get isolation and multi-tenancy. 
once you have deployed your workloads, you can secure them from external entities as well as other entities in your data center. This is the main topic for today. I'll get into that in a little bit. And then you might want to bring in additional functionality for compliance or value added security like uh, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention services. We support user defined routing such that you can bring in these third party appliances, put them in your HCI clusters, and change network routes so that traffic to your workloads goes through the appliance first. On the front end side, we support connectivity over the internet. Uh, this can be done in a variety of ways. We provide load balancing services so that you can distribute traffic to a set of backend servers. And this load balancing services are supported for your internet facing workloads and even your internal workloads. You can use NAT capabilities, network address translation. For example, uh, to provide outbound internet access to your workloads or inbound traffic directly to a workload. And finally, uh, you we have uh, you can provide connectivity to your um, external networks through SDN gateways. Um, we again we support a variety of flavors here. If you want connectivity to your on-premise networks over the internet, you can use an encrypted side-to-side -side connection. If you want to provide connectivity to your MPLS high speed networks, we can, you can use GRE tunnels to provide the last leg of connectivity from your virtual network to your um, GRE uh, endpoints. Or, or uh, another scenario which is again very common is that you pr probably just want to connect your workloads in your SDN virtual network to your local physical uh, resources in your data center. And we support that mode as well where the gateway simply acts as a router between your virtual network and your physical networks. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, uh, we support many more capabilities, but I just wanted to focus on some of the major capabilities that we support. Now let's talk about the main agenda for today. Network security. State of net security today can be summed up in one word. More. More security breaches, more sophisticated threats, more cyber risk, more business critical technologies, more regulatory requirements, more growth, more complexity. And none of it seems to be waning anytime soon. Every time the net number of network security breaches increases, cyber criminals are targeting high value data with sophisticated attacks designed to bypass perimeter based controls. Once inside your corporate network, attackers can be free to move from one system to another in search of sensitive or personally identifiable information. These breaches can go not unnoticed for weeks or even months, as we have seen. If you look at some of the largest data breaches in history, identity theft is very common. Basically, once compromised data being used for malicious purposes. As per Veronis, 74% of the global data breaches last year were caused by identity theft. If you look at the pic on the right, about 1 billion Yahoo accounts were stolen in 2015. First American reported a massive data breach in 2019. Some of the most critical information stolen during these breaches were bank account numbers, tax records, SSNs, driver license images. To summarize, need for network security is more paramount than ever. Now let's look at some of the traditional approaches that we use for network security. In traditional networks, usually security is set at the edge or periphery where north-south communication takes place. This secures the intranet from the outside world. Security is extended internally by creating sub branches and branches and keeping them behind firewalls. This model offers little protection against the most common and costly attacks targeting organizations today, including attack vectors originating within the perimeter. These attacks infiltrate the perimeter, learn internal infrastructure, and laterally spread through the data center. If you look at the picture here, Endpoints are able to communicate with each other freely within VLANs or subnets behind uh, the firewall. Infections in one of these servers are not contained and can easily spread to other servers. Significant network resource utilization bottlenecks are created by sending east to west communication from every VM to every other VM through a physical firewall. Say, say that the capacity of a physical firewall is exhausted, then there are only two ways to scale security in such an environment. Either replace with a larger firewall or add additional physical firewalls, with the latter requiring major traffic reengineering. 
If you want to create a least privileged model with physical firewalls, VLAN resources will quickly be exhausted by segmenting workloads into application centric pools of security. Um, and on top of that, the hairpinning of traffic through physical firewall can create additional latency for certain applications. All application network traffic must traverse a physical firewall to be segmented, even when residing on the same physical server. These fundamental constraints impact both security posture and application scalability within modern data centers. Now let's look at a few common scenarios, uh, starting with a standard three tier web app. So you have a presentation layer exposed to the Internet. You have a middle logic tier and then you have a database. Information passed to the presentation layer goes through transformations in the logic layer before it is stored in the database. Now with identity theft, attacker may be able to get access to the presentation layer. And then he may be able to infiltrate other servers in the same tier. Servers in other tiers or even unrelated apps um, based on the level of security enforced for east west traffic. Let's look at another common scenario virtual desktop infrastructure. Uh, the growing the rising use of IT and growing telecommunicating trends such as bring your own device and corporate owned personal enabled devices are propelling the use of VDI in the industry. Additionally, the growing mobile workforce is boosting the demand for VDI. And again, this is all further bolstered by the you know, shift to remote work due to the COVID pandemic. One of the key challenges with VDI is exposure of data center infrastructure and other critical applications and data to end user security violations. Isolation of your remote desktop pools from the rest of the data center resources. Securing the VDI infrastructure itself from external entities is critical. If you look at the diagram here, we have a VDI desktop pool which hosts the desktop or applications that you want to publish through remote desktop. Uh, they could be interacting with Active Directory to authenticate users and storage to store and retrieve user profiles. They would also be interacting with VDI infrastructure like gateways, brokers and load balances. So again, the scenario is similar. The attacker lands on the user's personal device and is able to reach a particular machine in your VDI desktop pool. And then it is it is able to either infiltrate other uh, machines in your desktop pool. Or other applications which are hosted in your infrastructure in your data center, which are not related to VDI or even access your VDI control plane itself. So let's talk about how we can solve this in HCI. The, the ideal solution to complete data center protection is to protect every traffic flow inside the data center with a firewall, allowing only the flows required for applications to function. This is the zero trust model. Achieving this level of protection and granularity with a traditional firewall is operationally unfeasible and cost prohibitive. This would require traffic to be helped into a central firewall as I already talked about. Micro segmentation or it's some you might know it as east west firewalling is the concept of creating granular network policies between applications and services. Implementation of micro segmentation is a key part of your defense in depth strategy against modern data center threats and providing the next layer of defense beyond traditional firewalls. This essentially reduces the security perimeter to a fence around each service or VM. The fence can permit only necessary communication between application tiers or logical boundaries, thus making it difficult for cyber threats to spread laterally from one system to another. This means that this can eliminate server to server threats in your data center, securely isolate networks from one another and reduce the total surface area of a network security incident. At a very fundamental level, um, these are five tuple ACLs uh, which you can apply for both your inbound traffic and your outbound traffic. Um, this, although you will be having edge firewalls that can be used to protect your internet traffic as well as uh, internal traffic in your data center. And you can apply these policies to your uh, subnets and even individual virtual machines. One key thing I want to note um, or bring to your attention is that these policies can apply to your traditional VLAN networks as well. So if, you, if you're not using overlay style networks with VXLAN or NVGRE and you have you have you're simply using a traditional networks and your workloads are tagged with VLANs, 
you can apply these micro segmentation policies there as well so that all your hci infrastructure can be protected against these attacks and then finally uh, we support standardized audit logging um, what it means that you can enable logging to ensure that all the traffic flows to your uh, machines and your workloads are automatically logged and the logging is done in a very standardized format so you can use your existing tools uh, to ingest that data and you can also use azure tools like azure network watcher as well so uh, let's look at how micro segmentation can help vdi uh, this is the same diagram which i was showing you a few slides black and uh, Outside of an edge uh, firewall, now you are also having uh, mini firewall zones with your micro segmentation policies. And what they can do is that you can configure your security rules such that they can be much more granular and can support more granular policies. Like here, we are allowing communication between the VDI desktop pool and Active Directory and the VDI desktop pool and your remote sh and your shares. We are we are prohibiting communication between your VDI desktop pools and other applications. We are also stopping communication between your other applications and your VDI control plane. And since the firewall policies are very granular here, you can also define policies which will prevent communication between your individual machines in your desktop pool. So, um, so. At a high level, we talked about how micro segmentation can help secure your um, infrastructure and your HCI workloads. Uh, let's take a quick look at how all of this is possible in Azure Stack HCI. So, so, the, so the way this is implemented in HCI is that this is a distributed multi-tenant firewall and the policies are enforced at the vSwitch port of each virtual machine. What this means is that uh, when your virtual machine moves from one host to another, the policies move with your virtual machine. So you do not have to do anything and you're automatically protected as long as your policies are still in place. Uh, I already talked about this. Your your policies are applied to your east west as well as north south traffic. So you can so you can um, protect your traffic which is coming from outside as well as uh, um, which is coming from inside the data center. Policies, uh, how are these policies applied? Uh, the policies are pushed to the management plane. At the very fundamental level, we have a standardized REST interface uh, through which you can define the policies. We have a PowerShell interface on top of REST. And if you want to use uh, GUI based tools, then you, we also provide support through Windows Admin Center. And I'm going to demo the Windows Admin Center experience in, in a couple of slides. Once the policy is defined through the management plane, the policy um, the policies go through a centralized control plane co called network controller. Network controller um, gets the policies from the management plane and pushes them down to all your uh, workload VMs. This is a server role uh, which ships as part of the HCI operating system. And um, one one good thing about having a centralized control plane is that if there is any configuration drift uh, and Dan was talking about the host config drift in the last session, but if there is any configuration drift with your network policies, your micro segmentation policies, network controller will ensure that it remediates that drift. So um, enough of talk. Uh, let's um, talk a little bit about how you can uh, deploy this. So. As I told you, um, micro segmentation policies deployment and management of micro segmentation policies would require you to deploy a network controller. So you will need to um, have three virtual machines for network controller and we will do the deployment, but you would need three virtual machines uh, which need to be provisioned. And then you already would be having some management network through which your hosts are connected. We want to we also want to ensure that network controller is connected to the management network so that it can push the policy down. And that's about it. There is no other network requirements. You do not need to get in touch with your network admins to you know, configure any network policies on your physical infrastructure. Just configure, uh, just have three VMs for your NC and ensure that the NC VMs are connected to the management network. So now let's look at the uh, demos. Um, first, what I'll do is I'll take you through uh, the deployment of network controller through Windows Admin Center. You can do it through PowerShell scripts as well. Uh, we have SCN Express scripts which do this. 
but uh, but I want to focus on this because this is a brand new experience and this is very seamless and simple. And once you have deployed network controller, uh, you can create your um, you can create your uh, VLAN based networks, attach your workloads to those networks and apply your security policies on them. So let's get started. So this is the Windows Admin Center deployment wizard. Uh, Priya talked about this and she went through a few steps of this wizard. Um, here uh, to save time, what I have done is I have configured the basic networking on hosts. I've configured the host clusters and I've configured storage spaces direct as well. So we are now on the step where you configure and deploy SDN. So let's get started. Um, with the SGN deployment, uh, this is a single. This is a single page setup, and frankly, you just need to provide two informations to us before we deploy network controller. We automatically detect the domain through which to which the network controller machines have to be joined, and we also uh, provide the network controller cluster name based on the host cluster name. And you are of course free to change it if you want. And then, the first thing which we really require from you is the VHD paths for your Azure Stack HCI OS. And the reason for this is that we deploy network controller um, on this OS, so we need to know the uh, VHD. And then um, you can choose to deploy network controller on a single virtual machine, or you can choose to deploy it on a multiple virtual machines. For testing purposes, uh, you can use a single VM, but for production deployments, we highly recommend that you at least have three VMs so, so that you get high availability. And then on the networking side, um, you, you need, as I told you, you need to provide network controller connectivity to your uh, management network, right? So, so basically, you, you you can if you have a particular VLAN, you can use that particular VLAN and provide that information. For getting addresses to network controller machines, you can use DHCP or you can use a static address scheme as well. And then um, we have assigned some names for the network controller VMs. We auto populate this, but you're free to change them if you want. And then the second thing after the OS VHD, which we really need you to provide is the credentials so that we can join the network controller machine to the domain. And after that, we have some advanced settings like the VM path and the MAC address pools. These are all auto populated. If you want, you can change, but usually we do not expect you to change these. And and that's about it, right? If you look, this is a single page deployment. There are there are there are two things which we need you to provide: the operating system VHD and the network control, uh, the credentials. And after that, this is done. Um, as you can see, the deployment is in progress. And after about 20 minutes, network controller will be deployed in your um, HCI infrastructure, and you can now go ahead and deploy your network services. OK, uh, so now you have network controller deployed. Let's let's take a look at the next step where we actually configure our logical networks and we apply our security actors on this network. So this is the same cluster where I deployed network controller. Um, as you can see, after network controller is deployed, you see some additional additional tabs on the left pane like access control lists, uh, gateway connections, virtual networks, so on and so forth. So let's get started. What we'll do is first we will get into the logical networks tab where we go ahead and create a logical network for your tenant VLANs. So uh, I, I, I provide a logical network name and then I, in this case, this is tenant VLANs and then I'm pro I have to provide the subnets for my logical networks. So again, it could be on a particular VLAN. I'm choosing 1001 here. I provide an address prefix for my logical network and the default gateway and the DNS information. Note that these are my traditional VLAN networks um, which I'm which I'm using here and this is what I'll attach my VMs to. Once I provide the logical subnet, I provide the IP pools and basically this is the IP pool from which your tenant virtual machines will get their IP addresses from. Once the IP pools are provided, uh, you are done. Um, we'll just go through a few more confirmations before we are ready to move on. And uh, when I go back to my logical networks page, and if I refresh the page, you will see that you will see you will see that the new tenant VLAN network is already created. 
So now uh, we can go ahead and create our virtual machines. But before that, I want to create my security policies and I'll tell you why. But but let's go ahead with the uh, security policies first. Uh, so I go to the access control list tab. I create a container for my uh, security policies, um, which is my web server. So what I'm doing here is that I'm trying to create a policy which is going to allow inbound traffic to my um, to my web servers. So I create the access control list. You can provide any name you want. Um, you give a provide uh, you give a priority to your access control list rule, and you. And you then define whether it's an inbound or outbound rule. In this case, we are protecting our web server traffic. We provide all the required prefixes, source, destination, prefixes, and port ranges. The destination port is, of course, 80. By default, all your inbound traffic is blocked. So by, pro by configuring this rule, you are able to allow access to port 80 for, your, uh, for all your VMs connected to your um, logical network. So your access control list is created. Now let's go ahead and um, create a virtual machine and attach that to your um, logical network. So, so I'll, I'll go to the virtual machines tab and I'm going to add a new VM here. And uh, again, I'll not go through all the settings, but basically, um, you know, uh, I'll directly jump to the networking portion of the VM creation. So as part of the networking settings, you need to say that this VM is connected to which virtual switch. And once you provide the virtual switch, then you get different options as to where you want to um, um, attach this VM to. You can configure, you can attach it in a default access mode without VLANs. You can configure it to a traditional VLAN network. You can configure, uh, you can attach it to a virtual network which is based on SDN, which will use VXLAN or NVGRE. Or in our particular case, we are actually attaching the virtual machine to a logical SDN based network, which is basically your um, VLAN based network, which you just created. Right. So once we do that, then we are ready to go to a next step where we configure security ACLs. Um, so you provided the logical network. You will provide the subnet. This is the subnet which you configured for your tenant VLANs and you give an IP address to your uh, virtual machine. And this is again taken from that subnet pool. And here, as you can see, as the at the time of creation of the VM, you're automatically seeing the access control list um, which you already configured. And what this means is that from the get go, from the time your VM is booted, it is automatically secured so that you do not need to um, you know, you do not need to go and configure the policies later. That does not mean that you cannot change these policies or configure new policies. You are always free to do that. But I wanted to emphasize that you can also do it at VM creation time as well. So, um, so I provide my web server policy and now I'm ready to create my virtual machine. And as I told you, once the virtual machine is created and started, it is automatically protected. And again, these are your traditional workloads hosted on VLAN networks. So, um, oops, sorry. Um, so that's uh, that's what I wanted to show you, uh, how you deploy a network controller so that you can configure these micro segmentation policies and then how you can actually configure the micro segmentation policies themselves. Let's move on to the next slide. So what next, right? Um, once you have configured this micro segmentation policies, what else can you do on your traditional um, workloads? You can apply your network cost policies to your workloads on traditional VLAN networks as well. So think of this, right? You will have different types of workloads on your HCI cluster, which will be competing against each other for resources. You might want to provide more network bandwidth to a streaming application while ensuring that other workloads are not starved. With network costs, you can limit inbound and outbound bandwidth on the network interface to prevent high traffic VMs from starving other VMs on the host. You can also reserve specific amount of outbound bandwidth for a VM to ensure minimum traffic guarantees regardless of other traffic on the host. Uh, once you're done, you can, if you, if you, if you, if you are intentions are there, you can create virtual networks and attach workloads to these virtual networks. And once these virtual networks are created, you can apply micro segmentation policies and cost um, policies to your virtual networks as well. 
Then, as I was mentioning earlier, you can bring your own virtual appliances and attach it to your virtual networks for value added services like intrusion detection, advanced firewalls, or, or whatever services you might need. And then you can uh, provide connectivity uh, over the internet. You can configure load balancing or network address translation services, and this will require you to deploy software load balancer VMs. Uh, one thing I want to note here is that the deployment wizard through Windows Admin Center only uh, deploys network controller. We have plans to include software load balancer and gateway deployment as part of that. Um, it is in the roadmap, but it is not there yet. And finally, uh, if you want to provide connectivity to external networks, you can do that through SDN gateways, and of course, you will need to deploy gateway VMs for that. So um, that brings me to the end of my session. Um, to summarize, security breaches are common and are increasing day by day. Cyber criminals are targeting high value data with sophisticated attacks designed to bypass perimeter based controls. The edge security model offers little protection against the most common and costly attacks targeting organizations today, including attack vectors originating within the perimeter. These attacks infiltrate the perimeter, learn internal infrastructure, and can laterally spread through the data center. The ideal solution here is microsegmentation, which is protecting every traffic flow inside the data center with a firewall, allowing only the flows required for the application to function. One important thing here is that there are no network requirements to deploy microsegmentation. You just need three VMs for network controller, and you just need to provide management network connectivity to your network controller. And another very key thing is that you can apply these policies to your traditional VLAN networks as well. You do not need to deploy overlay style networks with VXLAN or NVGRE to take advantages of these capabilities. Um, I want to note here that uh, the feature to apply these policies on traditional VLAN networks is going to be available early December, uh, so you should be able to use it at that point of time. And finally, you can add additional network services on demand. So it what it means that you do not need to deploy your entire, SD, entire SDN infrastructure at the get go. You can deploy NC, use it for your traditional workloads. Whenever you feel the need to deploy um, virtual networks, you can do that and add value and add network services on top of that as needed. So that's about it from me. Um, if you uh, we can take questions now, and if you have additional feedback and questions, please feel free to reach out to the SDN team at SDN underscore feedback at Microsoft.com. Yeah, thanks so much for this great session. This uh, there is some more light for me now with software defined networking, and I like that you bring the features to VLANs. Um, I think that's that's a great benefit for many people who want to, to deploy SDN. So, and I know Didier has some question queued up. So, yes, Didier? I, uh, yep. Can you yeah, hear me? Please, go ahead. Yeah, I okay. can. Go ahead. Please. I, uh, listed, I listed some of them I saw come by. Well, one of the questions is, is there a timeline for compatible management between VMM and WAC deployed software defined networking? Because people don't consider WAC management adequate for large enterprises. So there's a question there. If you know, that would be nice. And we got that question answered. Um, so, so there are two parts to this, right? Um, firstly, whether a VMM uh, supports the HCI-based uh, HCI infrastructure and services, and that is absolutely true. Um, that is going to be supported very soon. As far as um, compatibility between VMM and HCI is concerned, um, the VMM team is the best team to answer that. But I think right now these are two disparate experiences uh, where you can either use Virtual Machine Manager or you can use uh, Windows Admin Center for your HCI workloads. OK, uh, another one is well, the question was came up why the network controller isn't installed on the hardware directly instead of deploying it in uh, virtual Azure Stack VMs. Well, I guess as has always been the case that uh, you run up quite a number of machines to deploy a full SDN solution, so that might be not the best uh, approach. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so network controller uh, has some technical challenges uh, which prevent us from putting it on directly on the hosts, but the feedback is very well taken that you, you are actually using up virtual machines 
for your infrastructure and you want to avoid that. Uh, and we have plans in our roadmap to put network controllers on containers so that you do not need to spin up virtual machines to use network controller services. So yes, that is part of the plan and it is in the roadmap, uh, but not quite yet. But then still the, the containers are still part of your infrastructure. Yes. So that, that 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 objection doesn't really go away. It's just a different way of deploying them. It's light, more lightweight. That's all true, but it's still yeah. on top of the infrastructure. Yes, you're that's, actually that's protecting. Right. Yeah. That's right. You're but, moving away from VMs to containers, but yes, the, you would still need to deploy NC on one of these uh, modes. Yeah, so the, there was also a question around uh, the SDN creation wizard. Uh, can you run it separately after you have run the cluster creation wizard, or is it really integrated into it? And are you do you have to decide to do it, or can you still add it afterwards completely? Great question again. Um, right now, uh, it is integrated with the deployment wizard, and you cannot bring it up later on. But this feedback has been received from numerous fronts, and I think Priya from the VAC team has also noted it in her presentation. And we are uh, we are having plans to uh, have it separate so that it can be launched later on as well. There was a little bit of confusion. So it, this is based on the SDN we all know and love, I guess. So is there is is this only for Azure Stack HCI, or will it also be available for any let's say Hyper-V deployment? So uh, yes. Uh, so yes, this is part of Azure Stack HCI OS, but it is also available with your Windows Server data center license. So you should be able to use it with your Windows Server 2019 today, or even your the next version of Windows Server, which is so that's out. that's cool. The micro segmentation is coming basically to all existing work, uh, 2019 and beyond workloads uh, or deployments. Let's yes. put it out. Next. Yes. Okay, that's that's cool. Uh, and then one question here, well. Uh, when will you have feature comp uh, feature parity with VMware and as and as XT? Great question again. Um, we are getting there. Uh, I think as far as the core capabilities go, we support um, most of them, but uh, we still have to do some work to support, for example, at scale deployments, say with multi-site, uh, where you can have a single deployment which covers multiple geographical locations and have a single management uh, experience for deploying policies and managing policies across sites. Uh, and again, this is something which is in our near term roadmap and we should be able to see this soon. OK, that that was about it uh, as a personal uh, observation. I think uh, supporting the traditional VLAN networks is going to open this up to a lot more people than if you didn't do that. So that's a good thing to have. Absolutely, <laughs> that's the intention. Let's see if any new questions came up oh yeah somebody is asking about the three network controller vms uh what's the maintenance like do they need regular updates how does that work so the updates for network controller vms are similar to any other um, windows vms so basically if you are in the data centers queue then you will receive updates through windows updates uh, and again with hci it's a different model but again, uh, the updates will still be controlled through Windows updates. So yes, it's it's similar than uh, similar to other Windows Server VMs which you maintain today. Yeah. Okay. That's it for the questions for now. So, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the great session, and I will definitely play with SDN more. I'm very interesting, uh, and uh, hope it will be getting out of the installation part of cluster wizard because you have to decide directly after the installation if you want sdn or not and i was sitting there where do i get an azure azure stack hci um uh, sys prepped virtual machine to start with so uh, that was hindering me okay so uh, we are through seven sessions now and we have still two-thirds of the people who were um, there attending live in the beginning so that's really great after i guess four and a half hours uh, we have still a lot of people there and the next sessions i'm re really looking forward to because we will have jason Yi. um hope that's right jason about performance benchmarking, and that's a topic I do a lot at customers, performance benchmarking. And then we uh, have uh, John Marlin uh, about the stretch cluster feature in Azure Stack HCI, also something customers I work with in Germany want a lot. And um, to be honest, I deploy a uh, storage basis direct cluster 
uh, stretched uh, when the customer really knows what what they do and uh, they want it. So I'm really looking forward to that feature that is supported in Azure Stack HCI. And then Jeff Woolsey uh, will finish up with modernizing your infrastructure and embracing hybrid cloud with Azure Stack HCI. And I know Jeff is also a great uh, speaker, so I'm looking forward to that. And then we are quite through. So next session would be Jason Yi. Is it is it right, Jason? Is it Yi or how do you pronounce your name? Yes, that is correct. It is pronounced Yi. Cool. So uh, we are right on the mark. Uh, Jason, start your session about performance benchmarking, and I assume you you use uh, Disk SPD a lot, right? Yes. Um, yes, that is uh, mostly what I'm going to be talking about today. Okay, great. So the stage is yours. Please present your uh, screen. Cool. Thank you. Um, can everyone see my uh, screen? It should be a per uh, presentation. Yeah, we can yep, see it now. Good. Great. Oh, Cosmos awesome. is back. Awesome, cool. Uh, so I guess I'll begin. My name is Jason. Uh, I'm a new PM at Microsoft within Azure Stack HCI. Um, so I can. I hope you can all bear with me. Should I make any careless mistakes? <laughs> um, today's presentation will be on benchmarking performance using this speed, and we'll be going over some general concepts that we should probably be aware of when uh, thinking of this. So before I get into the weeds, I wanted to highlight uh, a few things um, that I will be going over today and will not be going over today. <clears throat> so if you've never heard of this big, great news because we'll be going over from the from uh, as an introduction to storage performance testing. Um, we'll go through some examples with this speed, including some demos, and then we'll go on to interpreting some of the results. If you have used this speed and you consider yourself to be an expert um, in the storage performance area, you might find the first half or so a bit of a review. But I hope uh, you'll be able to learn something interesting in the second half uh, when I go into talking about uh, the data within the XML output. Cool, uh, so I'll quickly go over the agenda for today. We'll be going over some characteristics of this speed and uh, briefly touching upon some of the other tools that might exist. And then we'll go through a quick starter example and then dissect um, our example from the parameters to the output. And then we'll go over some of the concepts and factors to consider uh, in storage performance. And then we'll go on to uh, understanding the environment that we ran it on um, and take a look inside the additional data that's available within an XML output and then go through a quick demo on that. And that will pretty much wrap it up today. <clears throat> so there are a lot of micro benchmarking tools out there. Um, or related tools that are out there, um, and you might be wondering which one you should use. And if you ask me, uh, someone from Microsoft, I'm of course going to say this speed, right? <laughs> but uh, I do want to highlight a couple things uh, when con considering and looking into these tools. This speed is currently open source and it is actively supported, but there are other tools like Iometer, which is no longer actively supported, but it does have a graphical user interface. And so if that is something of interest, uh, that might be worth looking into. And then there's FIO, which uh, Nutanix standardized on one of their tools, uh, but it is often known in the community to have a complex, complex uh, syntax structure. Um, and it does have an extensive list of parameters as well, and that could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what your use case is. Um, and then there's HammerDB, which uh, is more of a niche tool that is optimized for database management system configurations, and it is made for database load testing. To start from the basics and cover all ground, um, we'll start with what is the speed, right? Uh, it's an IO generating tool for uh, micro benchmarking storage performance. And so, for example, maybe you purchased an ATI solution and are curious as to the theoretical performance limits. And so in these cases, it's often hard to run a full real end to end workload, and this is where this speed might come in handy. And more specifically, this speed helps you create synthetic workloads based on a set of parameters. And so um, it also provides the functionality to create a variety of disk request patterns, which might be helpful in diagnosis of uh, storage performance issues. And so you can provide a set of parameters to simulate a specific scenario with the disk speed executable file. So perhaps the second set of uh, the first set of uh, parameters mimics an SQL workload. 
and then maybe you input a second set of parameters that mimics a VDI workload and so forth. And then by doing so, it essentially allows you to analyze storage performance without running a full end-to-end -end workload. Great, so let's uh, go through a quick example um, of how you can get something running on disk speed. <clears throat> uh, you can go to the repository below and download the executable zip file, and you'll find three versions, a 64-bit, a 32-bit, uh, and a one for ARM systems. For us, we'll be running the 64-bit, and within the repository, you'll also find a list of uh, over 60 parameters. But for today, we'll, I've narrowed it down to 10 common parameters uh, that we can start off with. And here's the one-liner that we're gonna be running with. Um, it highlights some parameters. We define the path to the test file, in our case, io.dat, and we pipe it into a uh, TXT output. Here's a quick demo of uh, how of me running it. And for in this case, we're not uh, results. We're not putting the results into a TXT format. And so you can see the output on the terminal. And so to take a closer look at the parameters we ran, on the left you'll see the flags that I have used. Um, the T represents the number of threads per target file. The O represents the number of outstanding I.O. requests, also known as queue depth. The V is the block size in your specified units. R denotes random I.O. aligned to the specified size that you input. And W determines the percentage of write requests in relation to the read requests. And then D denotes duration. Uh, SUW uh, actually disables software and hardware cache. And then D and L um, actually captures additional statistics, um, more specifically IOPS and latency, respectively. And then C creates the uh, test file if you already do not have one. And then on the right, you'll see the exact uh, values that I have used. Um, for our example, we used two threads, a Q depth of 32 and a 4K block size. Um, at 4K random I.O., uh, we do 100% reads for 120 seconds, and our test file is five uh, gigabytes large. So let's take a quick look into the output uh, that we got from the TXT output. It's actually divided into four sections. The first is ma mainly the settings section, uh, which displays the user's input parameters, system, system level information, nothing too fancy. <clears throat> And then the second section highlights information such as the test time, the number of threads, but mostly focuses on the CPU level information, such as the CPU usage across the logical cores, as well as the average. And then the third section is the most meaty um, and has three subsections. So it's broken up into total IO for both read and write, only read IO and only write IO. And of course, when uh, we consider performance. The three main things that come into mind are uh, throughput, IOPS, and latency, and that's also displayed right there. And this is further broken down by threads. So in our case, uh, we have two threads, and so you'll see the IOPS values and th all the other metrics, such as the total IOs, broken down uh, for each of the threads. And also, you'll notice that there's the IOPS standard deviation and latency standard deviation, which come from the uh, dash L and dash uh, D parameters that we have used. And then finally, we have the latency percentiles uh, section, which uh, for example, uh, to interpret it, we can see that around 25% of the data is uh, 9.5 milliseconds or less. Um, and as you get into the really high percentiles, you'll notice that uh, the values remain constant at around 117, reason being you're likely only observing one latency value at that point. And th this section is important because uh, latency uh, actually kind of determines the quality of your IOPS. And so you, if you're achieving really high IOPS, but your system needs really low latency and you're not getting the latency you need, um, your those IOPS are likely kind of meaningless. <clears throat> and then now that we know the output, there's a few relationships that uh, might be helpful when we begin to think about these things. Um, first is IOPS times IO size equals throughput. Um, so let's go through an example. Uh, we can imagine that you have P30 disks and they have a maximum limit of 200 megabits per second for throughput and 5000 IOPS. And let's say that your application needs a maximum throughput, needs to utilize the maximum throughput of that at 200 megabits per second, and you choose a relatively larger IO size at 1024 KB. In that case, uh, if we do some dimensional analysis, uh, you'll arrive around 200 IOPS, maybe a little less and vice versa, if you need to maximize your 
IOPS uh, and use all 5,000 IOPS, uh, you'll use a smaller IO size AKB and get around 40 megabits per second. And when thinking about these relationships, I, 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 usually, I find one thing helpful is to visually interpret this. And uh, this may not be the most formal way to uh, visualize this, but I do think uh, it does get the point across. So the way I visualized it was that uh, you can imagine the IOs represented by the purple circles um, and I, the IOPS represented by the purple rectangle um, and imagine it being a bucket that can hold a certain amount of data. And the throughput in our case, uh, 200 megabits per second, we treat it as a constant. And so if we increase the IO size, the IOPS bucket is going to have to decrease as it won't be able to hold as many uh, of those IOs as before, since each one is weighted even more now. Now, the second relationship that I, I want to discuss is the IOPS times latency equals QDEP. And this introduces the idea, again, that there's three characteristics that brought, uh, govern process behavior, and you only need to change one to influence the process. And again, we can go through an example. Uh, so imagine you have P30 disks again, um, and you need one millisecond latency, and you, sorry, and let's assume again, your application needs a one millisecond latency, um, and you want to utilize the 5,000 IOPS that the P30 disks offer. And to find your optimal Q depth to achieve the 5,000 IOPS, you would treat the 5,000, you know, as a constant within the, uh, within the relationship, um, as well as the one millisecond. And if you calculate it, you'll get around five as the optimal Q depth. So after knowing these relationships, even after knowing these relationships, it's often the case that you may run into situations and think, hey, why am I not getting uh, the performance I'm expecting? Or there might be some things uh, that seem to be an outlier. And this is a difficult question to answer because there's many different factors that can affect performance, as you may know, from network bandwidth to caching to storage configuration and whether you're running from the CSV owner. And so there's a lot of different factors, but today we'll talk about two of the many. And the first one is uh, file copy. So some people, some people may uh, believe that they're testing storage performance by simply copying and pasting a uh, gigantic file and measuring how long it takes. But, and the main reason might be because it's simple and fast, but if your goal is to measure file copy performance, and if your goal is to measure file copy performance, then it might be a uh, sufficient test. However, if your goal is to measure storage performance, then uh, this is a this is uh, we recommend using benchmarking tools uh, like Dispy. And the second thing is that file copies may not be optimized for your specific workload. Uh, most file copy programs only copy one file at a time while waiting for the first copy to finish and then moving on to the next. And the serialization gives you a much lower performance when compared to uh, requests that are being queued in parallel with multiple threads. And the third thing to keep in mind is that uh, every copy it has uh, two different size, the source and the destination. And so when you are copying from a slower disk to a faster disk, you're essentially limited by how fast you can read out of the slower disk. Um, and therefore that slower disk is, will determine the overall performance. The second thing to keep in mind is the concept of a coordinator node. And the coordinator node is the server or node that owns the volume or cluster shared volume. And typically every volume is assigned a node and the other non-coordinator nodes can access this volume through network ops. And this often results in lower performance. Similarly, uh, a CSV has a volume owner, um, but the issue is that the CSV is dynamic in the sense that it will often change ownership every time you restart or log into the cluster. Um, and as a result, it's important. You should keep in mind that uh, the ownership could change and that you want to run disk speed from the local coordinator node. And uh, if you're not on it, you might want to double check and uh, make sure you change that ownership so that you're running disk speed from the local node. And while the change is pretty minimal, as you can see in this example, uh, you'll, you'll still notice that the latency will, you'll notice that the latency will still uh, decrease and throughput and IOPS increase when you're run from the local node as, a, as opposed to doing a network hop. And this might scale a lot more in more enterprise environments. 
Great, so now uh, we'll go through a quick example. Um, this example is based off the environment that uh, I ran the initial disk speed test on, and uh, this will demonstrate the network op as well. So imagine we have a three node, uh, three way mirrored cluster where node one is the coordinator node. The CSV spans across all three nodes. And then we have the SPL layer. And then we have four uh, P30 SSD disks, each one terabyte each uh, attached to all of the nodes. And you'll notice that the red blocks represent the uh, VM limits and the SSD limits in terms of IOPS. And so it's here that you'll now kind of real, you can maybe realize is that the because I'm using uh, standard B2MS, uh, which has a Azure cap at 1920 IOPS, you'll notice that our result from earlier was also around 1950, 1920 IOPS. And then you can also realize that this is a terrible configuration because you're not taking advantage of the 5000 IOPS that you could have gotten. And so this is another thing that to keep in mind when uh, worrying about performance. So onto the example, imagine we're running disk speed from node two. Uh, yeah, imagine we're running disk speed from node two. And in this case, we will need to go through a network hop to node one because it owns the CSV that we are writing our test file to. And on top of that, we need to go through another network hop because this is a three-way mirrored situation and we're uh, going through a write request. And so it'll need to write the data onto all, all the disks on all three nodes. And so you can imagine how uh, the network hops will eventually have a pretty significant uh, performance cost. So up until now, we've observe, observed uh, the terminal output and the TXT output, which was in a more aggregated form for human for human eyes. But there's actually a third output uh, as an XML file, and it actually has some additional more finer level of detail. So let's take a closer look. It's again split into three sections. Um, the first section, again, it's mostly for system level information, such as the node, the node name, the disk speed version, number of processors, and et cetera. And then the second section is the more important one. So you can see the time spans element, uh, and this defines your disk speed test runs. And within it, you'll see a time span element without an S, and it represents the input parameters that you ran disk speed with. So this includes queue depth, thread count, um, could be your file size, and et cetera. And uh, you can now kind of see how, because each time span element represents one disk speed test run, perhaps you can uh, type in multiple time span elements and feed it back into disk speed as a batch testing. And then the third section has a time span element again, and this isn't to be confused with the earlier one, as this section actually contains the results of your disk speed test. But uh, in contrast to the original TXT output, this is in a more granular form rather than the aggregated output. So it allows you a more finer level of detail. Um, so for example, the IOPS data is broken down into buckets where each bucket corresponds to one, uh, corresponds to the IO data for one millisecond. So what can we do with this XML output? Um, as hinted, you can, pipe in multiple time span elements to uh, run batch testing. You can access the high, hidden, more finer level of data um, through some scripting, extract it, and perform some analysis or graph it. And that's what I have done actually on the left. Um, I display the total IO for each of the seconds. However, you'll notice that uh, the IOPS variance is relatively constant. And uh, this is because I'm using Azure VMs and it uh, throttles the values based off your VM type and the occasional bumps is just Azure trying to rebalance itself. And this is great, but workloads can't often be turned on and off, and it's a lot more messier than that. And there might be situations where you wanna mimic random IO activity. And that's at this point, you might wanna dig into the XML output, tinker around, see if it's possible. Um, and in fact, it is possible. And so I've created a script that uh, simulates the random IO activity through Dispute's XML format on the left. And uh, the graph is a lot less, um, a, lot, a lot less constant, and it does simulate the random I/O. And um, building off of this, there's there might be situations where we don't necessarily know what a good IOPS number is. And in reality, in order to discover these issues and look into it, you need to at minimum compare IOPS values with latency values. And for some people, 
uh, this might be uh, comparing percentile scores. And so I went ahead and created another script that calculates the percentile values uh, for the IOPS. And then now we have another source of data uh, to compare the IOPS to latency values and see if we are getting what we are, should see. And as you can see that the XML output format might actually contain some useful data. If you're feeling like you're not getting the finer level of control inside of the uh, TXT output. Oops. So the next question might be how, how was the script ran? And that is what I'm going to answer in the next uh, slide, where the first slide varies the IO value. Well, the first slide um, details the two scripts that I've created. And the first script actually varies the IO values by randomizing the throughput within a specified range and runs this speed in short one second bursts. And so there are a lot of different parameters the user has the freedom to control, but the three main ones are uh, the duration, the gmin, and gmax. And the gmin and gmax denote the range to which the throughput value is allowed to, uh, to be randomized. And you'll actually see three different output files after running the script. The first is expand profile, which contains the multiple time span elements that you initially see, have saw in this uh, presentation. And the reason it's left is to offer the users the control and freedom to go in, uh, change, make some changes, and actually feed it back into this speed. And then output.xml contains the results in the XML format after running the script. And the CSV file is the clean data that uh, organizes the data in a clean format for the total IO for each of the seconds. And then the second script takes that output and calculates the IOPS percentiles. And there's only one uh, output uh, file from the script, which is IOPS percentiles.csv, which again is the cleaner version, which organizes the IOPS uh, percentile scores and the percentile ranks. We'll go through a quick demo of running this. So you'll see me running the first script for about 120 seconds. And uh, you'll see the results on the terminal as well for the total IO for each of the individual seconds. And then I will go ahead and run the second script which calculates the percentile scores for the appropriate ranks from 1% to 25, 50, 75, and so forth. And then within the directory, you'll find the four different output files, three from the first script and one from the second script. And that pretty much wraps it up for uh, today's presentation. But if you have a moment, we'd greatly appreciate you taking a quick survey to help us build better performance tools and insights for you in the future. And uh, if you're wondering how to get access to the scripts, uh, be on the lookout for a future blog post uh, within the Tech.Community community page, as I will link it there. Um, thanks for listening today, and I'll be happy to take any comments. Yeah, Jason, that was really, really interesting, and I, I, I learned some new things about this speed, and I like the way you are going uh in the future with more realistic setups or more predefined setups so daryl daryl has done the q a daryl do you have questions for uh, jason and please unmute yourself oh i am sorry <laughs> i have a few questions uh, and thanks for the session jason it was really in depth i had to keep my eyes uh, on the screen to uh, understand it so it was good um, I have a few questions lined up. So one question is, disk SPD will always go all out, so it will always go full performance as it seems. Can we throttle it and run like a normal workload? Um, by throttling it, do you mean control like your maximum IOPS uh, limits and I, I guess maybe some throughput and depending on the user's choice? Yeah, so so with uh, IO meter, for example, we had like baselines or patterns that we could choose from, like database clusters or uh, other types of workloads. Right. And we can just run them for like a couple of days so we can see like the cluster is stable or not, or that we see uh, mm -hmm. strange things. Right. Uh, is, so, is something like that coming? So 
I don't believe there's a uh, specific feature to limit, like for instance, latency values. There's no cutoff that you can say, oh, let's stop at one milliseconds. Um, and as well as the specific workloads that you were mentioning for I Iometer, um, how DSP currently doesn't have any specific grouping and categories for BDI workloads or SQL workloads, but it does offer the finer level of detail for controlling the individual parameters for the block size, the uh, or also known as the IO buffer, and uh, like the read write ratio, whether you're doing 4K IO and things like that. So you can you can mimic you can use this set of parameters to mimic the specific uh, the specific workload that you're trying to achieve. But uh, we don't predetermine the parameters as of now um, to represent a specific workload. Okay. Now, Jason, can I can I add Carsten here? So Sorry? there is actually a minus G parameter and I use it. It, it is uh, bytes per thread per millisecond. So how many IO bytes per uh, per thread per millisecond? And I use it to limit the IOPS a VM is doing. So if I want to simulate, for example, a 200 uh, IOP per second uh, workload, you can use that, but you have to calculate it because it's on milliseconds and it's on the thread. Uh, right. Other than that, I don't know anything to limit. Right. That. Sorry, let me clarify. Um, so for I think for latency and IOPS, I don't believe there is a limit, but uh, you're yeah. correct in that the throughput, there is the G parameter, which is exactly what I used for my script. Um, so for the first script, when I randomize the IO activity, I actually do this by um, randomizing the throughput limit. And so the G min and G max represent the like the range to which you're the throughput is being randomized. So if, for me, I have used zero to 8,000. And so between a zero to 8,000, the G parameter is being randomized. And then because I'm using that value to uh, essentially, as you mentioned, throttle it, the IO, IO activity is being, uh, being simulated to be random. And you are correct that there needs to be a sort of a calculation going on um, for the G, G parameter because there is uh, a bit of a unit mismatch. Yeah. Okay, Daryl, go on with the question. I, I wanted to uh, just to add it because I needed something to limit the IOPS per virtual machine. All right. Um, is there a new version coming of disk SPD? Because the latest version is from 2018. Are there any new features coming? Right. So currently there is no. Uh, like a new version that is about to come out in the next week or so, but uh, we are looking to we are looking to create um, a little bit of assistant for users to size performance related needs. And so for those needs, um, we're looking into kind of changing disk speed uh, as well as VM fleet um, and making the appropriate modifications to create uh, certain workload categories that people can uh, run some benchmark testing in. So for instance, SQL will maybe perhaps have uh, this is off the top of my head, but we might have a certain set of parameters that mimics an SQL workload and the users can go in and certain and just simply run that. All right. Actually, I don't want to plug myself here, but I, cre I created a tool called, called Diskpeed. It's on, on, on the Microsoft gallery, which has some patterns in there, but it needs some updating. So I'm glad if you take it over. Um, <laughs> I don't uh, want I to plug myself, he says, as he plugs himself. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I updated it the last time, was also 2018, so it's not a positive plug. Okay. And is there is there a new version coming? I'm just kidding. Uh, it depends on Jason and you, I guess, now. <laughs> um, last question, it's from, from Karsten, actually. Um, is it possible with Disk SPD to do 50% sequential and 50% random at the same time? Uh, right now, to my knowledge, I, I don't believe that is possible. You can indeed control uh, for read and write within a random workload, but I'm not sure you can uh, further break it down into. Uh, I'm not sure you can further break it down into uh, sequential and random at the same time while varying your read and write operations too. And if, Jason, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll add a thought there. One of the things that's tricky is it's not super obvious what 50% sequential, 50% random would mean. Um, you know, I guess you could have two workloads, one that's random, one that's sequential, and just run them at the same time. Daryl, I think that's what you're, you're um, 
UI encouraged people to do back in the day, right? Is you would just create multiple disk speed threads in parallel. But actually, it would run after each other. Ah, ah okay. Okay. Yeah, but for, uh, for an individual, what? for like for an individual thread, imagine it's just doing some IOs, right? If they're sequential, then each IO is at a consecutive address, you know, address X and then X plus one and then X plus two and X plus three. And if they're random, then they're at random addresses, X and then Y and then Z, and they have no relation to one another. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for it to be half random? Does it mean that every time you make it, you flip a coin and decide if you're going to do X plus two or if you're going to do Y? It's it's sort of um, not it's not quite clear what it would actually mean. It, it would, yeah. I think it would just mimic uh, real real workload. I think that's what's the question about. Right, and, and I think that's a good way to sort of up-level the, the comment then, is to say, well, we believe that there is some mix of sequential and random in the world, and we want to be able to simulate that. Is that is that basically what you're asking? Yes. Uh, well, if you so. ask me, the question was, was, was from me. So uh, in the good old days with IO-meter, you, you could mimic some uh, uh, complex workload that is doing different things on different threads so, for example, if you have a SQL server, it's not only doing random I.O., it's also, also doing sequential I.O. to the log file and some randomness. So uh, that was something a lot of people liked about I.O. meter. So in, and in disk speed, you, end, you only can start, I think, one disk speed in, uh, uh, in, uh, in a VM, and it, it only does random or maybe not random. So uh, this was the kind of question I was asking because sometimes you have a more complex uh, test, maybe. Got it. So you, it, it's not 50-50. It, it was just an, a question from, for me if there is a possibility to, to, uh, to mix random and, and sequential a bit. So in the moment, I understand it's doing all the time random or no random, or does it always random? No, yeah. there, there, I believe, is an option to do sequential as well. but. Um, yeah. Yeah, so right now in my case, I, I did uh, all random with 4K log size. And of course, it will mimic uh, at an Azure Stack HCI. We have virtual machines, so a lot of uh, a lot of I/O is random to the to the storage. I get that, but uh, some some I/O is also sequential. And it was just a question. I'm looking forward, maybe to have that. And so, can I have the last question from my side? Of uh, course. One quick, if I may, follow up on what Carsten sure. said. So Carsten. It's not so much that necessarily a single disk speed thread needs to have both, but you're saying like, can I run a VM fleet that accurately mimics a SQL and that has some of both going on, even if it's just multiple disk speeds within each VM? Yeah, maybe that that would that would be okay for me. Yeah, got it. Cool. Because cool. in the moment with VM fleet, we do one test in all VMs, and that's great. But maybe there should be a little bit more. Um, how you say it, uh, di diversity going on. And I, I, I know Microsoft loves diversity, so why not disk speed? Wow, that was a real, that was a real segue. <laughs> <laughs> I know you are on it on Cosmos, so I can do that. But Daryl has another question, right? Yes, so once uh, a long time ago, I was in a support call with Microsoft and they were not using VM fleet, but they were using disk speed directly on CSVs. Um, so is the new solution or maybe the, the next VM fleet is going to be used uh, from inside VMs uh, or not? And what would be the better way to test it? I mean, VM fleet has some, some sort of automation in it, which makes more sense. But I hear some people also using disk, SP, disk SPD directly on the CSVs. The most accurate mimic for virtual machines is always going to be to run the workload from within virtual machines. I think people who do otherwise are just um, simplifying a bit, right? Like if, if it's not so important that it be exactly like the workload, but you just want to do something quickly, um, it's obviously, it saves you a lot of time not to have to deploy VM fleet, right? Yeah. But do you get better numbers when you're not using VMs because you don't have overload or you don't think so? I, I, I would assume, well, as Cosmos mentioned, uh, I would assume that usually the idea of testing uh, with
with the Enfleet or Disfeed for these micro benchmarking tools is to test it on your source to get storage performance results. And so often that is done on CSVs within VMs, but uh, I, I actually am not too sure about uh, the results, uh, whether it would get better or worse results by testing outside of it. Yeah, I mean, you'll certainly see like a lower latency number if you are just running disk speed directly against the CSV, right? Because you, the otherwise disk speed is measuring from within the virtual machine. So inevitably, I mean, it's not a big difference, but there is going to be some amount of small difference, right? Um, what you see on the Windows Admin Center dashboard is measured at the file system, right? And so that number should appear the same in both cases, but the result that you get from disk speed running it on the host versus in the VM will, will differ. Shouldn't be a huge difference, but there is a theoretical difference. But again, it, important to keep in mind, as Jason was saying, like the whole idea here is to understand what a workload is actually going to experience, and the workload is going to be running in a VM. All right, clear. Yeah. Thank you. By the way, there, you you guys had some really good suggestions here, so um, let me just re-emphasize what Jason said. Please, please take the survey and and let us know the things that you want to see changed and improved in the area of performance generally. Yeah, cool. Um, so thanks, uh, Jason, uh, and thanks, Cosmos. Uh, um, I think this is really a great presentation, and I have to rewatch it once or twice to to get all the good information there. But now I want to talk to Daryl a bit because Daryl, um, you are doing also some great stuff for the community, right? Oh, thank I, you. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking of the Slack channel. Yes, so you Slack tell channel. us a little bit about the Slack channel you are doing. Well, the Slack channel started, I think, two years ago as a test more, because I'm just was just missing a place for you know community members to to chat, and I didn't want to set up a forum. I never used Slack before. I just tried it, and um, before I knew it, we were people were joining, and it kept on growing and growing. So we're, I think we're now at over fifteen hundred members. Uh, People ask questions there every day, get answers also. That's also great. And a lot of community, community members are in there, like yourself, Karsten is in there, but also some PMs from Microsoft are in there and answer occasionally some questions. So it's going great. And yeah, and um, I'm not, not only me is there, I'm, I'm only answering maybe a question every three months or so because I don't know much time, but I know every community supporter is is in there um, uh, who is doing storage basis direct. And it's a it's a great place to talk to other people who have uh, interest in storage basis direct or Azure Stack HDI. And uh, I, I know Jan Torre is doing a lot of stuff there. Jaromir is doing a lot of stuff there. So um, maybe you can post um, the 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 link to the Slack channel in the in the Q and A uh, part as an announcement, so people who are not already in there can join. Yeah, Def definitely. Yeah, so I'll, I'll post it. I'll also do sometimes a newsletter. I, I want to do it monthly. I don't always get it done. We also do virtual meetup, of course. So uh, please join, and uh, we'll see you there. Yeah, and very good information. Daryl, and you also work in the area of storage spaces direct. You are a consultant with your own company, I assume, and uh, work in the Netherlands and help people with storage spaces direct and Azure Stack HCI, right? Yes, so I have a company called Splitbrain, which references to the Splitbrain scenario of a cluster, of course. Um, and we do consulting, we help customers in their journey to the cloud. And so we do an inventory on what they have and uh, mainly, mostly they want to move to Azure in the Netherlands, um, and then we'll do the inventory and say, maybe Azure Stack HCI is a better solution for you because of this, this, and this reason. Um, but uh, we mostly see a combination of Azure and Azure Stack HCI uh, in our uh, customer base. So uh, I want to uh, a follow up question. How is your, um, you said in the Netherlands, a lot of people uh, move to Azure, but how is the excitement about Azure Stack HCI? Because now we have a product that you pay in Azure, you pay as you go. How uh, how are people um, receiving that offer? Is there a huge interest or are there more storage bases direct? Um, I mean, the adoption of storage space direct in the Netherlands, 
I think it was quite low uh, if you compare it to like Germany or, or the Nordics, like where uh, Norway or Denmark. Um, but Aztec HCI, as it is a cloud solution, I, I'm not sure why, but the Netherlands is very straight, very straightforward on going to the cloud. So yeah. they pointed to like the on-premise infrastructure, they pointed out as legacy already. Um, but now with Aztec HCI being a cloud product um, and companies uh, starting to understand that they sometimes have workload that have latency or uh, data sovereignty issues, Aztec HCI makes a great solution for it, right? Uh, and not only Aztec HCI as the new product, but also HCI based on Windows Server. But I mean, the new Aztec HCI has some big benefits on support, on feature updates every six months, uh, licensing, hopefully some more better licensing in the future. So uh, it's it's a game changer, like I think for many companies. Yeah, for the feature update, we have still to wait how Microsoft will handle that. At least it, we should get new features every year or maybe Cosmos can comment on that. I think it was yearly or was it half yearly? I would be more excited even for half yearly, but it's it's a very short period for, for the update. So um, um, now we are, thank you, Daryl. Um, now we have our next session and um, I already mentioned in Germany, a lot of people do uh, stretched uh, everything. So they have uh, two, two data centers or two separate rooms where they have their, uh, their clusters installed. And uh, now finally Azure Stack HCI will support stretched cluster. And I'm very happy that we have John who is responsible for the stretched cluster feature here to present all about it. John, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Karsten. Cool. Then, then join your uh, present your screen and go on, please. Ah, thank you. Okay, so while I'm doing this, first off, Karsten, excellent, excellent day. Thanks. I know a lot of a lot of stuff has been going on. A lot of stuff has been talked about. Um, and we just want to keep it going, keep the excitement going as we head closer and closer to release. Um, but as Karsten mentioned, uh, my name is John Marlin. I'm a program manager within the base team here at Microsoft. I am responsible for failover clustering, um, storage, disaster recovery, and that's and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about here with uh, Stretch. So I want to go just a little bit deeper, kind of pull back the covers a little bit. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, what Priya has already talked about with the uh, cluster creator inside of Windows Admin Center. I'm going to take you more behind the scenes of, about what all is what all is going on and how it and how it kind of relates in some parts to uh, what's being done within uh, Windows Admin Center. But one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to make it a lot easier so there's less configurations that you have to do. So, Stretch is all about disaster recovery. According to Wikipedia, it involves a set of policies, tools, and procedures that enable a recovery or continuation of, of technology in case of some disaster, whether it be human-induced, oops, I tripped over the power cord, or uh, a natural disaster, like what we're experiencing, you know, now in the US with a lot of the uh, hurricanes that we've had lately. So what we're going to talk about, what is Stretch? How is it created? What are we doing behind the scenes on, on different steps and different points? What, it, what does it look like? Um, creating drives, once we've got it set up, we have to create all the virtual disks. We have to be able to replicate it. We've made that a lot easier and, and I'll actually show you how we're doing that. Um, what happens in, a, in when there's a site failure? What do we do? How do we react? Um, and also adding nodes. Uh, this is a topic that's, been, that's come up lately. Um, I've got an existing, say, four node stretch cluster. I want to add more compute. I want to add more storage to it. How do I do it? It's not just a simple add the nodes, and, and we'll see that later. So first off, what is stretch? Stretch is all about location. OK, where are the nodes? Physically located at. 
They could be in different rooms. They could be on different floors. They can be in different buildings. You've got two buildings side by side. Could be in, you know, half in one, half in the other. Um, the other is a different city. You know, for the big DR, for the bigger companies. So there are some requirements, and I'm not going to go over all of them. Uh, but the first thing, validated hardware. Our recommendation: go to the hardware catalog, get a validated, tested solution. We know it works. It's been tested to work. It'll be put together like it's supposed to. Everything should work, start working out of the box. We've got all the different vendors here. All of them have their different options on the catalog. You can go ahead and put together something um, yourself on your own. As long as it, it passes all the validation steps, then you should be good to go. But in case there's a problem, is it with the software? Is it with the hardware that you have? Sometimes that's a little harder to identify or to to ensure that you know the bug is truly in the software. OK, so the recommendation go with what's on the go. What's on the catalog. Go to your favorite vendor of choice. Like I said, there's plenty of them here. We have to have the same number of nodes. Each site needs the same number. So we're always going to have an even number or odd number at each site. Not, you know, like with traditional clusters. Traditional clusters along the way, you know, going dating all the way back to, you know, some as far as back as 2000. Uh, some would have three in, in the primary site, two in the in the uh, secondary site, you know, some sort of mix and match hodgepodge. We didn't care. Azure Stack HCI, we care. And I'll show you why uh, a little bit later when we talk when we discuss adding nodes and I'll, and I'll show you why that it, ma that it makes a difference. We have to have the same size storage. On each side. Whenever we're talking about storage replica, all the virtual disks have to be the same. All attributes about that disk, same uh, cluster sizes, same interleaves, everything needs to be the same. They have to be mirrored copies because with storage replica, we're actually copying blocks of data. We're not co copying files, we're copying blocks. So everything has to be laid out the same. Um, and ex and ex uh, we also need storage replica because that's our replication. I've got Jake here. Jake's going to help me out. He's our old storage replica mascot from the Ned days. If you remember Ned, um, he's still alive. He's still kicking, except now he's a part of the team now. He's not a destroyer. He's our part. He's our friend now. So how is it created? Here I've got a couple of nodes at each site. OK, two different locations, same nodes, same number of drives and so forth. First thing you do when you set up the cluster, when you create the cluster itself, we're going to go and try and detect and automatically set up sites for you. There's multiple different ways that we're going to do it. The first way we're going to do is what I found out from talking with a lot of customers, having some surveys, um, is um, we're going to go out to AD. We're going to check for the existence to see if sites are configured. If sites are configured, we fall within those sites. Then we're going to create a site Redmond and a site Seattle. First thing, that's what we're always going to do. If AD sites are not configured, we're going to go and try and detect sites based off of the subnets. OK, and here's how we're doing it. So I've got I've got my four nodes here. This is how they're connected. I've got one dot X connected to a router from one site, 172 dot X to the other site and then 10 dot X. As my crossover cables. OK, so the first thing we do is let's pick a Let's pick a particular IP and then see what everybody else has as far as that IP. OK, so we'll see here we have the 10.x networks. That is common. OK, 
all nodes have this. This is not a site. We can't configure site space of it. So we throw it out. Next thing we do is we look at the others. And we see, OK, we have some commonalities here. Two of the nodes have this 1.x network. Two of the nodes have this 172 network. They're not common to each other. Ah, here's our sites. Let's configure our sites based off of it. So we create a site 1.000 and a site 172000. And that's what they're going to be referred to as from that point on. You can change them at any point manually if you want to, or you can leave it. Doesn't matter if you do change it. Probably recommend you change it before you enable Sword Spaces Direct, um, and, I, and I'll show you why. So, the third option is what we've always had, which is manually configure it. If we can't, if we don't do sites, if we're not on different subnets, if we're just simply in different racks sitting next to each other that happens to have the same IP scheme, you can still create different sites if you want to. Just manually do it with new dash cluster fault domain. And set cluster fault domain. So I create my stretch cluster. And it's created my sites. So we're good so far. In Windows Admin Center, I'm not sure if it does it right now. I know I've had discussions with uh, Priya on it um, about doing the same thing when we get to the point where um, I, don't, I don't remember if she had showed this to you uh, when she demoed it earlier, but uh, there is a screen for setting up sites, so you could set it up manually if you wanted to. Um, I can't remember if there's detection, the same type of detection that we're doing at the time since. I don't remember if it's before or after the cluster is created, but I know we've had some discussions about getting this same detection fill it out for you and then you can change it if you want to um but if it's not there now i know it's on the roadmap to get done the next thing auto pooling when you enable cluster storage spaces direct there's a couple of things there's several things that we do the very first thing is storage replica enabled we're going to go in and ensure that storage replica is installed as a feature on all nodes if one or more of the nodes are do not have it added we will err right there and say hey node x doesn't have storage replica installed go install it once it gets past that check we're going to go ahead and create the pools per site so we're going to take our two nodes create a pool out of those drives. Our other two nodes in the other site create a pool out of those sites. Now, this is where I was talking about previously. If you're going to rename the sites, do it before you enable it, because we're going to call the we're going to call the names per the site. The last thing that we're going to do is we're going you know we're still going to be creating cluster performance history like we always have, but we're also going to set up and do the set up the replication with storage replica for you. So it's already there. You're ready to go. So what it'll look like is. Check for storage replica. Everything's good. Create our pools on each site out of the drives. Name the pools so you'll see pool for site Seattle, pool for site Redmond or pool for site 1.000. And then cluster performance history. At that point, here we have Jake. He's our friend. He's our teammate. He's going to start setting up and doing all the replication for you for cluster performance history. Always going on, always going on. The next thing, we've got it all set up. Now we need to create the drives. Here I've got my two sites, and this is what it looks like in Windows Admin Center. If I go to volumes and I go to inventory, you can see here's my cluster performance history. So I want to do a create. And op pops pop ups this window. I can set it up a single site or 
replicated volume between sites. I say, which direction do I want to go? Seattle to Redmond, Redmond to Seattle. The next thing is, is it asynchronous or synchronous? If I scroll down, what's the name of the volume I want to give it? And then we've also got our resiliency settings detected based off the number of nodes in the site and what storage media is also detected. What size do I want to create the volume? I want to say 10 gig. And you can see here it, it'll adjust, ensure that it's got an, enough space on both sides. At that point, you can just simply hit create. But if you hit advanced, I just wanted to show you this here. You can see here, we're also creating all these other drives for you. We're going to give it its, the same name based off the initial disk. 40 gig is the default log size that we put in there. I'm going to change it to 10. And then we've got our other settings that we had use blocks already seeded, which is never going to be done because it's brand new. Uh, we can replicate the traffic or we can enable con the consistency groups. So I just sim simply hit create and it's going to create all these drives for you. So I'll speed it up here uh, so it does it. Here's my data disk, Seattle VM disk. You can see here in a second that it creates the log disk. It also creates the log disk and the replicated data disk on the opposite side as well. Now, the replicated disk is created, but you can't see it. And that's because we hide it from the OS. We don't want you to, to get a hold of that disk. We've got control of it. But if you jump out to PowerShell and do a get dash uh, virtual disk, you can you can see the disk is actually there. Now you can mount the disk with uh, uh, one of the PowerShell commands. It basically mounts a snapshot so you can see the data. If you wanted to do a backup of it or ensure something was there, you've got it there. Um, if I go to the storage replica tab, you can see here it's set up the replication for me. It's synchronous. Right now, across the top there, you can see it's doing its initial sync, setting everything up. There's nothing to sync, but it still has to set things up at a block level. So we're doing all this for you, and basically all you've got to do is select replicate between sites, what direction you want to go, what's the name of the disk, and how big is it? We'll take care of everything else for you. Make it easy. That's the whole thing. It's what uh, Cosmos was talking about earlier. Make it easy. You know, we don't want you to shoot yourself in the foot by accidentally setting something up wrong. You know, if you were to go to, say, create a volume within Windows Admin Center, but then later on go into do new volume or do virtual disk on the opposite side, they're not going to be identical. So we want to make sure that it is. So we do everything for you. We create everything identically the same. Make it easy. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. So we've created our drives. Now, the one good thing, the one nice thing about storage replica it is on a per volume basis. It's not a per site basis, it's per volume, which means I can set up an additional volume in Redmond to replicate to Seattle. So I've got both ways going. I've got both sites actually doing something. So I've got users that are in Seattle, they connect to their drive in Seattle, do all their production work, whatever it is that they're doing, I've got users in Redmond. They're connecting to their Redmond drive, doing whatever production they're doing. And the other site is, is a DR for that volume. So not only is it a DR for the cluster, you know, we're actually getting down to its DR for on a per volume basis. So we can actually get we can actually do it both ways. Both of them are active. You don't just have, you know, nodes sitting in another site not doing anything. Now you can do it if you want it that way. Uh, some do, some don't. Uh, from all the talkings of, of people that that I've talked to that have done a lot of 
stretch and multi-site clusters in the past, they always want to have some some production at a, at a, at both sites if they can do it. Okay. At that point, just simply create your VMs. You're up and going. Fully functional Azure Stack HCI. It's stretched. Everything's going on. You're ready to go. So now we talk about site failures. Now, with site failures, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on if you've chosen synchronous or asynchronous. Okay, and I'll, and I'll show you what I I'll show you what I mean. So here I've got my drives. Everything's set up. I have my resources inside the cluster, Seattle data, Seattle data log, Seattle data rep, Seattle data log rep. Each has reservations to the, to the drives within its own site. But let's say, let's say the Seattle site comes down. Someone tripped over the big plug and turned it all off. But they did it at, oh, let's say, 3 a.m. on a Saturday early morning, and nobody knows about it. We are going to react to this. What we're going to do, first, we're going to stop a replication. Obviously, there's nothing to replicate, so it's going to be paused. We're going to take the replicated log and replicated data. We're going to remove the, the persistent reservations to the disks. We're going to move it off to the side, open up the disks. We're going to take our Seattle data resources, data log resource. Those are going to be put onto uh, the drives at, at the Redmond site, and they're going to have the disk reservations. OK, now at this point is where it's going to differ between synchronous and asynchronous. If it's synchronous replication, we're going to automatically bring everything up. Because everything is in sync. OK, we know it's synchronized because of the way that, that we're doing storage replica. Everything's up. I move my VMs over. I bring them up. I'm back in production. All automatic. Don't have to do anything. If it's asynchronous, asynchronous is that the disks are not synchronized. We're not going to bring up disks that are not synchronized automatically. So we'll move everything over there, but we will not, we will not bring it all online. You have to decide if you want to, to bring it online. And in a lot of discussions that I have, there's a lot of people that, that, want, the, that want it this way. They want to determine if they need to bring it up. You know, maybe it's a simple matter of. Someone tripped over the plug and they plug they plugged it back in. They'll be at, back up in 10 minutes. Versus having to restart everything. OK, so you can bring it up, but you have to you have to bring it up knowing that. You may be out, you may be out of some of your your ranges for RPOs and, and, and so forth. So. Site comes back, Seattle comes back up. We're not going to automatically move it all back over. One of the reasons is the the disks within Seattle, they're out of sync. You know, it could be a couple hours, three hours, four hours, half a day, whatever it may be. It's not in sync. So what we're going to do is we're going to move the replicated. Um, data resource replicated log resource to our Seattle site. They're going to get the disk, disk reservations for it. And then we're going to start replication. We're going to start replicating from Redmond to Seattle so that Seattle can get all of its data. And get in sync. OK. Now. Synchronous. If you are synchronous, you cannot reverse it until it's in sync. We will prevent you again back to the back to Cosmos's. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. We don't want to move. We, want, we don't want you to move over if it's out of sync. Because that we're, that's data that we're talking about. 
you know, I mean, parts of a SQL, parts of a spreadsheet, parts of a, you know, a letter, or what, you know, whatever it may be. Okay, so we won't let you do it. Asynchronous, we will let you do it, but you have to make the conscious, conscious decision you want to do it. Okay, now there is within storage replica, uh, if you set it up manually, there is a dash async RPO where you can set your RPO settings. How far out do you want it to, to be out of sync? You can go down as low as 30 seconds. Uh, but that's something that you have to set up manually. You can't go through it Windows Admin Center to do that. But it is something that you can do if you're going to go asynchronous uh, and you want some sort of RPO settings. At this point, if you were to just simply, everything's in sync, you move the data, data log over to reverse it, we'll take care of everything for you. We'll release the reservation, switch the resources, bring it up, switch the replication around, Everything will be back at that point. Just simply move the VMs back over. And you can do it live migrate, so you're not going to lose anything. Adding nodes. One of the things that we had to look at with adding nodes, going back to our requirements, same number of nodes, same size disks. Part of this is also uh, one of the reasonings why um, Alvin's team, and he talked about it earlier with some of the new feature stuff that they're doing with um, uh, CPU compatibility. Whenever you add nodes, you may not get the exact same nodes, or you may get the exact same nodes, but it's a little higher CPU revision level. Something like that happens. You have to choose CPU compatibility, which means you go back to the old style CPUs, you know, Pentium 3s or whatever, whatever it's set up, something that's way old, way old. So some of your VMs that might be CPU intensive or need specific instruction sets, for the CPU, um, you're going to lose some of that capability. With what Alvin's team is working on now is uh, setting it to, in essence, basically what it is, is whatever the lowest CPU you have throughout your system, that's the level that we're going to use. So if you're adding nodes that have higher revisions, you're not losing anything. Everything's identically the same. We'll just not take advantage of whatever new instruction sets may be on the new on the new VMs or on the new CPU. Sorry. So adding nodes, the way we have to do it, very specific steps that you have to do. So we take the old style, the old way of doing it, adding nodes. You just simply add the nodes. They add to the cluster, no big deal. Now we need to add them, add the nodes to the different sites. So I do my set vault domain, add this node to this to the Seattle domain. But now we're going to pop an error. We're going to reject it. OK. As soon as you add a node to a site. What health is going to do in the background is suck up all the drives that's in that node and add it to the pool. It's going to do that automatically. So what it'll look like is. I add my notes to the site. Or I'm sorry, I add my notes to the cluster. I add my five. If I add node five to the site, it sucks up the pools. You can see here we are different size drives. That can be bad. Because now from a block perspective, blocks differ. Because once you add the new nodes in, the new drives get added in. In the background, store, um, storage spaces direct is going to start, you know, add in and create a storage job to start moving data around so it can start, you know, utilizing those drives. All the blocks are going to differ. So we prevent that from happening. So, specific steps on how, how to do it. And then I'll show you how. 
Here I've got my Azure Stack HCI and I'm on a node one. I do a get cluster. I see my cluster name is Stretch HCI. Um, I do get cluster node. I see I've got four my four nodes. I did look at my storage pool to see my pools. To see my pool for site Redmond, pool for site Seattle. Now notice it's got 47 gig of space. Okay, I do my fault domains and I see my two nodes are in each site. Redmond's in Redmond, Seattle's in Seattle. So now there's a, not many people know this, but it's actually been there for a while. There's get fault, get cluster fault domain XML. I run that command and output to output it to a file. I'm going to call the file sites.xml. So I look at my XML in your XML viewer of editor of choice, whatever it may be. I've just happened to use notepad here. I open up this sites.xml file and it's just a small file. There's not a lot to it. Open it up. I can see my names are here. Here's my note, my two nodes in Redmond, two nodes in Seattle. I just simply have to add in the nodes before I add them to the cluster to this XML file. So I add node six to the Redmond site, and then I'll add node five to the Seattle site so that it, it can be there and in place before they get added. So I save it. <coughs> Excuse me. Now the next command I want to use is I want to set up a variable for the XML to basically get the contents of my sites.xml file. If I could type faster. Um, at that point, now it's set.clusterfaultdomainxml file. I want to take this XML file, set it, give it my variable $XML for the XML file. And now when I go and look at my fault domain information, you can see I've added this in, that it's in there now. It's ready to go. Here's my node five, here's my node six. We're ready to go. At that point, now you can add it in, add the nodes in. So what it's gonna do is the nodes will get added in to the cluster. They'll see they're already a part of a site and the drives will just get stuck up in all at the same time. And of course, I'll speed this up so we don't have to wait for the cluster to do. Once it gets added to the node, or once the nodes get added to the cluster, it will then um, run a storage job so that it sucks in all those drives and starts using it. So now you can see my nodes are a part of the cluster. If I look at my pools now, and my storage job is already completed, it may take a few minutes. But if I look at my storage pool now for my pool for Seattle, pool for Redmond, it's all 70 gig. They're both the same size. All the blocks are still the same. We're good to go. So there is a process that you have to do it. We will have it documented as well. Uh, the documents uh, currently being reviewed right now and it'll get out to the doc site in the HCI area. So it'll, it'll all be there. But to kind of recap it, get cluster fault domain XML, Get the XML file, create an XML file, modify it to add the nodes in, and then set it. Finally, add the nodes. Done. Good to go. So to wrap it up, what is Stretch? It's just different locations, room, building, city, whatever it is. Um, how is it created? You know, we do the auto, the auto sites for you. Uh, we showed you how to create the drives and replicate it. Three or four steps. Um, 
what happens in a site failure and how to add nodes. With that, thank you. You're on, Karsten. Yeah, thanks, John. That that was really interesting, and I'm looking forward to build larger than four node clusters for stretched. Uh, Jaromir has some questions for you, so we directly go to Jaromir. Sure, shoot. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. It was an awesome session. So we have many questions, so I will just pick uh, only several because we would stay here more than five minutes, definitely. So there is one from the Daryl. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that you need to have symmetric cluster, so both sides should be the same size, same amount of the nodes. Uh, can we have different? Can we have different number of nodes? Is, is it this is the hard requirement it's, or it's it's still a hard requirement? Daryl might be able to do this, but you might not be able to. So we have to, we have to err on the side of caution. At a later time, we'll start we'll start looking at it. You know, everything has to be the same as far as the volumes, as far as you know, is it mirror? Is it mirror accelerated parity? You know, whatever whatever it is on one side has to be on the same side as far as volumes. That's something we're looking at as as well. And we've had some people try that out. You know, mirror on one side, mirror and parity on the other. Just can't make it. You know, it all needs to be the same. It has to be symmetric. Even the number of the nodes, right? So I cannot have four nodes Correct. on the primary side and two nodes on the secondary side. Correct. Because at that point, you're talking about different size drives as well. So you may have like 18 gig, you know, a bunch of eight gig drives on one side uh, for the four nodes, but like 16 gig drives on the uh, second on the second side. Identically, they're not going to be the same. And well, how about the customers? They want to have, for example, one or two volumes that are not replicated plus two volumes that are replicated. So in the, total, you will have, let's say, four volumes, two replicated, two not replicated, and two you maybe want to just replicate to the two nodes that are on the other side. Totally fine. Totally fine. Totally fine. Just realize that, you know, if it's in, in our examples here, if those, if those drives are in Seattle and Seattle goes down, Whatever production was in was on those drives is not going to be available, but it's okay. perfectly fine. Not awesome. A problem. Awesome. So there is a, another question from Daryl, and I also find it very interesting. So how do I monitor the storage replication latency or hiccups? That is through either performance monitor or um, we've got some, there's some. Uh, storage replica events we've got a storage replica channel so uh, that has a lot of a lot of those type of events we also have some storage replica uh, performance counters as well so you can start monitoring that and you can always do a you know get dash sr partnership to see if it's all in sync and so forth and if awesome. everything's all healthy and windows admin center as well so i know jeff's coming up and He'll, he'll smack me if I don't say Windows Admin Center. <laughs> OK, then you have also some interesting questions from Anonymous uh, people. So uh, what is the minimum bandwidth uh, that is required for the storage replica? We're talking about going across the WAN. When you're going across the WAN, it's not. Um, we're not using RDMA. It's straight TCP because we can't. We can, RDMA is not going to traverse the WAN because of the amount of data that you could be sending. We don't want to. We don't want to choke out the network. So let's say it. Let's say it's a one gig. Uh, uh, one gig network that's that's between the sites. It might be okay, but if you're doing intensive stuff, you know, multiple SQL servers, your Exchange server. Um, don't make a drug, you know, just a lot of things that are that are more intensive. That's going to have a lot more IO. You're going to choke it out. If you choke the network out, that's also an, an um, you know, if it's just one network, that single network also has to carry the cluster heartbeats across. So the cluster still has to communicate with each other. So you may choke those out and you may get some inadvertent, you know, disconnect. Say we think the node is down. Let's take the node down, move everything off. And, and we don't want that. Um, the 
online and we're probably going to change we're probably going to change this it's one gig uh but it's more recommended a minimum of 10 gig and there's an additional um doc that uh dan cuomo has uh, written that, that's up there that kind of gives um some tables so you can start setting some bandwidth limits as well for the various different things okay so then we have also one quick question is the stretch cluster coming to windows server v next or is it azure stack hci only this is an azure stack hci only uh, okay feature but okay. Still, it doesn't mean that we're not gonna we're not gonna improve and add features to storage replica it's just this particular feature is going to be an azure stack on hci only the uh virtual machine uh affinity and anti-affinity levels that uh, jason had talked about earlier that's in both that actually came with azure stack hci but that's going to be one that that's in both or all flavors okay thank you very much there have been so many questions so many other questions uh, i think we will need to go on uh, to continue because we will have john right joining uh, joining us yeah jeff's on i'll get i'll get on the uh, chat and kind of oh, go Jeff, back sorry. through <laughs> I'll yeah, kind of go back through John, and start. Answering. John, Martin Thanks, is here. John, John, maybe you can answer some of the questions in the Q and A yourself for the people that are still there. But I, I want to take a minute to talk to uh, Jaromir. Oh, uh, Jaromir, oh. um, you are doing some great stuff for the community. You have this nice scripts, uh, the WS Lab scripts, and uh, I, I, I love them. And you have done so much great scenarios with them. So tell us what is it and where do we find it? But only in one minute because Jeff is waiting, okay? Oh, okay. So these are just the scripts that will help you spin some environment in the Hyper-V. So imagine you have a laptop or you have a server, you want to create there some consistent uh, infrastructure. So you want to have always domain controller and then several machines, right? Uh, so I helped you so you can simply create a DC and several machines and if you play with this and modify something and you want to get into the beginning where you started you just clean up the environment and you deploy it again so this is what I started with so you, you can have uh, let's say I don't know 10 machines to simulate a just ATI cluster but uh, this is not only that you can have machines like that you also have a scenario so if you navigate to GitHub, if you search for WS Lab, it, the first page you will find is a GitHub page. If you navigate there, there is a folder called Scenarios, and this will help you uh, understand how to spin, for example, a just like HCI stretch cluster, and you can spin it either in the laptop, in the Hyper-V, or you can reuse the same logic, same scripts for the real world environments. So you can even use it in production. And I see people using it uh, for their way to deploy. So basically they have a PowerShell script they can reuse in the production and then later keep it for the documentation of the deployment. Yeah, and I, I can uh, I can really tell you it's really great. It's called WS Lab. Uh, search in your favorite uh, um, search engine. And Yarome and I, we have done some sessions about it. And if you go on to his GitHub repository, you find also some videos about it. So, but now Jeff is waiting. I, we already took three minutes of his slot, but uh, Jeff, of course you can add it to the end. And I'm looking forward to Jeff's session. Jeff, you, you, the stage is yours. Go on, please. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karsten. You know, this is, a, I, I've been watching and listening throughout the entire day, and I, I have had to jump off a couple times for some other things and come back on, but I've been just kind of watching as the whole day has progressed. You know, we started off with Cosmos and Karim. We, we had Matt talking about AKS, some ARC, uh, Priya talking about Admin Center and deployment, uh, Prasid and Alvin talking about Hyper-V and VM management. We've had Lenovo talking about Think Agile MX. Um, we've had Dan, we've had um, uh, Anurban talking about networking SDN. Um, really, I mean, across the board, Jason talking about performance benchmarking and John talking about stretch clustering. And as this whole, you know, day was coming into focus and everyone was working on their on their different sessions, I was like, 
you know, I, I I'm I'm blown away by um, by what we're delivering in Azure Stack HCI, but I, I first have to to Karsten and Monfred and Yaramir and JT Isadora, everyone. Thank you for this awesome event. Uh, this whole Azure Stack HCI event, I, I just this is really fantastic, and I can't think of a a better inaugural way to kick off um, Azure Stack HCI like this. Um, when I think about you know not only Azure Stack HCI, uh, but I also of course thinking about all of our users are out there. So just a huge thank you to everyone that's been out there using Azure Stack HCI, the Windows Server 2019 HCI product, the folks that have downloaded the Azure Stack HCI 20H2 preview that have given us feedback to all of the MVPs who are constantly giving us feedback. And you know your passion drives us. You know, we want to make the product better and better each time. I know we've been watching questions. We've been answering questions. Uh, I love to hear where the questions go. Sometimes, you know, it's like, hey, let's dive deep into replication technology. Let's dive deep into SDN. Sometimes people are like, yeah, I don't want SDN. Just give me VLANs. You know, that's that's totally fine with what I need. Or sometimes people want to talk about business. You know, I'm on the engineering side of the house. I don't want to talk about licensing, but I get it. People want to talk about that. But it's your passion about the product and the technology. Um, it just, it's so invigorating. And I, my, my only my only wish right now is that we were all meeting somewhere in person, uh, li li like uh, like Germany, for example, and we could all go out and, and have, a, have a nice dinner together afterwards. And that will happen at some point, I know it will. But I just wanna say thank you to all of the users are out there because again, this product is for you. This really is. And, you know, when I say that, I say this specifically in mind because a bunch of the things that we have done in Azure Stack HCI, you may or not may may or may not realize, have been driven specifically by you. And I, I wanted to provide a, a few examples of that. Um, here are some of the common comments we have gotten, and and this this is over the years. This isn't just you know in the last you know. 12, 18 months. This is this has been, you know, going back to the beginning of Hyper-V and the beginning of Storage Spaces Direct and the beginning of SDN. And, you know, we've been getting lots of lots of questions. Here's one I get constantly. And I've even heard Karsten mention it a couple times today. Microsoft, you talk a lot about Azure and the cloud. What about on-prem? Do you care about on-prem? Oh, come on, people. Please. This whole day has been about on-prem. Let's be super clear here. Azure Stack HCI is an on-premises hardware product. Okay, I, I want you to think about that for just a second. When is the last time Microsoft built a product that has said, no, 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 this isn't for running in a VM. This isn't for running in the cloud. This isn't, no, no, this is specifically for infrastructure. Sure, you can install HCI and you can run it in a VM and you can test it and kick the tires and all. Absolutely, go right ahead, you know, party on. But that's not what this product is for. This product is specifically for hardware. OK, and by the way, that's true of the entire Azure Stack family, Edge and Hub, et cetera. But HCI, boy, let me tell you, I couldn't underline this more if I tried. Also, this one I've gotten so many times over the years. Microsoft, you light up a lot of hardware features in Azure and you do it faster, like massive VMs. Can we get that faster innovation on premises? So for example, you know, we've been delivering Windows Server for the last two, you know, on a two to three year release cycle, basically for the last 20 years, give or take a little change here. One time we actually were a lot faster, but for the most part, it's every two to three years. And so everyone would say, you know what? I wish you'd go faster, at least for the hardware innovation, like give me nested faster, give me new flash support faster, give me support for this new offload device or this new motherboard support or whatever. But Windows Server, it's too slow. It's two to three years. Well, Azure Stack HCI is very much like that because Azure does move a lot faster. Azure does have monster VMs that have 24 terabytes of RAM and hundreds and hundreds of cores and terabytes of RAM support. And we've had that up in Azure for a little while. And by the way, we bring that down on premises eventually. Well, the goal here is as Azure Stack aligns closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to Azure, 
we can give you that faster. And at the same time, the stuff that's running in the VMs, the Windows Server stuff that honestly, as much as you say you want us to touch it, you really don't want us to touch it. You really just want to deploy your VM and you just want to patch it when you have to, but you really don't want to touch it. Okay, and the reason why I know this is because how many of you are still, you know, telling me you just upgraded to 2012 R2? So, so I, uh, I know, you know, you want that innovation on premises, that faster innovation on the hardware. Well, that, that's what Azure Stack HCI does, is it takes its cues from Azure. And we're going to continue to do that. Microsoft, we love Storage Spaces Direct. This is something I, 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 I've been listening on the call about how much of the conversation on today is around S2D and around storage. And in general, people just love Storage Spaces Direct. I mean, when you think what we've done with, with software-defined storage, it's really pretty mind-boggling. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that, you know, people keep asking for it to scale more. Do, you know, we blow past four petabytes. You know, 2016 supported a petabyte. 20, 2019 supported four petabytes, and people want way more than that. Oh, okay, awesome. Why? Because they love it. Okay, but that upfront cost could, cost could be daunting. So guess what? Azure Stack HCI has no upfront cost. Ten dollars per physical core per month. Okay, and part of the reason we can do this is because we are creating a clean slate. Okay, and 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 that clean slate is actually a very, very good thing for all of us. I've made this joke for a long time, but it's still quite true. I've been trying to get rid of fax server out of Windows Server now for a very, very long time. It's never gonna happen. Okay, I'll admit, we got it out of server core, but it's still in Windows Server with the full GUI, with the full desktop experience. And I don't think I'll ever be able to get rid of it as much as I've tried. And this pandemic has actually been a good reminder of that because turns out there's still a bunch of countries, there's still a bunch of locations where the, the, law, the law, the legal requirements are so old that they're still using fax machines. So there are some countries, Germany is one of them, by the way, um, where guess what? They still need fax machines. So with Azure Stack HCI, we get a clean slate. There's no fax server. There's no print server. No, no, we're going to focus on making this the modern best solution we can. And I'm very, very excited about the fact that it is a clean slate. And in fact, it takes me to this one. And this one I've heard for a very, very long time. Microsoft, we just want the infrastructure. Give me an infrastructure solution. And that's what Azure Stack HCI is. It is an infrastructure product. It is a hardware product. It is focused on being the best infrastructure product out there. And that's its laser laser focus. And you know, it 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 fits with this vision we have, which is look, we want to make sure that it's part of a strategy. Okay. If you if you want to continue to run Stack HCI and you're you you want to focus on Stack HCI on prem, party on. If you want to be connected to the cloud, you want it to be part of your edge solution, you want it to be part of your data center solution, you want it to be disconnected from time to time, great. We want to make sure we can do that, but we also want to make sure we can deliver your Azure services on-prem too. So it is part of a bigger, bigger strategy, but it's a it's an incredibly, you know, it's, it's a long-term strategy, and that's why we're making these huge big bets in this. So I feel like I'm coming in today to have this conversation to kind of kind of put a wrapper on everything that's been talked about today because everyone's been going deep and I kind of want to take a step back and I want to make sure that everybody's clear on you know what what we're doing here and why we're doing it and talk about some of the you know the, the, the goals of being able to have a clean slate with Azure Stack HCI. So what's new? Well let's start off with what's new for Azure Stack HCI. Boom! CRN Tech Innovators Winner Award 2020. Just got this. I'm very proud of this. Why? CRN looked at this and said, wow, Microsoft, you are doing some pretty awesome things here with Stack HCI. Not only are you doing some fantastic things with software-defined technologies, but this whole hybrid strategy makes a ton of sense. Why on earth would you deploy a file server today on premises without using Azure FileSync to get you bottomless storage? Why wouldn't you use 
storage replication or VM replication or these technologies that are there. And so they looked at this and they said, Microsoft, this is hands down 2020 tech, tech innovators winner. Very proud of this. So going to that clean slate, I don't like to spend a lot of time on this. Cosmos talked about this earlier, but it is a new OS. And I'm very excited about this because it is the same Azure hypervisor. And for the one millionth time in a row, Hyper-V is so, so critical to Microsoft as more than just a virtualization platform. It is probably the most shipped hypervisor on earth. I can hear all the VMware people freaking out. What did he just say? That can't, no way, how dare he? Well, it shipped in Windows 10. It shipped in Windows Server. It's used in Azure. It's used in every Azure Stack product. It's even shipping in all of the new Xboxes, including the brand new Xbox Series S and Xbox Series X. And it's been shipping in Xbox for a while. It's deployed everywhere. Now, we don't get on top of uh, rooftops and scream about Hyper-V like we did 10 years ago, because quite honestly, that's not what customers are talking to us about. Customers come to us and say, Jeff, my business, is we, virtualization is just a little tiny piece of it. We want to know what the cloud strategy is. And that's the same thing at Microsoft. We're looking at this at a much larger lens. We're looking at folks, how do we provide folks the hybrid cloud strategy for the future. And Azure Stack HCI is a key part of it because guess what, it aligns with Azure. This whole familiar for IT to manage and operate, this goes to everyone on this call. 10, 10 years ago, I remember Jeffrey Snover and I were telling everybody, we're begging you, please learn your PowerShell. It's gonna be important to your resume. It's gonna be important to your growth, it's going to be important to your career. And I remember Jeffrey saying this. He says, if you don't learn PowerShell, you're going to be flipping burgers in a couple of years. And, you know, at first it felt like that was a little harsh. But the more I thought about it, I thought, you know what? It's it's what we call tough love here. And, you know, it's what it was. And guess what? I see everybody talking about PowerShell. It's just constant. Everybody knows their PowerShell. I'm sitting there watching John use it. I'm watching folks using it throughout the day. But it's one of those key technologies. Everybody knows their PowerShell. And so while we are starting with a clean slate with Azure Stack HCI, we're also bringing the stuff that you know and making things better. And so, yes, it's the core technologies. It's Hyper-V. It's S2DN, S2D. It's SDN. It's the fact that we have this fantastic ecosystem like our friends here at Lenovo. Huge shout out to our friends at Lenovo. Thank you for all your support. And the fact that, you know, we have a huge ecosystem and that folks can choose the right product for their needs. Do you need something really small to go in a small coffee shop or in a small edge location? Two nodes but with still redundancy and resiliency, we got you covered. In something data center class, we got you covered there as well. System center just layers in because everything we're doing is complementary. I'm gonna keep saying this and saying this and saying this. Windows Admin Center is complementary to System Center. Windows Admin Center is complementary to the Azure portal. And all of them are complementary to each other. Admin Center does stuff that System Center can't do. If I need to configure a server, if I need to actually configure roles, look at things. There are things that I can only do in Admin Center that I can't do in System Center. If I need enterprise class management for racks and racks and racks and racks and, racks and servers, or I need um, operations management integration, I need orchestration, guess what? System Center is there. Oh, of course, the Azure portal is there as well, and we'll talk about that. And of course, what makes us different is, again, it's delivered as an Azure hybrid subscription service. So again, we're going to say, look, instead of saying, hey, I got to buy a bunch of data centers up front to use S2D, guess what? $10 per core. And that native integration, you saw Cosmos and Karim talk about this, go really dive deep into this this morning. I love the fact, and again, it's a new product. It's a new OS. That Azure integration is built in. The fact that I don't have to download a bunch of agents, don't have to download a bunch of scripts. Nope, it's just right there. And because it has that Azure integration, 
it means we can do so much more to enable so much more capabilities and management and insights for your stuff running on prem. And again, I'm going to keep saying on prem because this is an on prem focused device product. And so Azure Stack HCI appears as a resource here in Azure. Fantastic. And it's just as simple as, hey, guess what? Here I am. I logged into Admin Center. And guess what? Here's my cluster. I'm just going to register this cluster. You saw Karim and you saw um, Cosmos talk about the PowerShell implementation going deep and how you can do all of this via PowerShell. But for that customer who just needs to deploy a couple nodes, we don't want them to have to use PowerShell. We're going to make this easy. We want to make sure everybody can easily deploy these solutions. So click on register this cluster and guess what? I'm just going to register my cluster. We're going to make this really easy for folks to use. And by the way, there was a question earlier um, about admin center versus PowerShell. When should I use one versus the other for things like deployment or something like that? And the answer is always going to be, well, you know what? Use which one is most comfortable for you. If you're just deploying a two node and boy, you've never done this before, this is really super simple. If you were deploying lots of things at scale and PowerShell you're comfortable with, guess what? PowerShell is probably the way to go. But that's the beauty of this because Admin Center, of course, layers on top of PowerShell. So just register your Azure Stack HCI and you're ready to rock and roll. And now you have that ability because now you've registered it with Azure. Now you have the ability to get better insights. And one of the things that I was doing as we were working on Azure Stack HCI, and I was kind of going through emails and going through kind of a archaeological dig over my last you know, 10 years talking with large customers and things they were trying to do. One thing I, I saw a few Fortune 500 companies you know, kind of complain about and ask about was better insight for their estate. They'd say, Jeff, I got data centers all over the place. I got branch offices all over the place. How do I know what I have? It's a real simple question, yet I can't figure it out. How many servers do I have? How many versions of SQL do I have? How many of this application do I have? How many servers? How many disks? How many SANs? All of this stuff. Can, can I see all of this? And what people would do is they would try and take System Center and they'd try to federate these two things together or they'd use whatever you know management tools that they would have, these enterprise tools, and they would try to come up with some way to transform the data so that they could come up with a view that would kind of show them what they have. They were never happy. And what we're essentially doing now is by saying, look, you register your Azure Stack HCI, guess what? Now we have this point of truth where we can see all of your Stack HCI. Most importantly, you can see all of your stack ATI and you can have a better idea of what your estate looks like. You can categorize it, you can organize it into resource groups. You can, of course, leverage identity access management to make sure the right people have the right access. And all of a sudden now you have visibility. Much, much greater visibility. And you know, the fact that you can literally plug in a stack ATI, register it, and it appears in a console, that 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 to a lot of people is almost like magic. You know, let me give you a perfect example. You know, you're, you're an organization in the US and you start in the West Coast and you start plugging in some Stack HCIs in California and Oregon and Washington and Nevada. And as you plug these in and register, guess what? They just appear on the console. And maybe, you know what? We say, hey, these are my California Azure Stack HCIs. And here is my Oregon, my Washington, and my Nevada. And maybe I actually group these into a region and say, this is my West Coast. And over time, as I grow, I've got some in Texas. I've got some in, in Colorado. I continue to grow on the East Coast. Guess what? They just continue to just pop up in my Azure portal. And now, not only do they have the ability to visibly see them and know, OK, guess what? Here are all these different clusters. Here's how many nodes are in each cluster. Here's how many VMs are running on each cluster. I can also do things like deploy policy, apply governance, and actually have a consistent set of policy and governance for everything. And the way you do that today, of course, is you know everybody that does this with for for into server uses group policy. But now you can have a way to deploy things in Azure, deploy things on prem, and use a consistent policy for all of these things. And so again. This is, you know, because we're starting with a clean slate, we're able to do things in a richer, richer way. 
And the whole subscription thing, quite honestly, you know, I, I'm, I, I, I've, I've talked to so many customers who are like, oh yeah, I get it. That makes, it makes total sense. I mean, we're already doing stuff in the cloud. We're already using M365 when we're already doing stuff. And you're just telling me this appears as another light item on my bill and finance has already approved that. Sure, no problem. This may totally make sense. Got it. Yeah, it makes sense. And part of our goal here is to have these frictionless software updates. Because we are developing a focused infrastructure product, again, we're going to leverage the abilities and things that we have learned from Azure, continue to drive those into Stack HCI. So we can deliver that hardware innovation. How many times did I hear the words storage come up today and GPU come up today? Okay, we want to be able to deliver that innovation quickly. Well, we can do that on a you know yearly cadence. You know, two to three years, you're going to complain to me, go, Jeff, that's going to take too long. Well, Stack HCI, guess what? It's a different cadence. And and speaking of new features, you know. We just got finished with John talking about this, and I love hearing talk uh, John talk about stretch clustering because he can go into crazy detail in how stretch clustering works. But if you take a step back and just talk about the problems you're solving with stretch clustering, that's where it gets so interesting. Because there are so many customers who look at stretch clustering and these 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 types of technologies and go, oh yeah, that stuff costs millions of dollars. We can't afford that. And trust me, I remember when this stuff cost millions of dollars and you needed a PhD to set this up. Okay. I mean, it was in, insane talking about doing, you know, clustering 10, 20 years ago, the stretch cluster. It was crazy, you know, and everyone go, oh, yeah, that, yeah, someday that will be available for mere mortals, but, you know, it's just too crazy. You need a SAN, you need all this expensive hardware, you need like 10 different teams to do it. And now we're saying, no, 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 stretch clustering is simply built in Azure Stack HCI. And a key part of this has been about making it easy. I mean, if you boil down what we're doing in stretch clustering, here are the steps, you know, choose your cluster, select your, your servers in two sites, click create. All right. Give your sites names and apply the changes. Okay. Configure a quorum. What kind of quorum do you want to use? Do you want to use a cloud witness? By the way, cloud witness is so sweet because it means you don't need to set up another VM. You don't need to set up another piece of hardware. You don't have to have a VM running on your cluster that uses up resources. And a cloud witness costs like like pennies, it's like almost free, okay? But if you don't want to, you can use a disk witness or a file share witness. I get it if you you know don't want to use that, but it's right there. But you have those different options. Create your volume. By the way, synchronous or asynchronous. This is stuff, this this little item here alone, I, I remember when storage vendors would cost you tens of thousands of dollars for what you see on this, on this pullout right here, where it says synchronous and asynchronous. The way you used to do this is you would buy the SAN. And by the way, your SAN vendor would go, oh, by the way, did you want to do replication with this? You're going to need the license for that. That's going to be another ten, twenty thousand dollars X, whatever it was. No, that's just right here. So choose what your replication mode is, asynchronous or synchronous. Choose, you know, your source replication, your destination, your log vol. You can encrypt the replication traffic right there in a the checkbox. Create your volume, deploy your VM on your volume, which is being replicated and boom, you've got your stretch cluster. All that was done in a workflow. Very straightforward, walking you through the whole process. And here you can see, got two different cities set up, Seattle, Bellevue, we can do this. It's uh, you know 40 miles away, so synchronous is not a problem. You know, provided we got the 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 the, um, the network pipes for it. Seattle goes down. Guess what? It can come up on Bellevue. And by the way, affinity rules, all part and parcel, makes sense. Of course, you may have some things that you want to make sure that are strongly affinitized to stay to, to, uh, to, to with each other. You may have things that you want to make sure that they stay apart on different sites, like domain infrastructure. So you can set up those affinity rules, all part and parcel built here in Admin Center. But the point is, we're looking at this from a clean slate. We're putting this brand new Admin Center UI on this. 
we're giving you these fantastic, easily integrated workflows. And trust me, as we hear your feedback, we will continue to simplify and ease them and make them even better. So that's part of Stack HCI. Then of course, self-service. This is something that of course people have been asking around, people have been asking about for a while now, which is, look, we have the ability to do self-service um, up in the cloud, but I want to be able to do that with online, with, with my on-prem stuff as well. Now keep in mind that Stack HCI is really a stateless tool. It's a, only a little bit of state that we actually maintain. It's, it's almost next to nothing. And so with something like this, where you actually do need to manage state, you need to manage identity, you need to have some lightly isolated tenancy. Well, we need the cloud to help us out. And again, this is where that whole hybrid aspect really helps us out because now we can delegate to others, uh, other Azure users. We can use our Azure AD. It all fits into that consistent identity that we've been helping you set up with your on-prem AD and Azure AD. So again, it's part of a fully meaningful realized strategy there. And I have to take a quick moment to talk about performance. And I, I, I we, <laughs> there were a couple comments earlier today that made my jaw drop. Um, so I actually quickly dropped in this section. It's time for a little performance reminder, and that's and I'm happy to do it. Um, there was a there was some comments today about flash performance and storage performance. Um, just a quick reminder, everyone. So we have our software-defined storage stack, Hyper-V, so storage-based direct and STN. Just a reminder that in 2016, 2016, we set this IOPS record. That was September 26. 2016, that 16 server nodes running Windows Server 2016, delivered almost 6.7 million IOPS. To this day, I have never seen anyone meet the, beat this. Now that was 2016, okay? In 2018, we went back and we said, hey, let's go retest that. So we went and worked with our friends over at Intel, and at the time they were working on Optane DC persistent memory. And guess what? We worked very closely with them and we were the first ones out the shoot to have native support in Windows Server 2019. Extreme low latency, big capacity. And with that, and we actually went out and tested it. And this was with uh, uh, 1.5 terabyte Intel Optane DC persistent memory. This was with 32 terabyte NVMEs. This is with two Mellanox 25 gigabit NICs. And this was using Windows Server 2019. And just as a reminder, how did that test go? Well, here's the actual test we ran. Here is a, um, this was an early version of, of Admin Center. Uh, you can see it had 12 total servers. It had 72 total drives. It had a total of 312 virtual machines. It had a total of 14 volumes. You can see in this in this test that the, uh, the VMs were turned off. Everything was totally healthy. Um, in terms of storage, there was 91 total terabytes of storage. It was only using just under 16 terabytes of storage. Uh, you can see in terms of servers, here's the inventory of servers. These are all Intel servers. You can see there are 12 of them. Um, there's their model number, and in terms of drives, here's the inventory of drives, and of course we can sort by type. So you can see here's all the persistent memory. Okay, you can see it's being used for cache. You can see these are 768 gigabyte persistent memory disks. All right, and you can see that we're actually using interleaving because we were maximizing the performance. So we were not only just reading one DIM at a time, we we're actually interleaving that. So we get we can actually read from both drives simultaneously. And then here's the NVMe. So this is again, 2018, and these are using 7.28 terabyte NVMe drives. And then of course, if we scroll down as a reminder, you know, this is a, again, this is from 2018. So you can see this is an older version of Admin Center. You can see our cluster IOPS performance. This is when no VMs were running. So the, the system was largely idle. So there's, you know, no latency and very, very few IOPS are actually happening here. Um, and so basically it was time to start running the test. And so to, to, to hit this test, as a reminder, for us to actually uh, do this IOPS record, we needed to add another digit. 
So we did 6.7 with Windows Server 2016, and with 2019, we had over 300 virtual machines, and the first thing we did was we said, okay, let's go turn on a bunch of VMs. And so we went back here. You can see from the performance standpoint, what I love about this demo is you can see in real time as it stair steps up all of that performance and it's firing up that first, you know, 100 set of virtual machines and it's doing a million IOPS and the latency is ridiculous. That's 5.8 and those are, that's not, you know, that's, that, 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 that's the microseconds. Okay, this crazy, crazy, crazy performance. Then we went and we said, okay, let's fire up, you know, let's load up server number two. And what happened? Well, we got that stair step approach. So we went up and we got 2 million IOPS. And you can see the latency is still less than a millisecond. Still, 2 million IOPS. We're not even breaking a sweat here. And so we continued to just fire these things up until we, we saturated all 12 servers. And as we watch the stair steps climb, one, two, three million, four million. You notice the latency still in the low teens, not even milliseconds, still in the microseconds. So seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 million IOPS, still one millisecond, less than a millisecond latency. So the record we set was 13,798,674 IOPS. As I mentioned before, I haven't seen anybody beat the record that we set with 2016 at 6.7, yet we doubled it with 25% fewer servers. So let me just be super clear here. I don't know of any HCI that performs faster than this, period. Now, keep in mind what I just showed you is like two years old. Today, well, a lot has changed. What do I mean by that? Well, Flash is about 2x faster. So that storage that we used back in 2018 was Intel P4510s, about 583,000 random IOPS. Well, today, a P5600 delivers over a million. By the way, the server back there was PCIe Gen 3. Today, of course, PCIe Gen 4 is double the speed. Back then, we used 25 gig NICs, which honestly today seems kind of laughable because 25 gig now is entry level. If you're deploying a three node, four node HCI cluster, are you using 10 gig? No, I don't think so using 25 gig, that's entry level. And by the way, today, standard is really 40 to 50. Most everybody I'm talking to saying, yeah, oh yeah, we're deploying four to six nodes. Yeah, it's 40 to 50 at least. And we're starting to see, you know, 100 gig NICs, that's starting to become more common. And as we see the rise of PCIe Gen 4, it's gonna become ridiculously common. So do I have a new number for today? No, no, I don't, but, that number, I'm sure we could smoke 13 million. Absolutely. I just don't, we just, are, we're a little busy right now and haven't had the, uh, the time to sit down and rerun a bunch of numbers. But I'm confident we could easily smoke 13 million IOPS today. That's how confident I am in Azure Stack HCI. And by the way, it's only going to get faster and it only is getting faster. And then finally, when it comes to Azure Stack HCI, you know, this should be a no brainer to everyone, but of course it's the best place to run Windows Server. And that's for a lot of reasons. Um, one thing I wanna remind everyone, I'm not sure if everybody heard about this, but it's extended security updates for Server 2008 R2. Now I wanna be clear here. I don't want you to use this. I don't want a customer to use this. Last thing I wanna hear is a customer says, hey, I'm buying Azure Stack HCI just so I can use, you know, get the extended security updates. I don't want to hear that. But at the same time, I'm also aware that there are some organizations that say, Jeff, we have been working on it. We have moved to newer operating systems, but we've got some that for whatever reason are taking longer than expected. Okay, I get it. Then guess what? This definitely is the best way to do it. Okay, we're gonna give you extended security updates because this is Azure. This is Azure Stack HCI. Um, one really valuable feature that people really love is something we call automatic virtual machine activation. And 
I know this feature very well. I was actually the PM that spec this years and years and years ago. Um, um, and I know how incredibly important it is. And everybody loves it, quite honestly, because it just makes licensing super simple. Just use your unused Windows Server data center key into your Azure Stack HCI host and party on, and you get automatic VM activation. So that's a great feature of Azure Stack HCI. Industry leading performance. So I just quoted you 13.7 million. By the way, if you're wondering, you know, we blogged about all of that years ago. You can just do a search for 13.7 million. You can find all of the specifics of the test we set up and everything. But this one is recent. This one is on a Think Agile MX. And this is um, uh, this one was just on a four node server. And here they were running SQL and they were getting over a million SQL server batch requests per second per cluster. And storage review was quite honestly blown away. Storage review was like, we ran this test multiple times because we couldn't believe what we were seeing. The performance is exceptional. And spoiler alert, it's only going to get better because we've got some awesome, awesome new innovation uh, coming down the pike. But already right now, it's the fastest out there. And that's why we run storage reviews, um, uh, HCI uh, performance leader uh, for 2019. So finally, we get to unified host guest management. And of course, we have Admin Center. And I love the fact that Admin Center continues to refine, to get better, to provide more insights. Uh, we have this you know, ability to quickly you know, see insights into the hardware, whether it's IOPS, whether it's latency and more. The, the work that we've been doing in drives to actually help with um, understanding drive latency and error statistics. Just as a reminder, in case you're wondering, a bunch of this actually came from the work that we've been doing in Azure. So again, it makes a ton of sense. We bring that Azure intelligence uh, on-prem and it helps us understand as we see bat characteristics and, and drives that are failing, we start to understand those and we apply those here. Um, finally, of course, is AKS on HCI and Matt did a fantastic job on this or, or an earlier um, deploying it and showing this. But if you take a step back, the, the, the reason why this is so critical is because if you look at how people are deploying workloads, sure, people have been deploying workloads in VMs for the last 10, 15 years. Got it. Totally get it. Right there with you. But going forward, you <laughs> know, sure, VMs are going to be there, but containers are very quickly becoming the preferred way to deploy. And please don't, don't argue with me. You're going to say, no, no, I got a customer. It's still running. VM. I get it. They're running VMs today. I get it. Trust me. They're going to be running containers. Okay. The number of people that I've spoken to that say, hey, I'm kicking the tires to, no, now we're running this in production has greatly spiked. And part of that has to do with COVID, quite honestly, because as innovation is being spur spurred on and people are looking at how can I deploy applications and new services faster, developers are just deploying them and writing them as containers. And so Kubernetes. And the Azure Kubernetes service is actually the fastest adopted growing service on Azure in history. It's growing like mad. And what we've seen is people going, hey, you know, we're deploying stuff on AKS, but you know, what? I really want this on prem. And again, that's why this whole Azure Stack HCI makes so much sense here. Because as you deploy containers, as you deploy applications, we're saying, guess what? You can now deploy those on prem. And if you look at why people love AKS so much. It's because we handle the K part for them. Kubernetes. For if you've never set up Kubernetes before, or if you have and been frustrated by it, well, stand in line just like a lot of people have. Setting up and managing your own Kubernetes is not fun. OK, sure, people get better at it over time, but at the end of the day, the care and feeding of Kubernetes can be, you know, it's just more work. Well, Azure Kubernetes service, you just simply deploy your container, we'll handle the rest. Well, that's the same thing with AKS. We're saying you deploy this and guess what? We'll keep this up to date for you. We'll patch it, we'll manage it. You don't have to worry about that. You just focus on deploying the containers. And guess what? Those containers are the same exact containers that you deployed on Azure, are the same exact containers you're deploying on AKS on Azure Stack HCI. So, so excited about this because what it means is, We've placed our customers in a great solution for today. 
for the stuff that they know right now, their Hyper-V, their storage space is direct, their VMs, they know that stuff. We've given them hybrid capabilities, things like Azure File Sync, Azure Backup, ASR, and we've prepared them for going forward with containers. So when they are ready for containers, and maybe they say, look, I'm not ready right now, but maybe next year I will be, or maybe tomorrow I will be, well, guess what? Kubernetes service on HCI, secured and supported top to bottom by Microsoft. And that is absolutely where customers are going. And that's why I'm so happy to be on this call with you guys, because I want to make sure you guys understand this. This is kind of, you know, that next big thing you want to make sure you have on your resume, you have on your CV, that you have on your business card. People want to know, hey, are you, you comfortable with AKS? You know how to deploy containers on AKS? Yes, I can do it on AKS and I can do it on AKS on HCI. And so, you know, like I said at the very beginning, um, I'm excited about Stack HCI and I'm excited that it's an on-premises focused product. Like I said from the very beginning, this is an on-prem, on-prem, on this is a hardware product. And so it, it's, it's, it's a clean slate that allows us to do lots new, take the stuff that you're familiar with, the stuff that you like, and deliver a lot more. So yes, it's a new OS, it's got hybrid built in, it's delivered as a service, but it's got exciting new features like stretch clustering and more. And we're gonna make sure that it's a great place to run your Windows Server, um, you know, now going forward, your AKS, whether that's Linux or Windows containers, we've got you covered. And we're gonna continue to make sure that we've got this uh, fantastic uh, story um, with, with hybrid management, with your on-prem, and this all just works together. So I know you guys all know this, but just your, just your quick reminder, azure.com for HCI. So that's it for me. Um, like I said, I feel like I was playing, playing uh, the cleanup role, as we say in sports over here. Um, a huge thank you to all my colleagues, uh, Cosmos, Karim, Matt, Priya, Prasid, uh, Dan, um, John, Jason, uh, Honor Bond. This has been a, a really a fantastic event top to bottom, and I cannot thank uh, Karsten and JT and, and uh, Manfred for, for all of your support and for this really, really fantastic inaugural Azure Stack HCI day. With that, I will pass it back to Karsten. Yeah, thanks Jeff so much for this wrap up uh, of everything. And um, I think you answered every question Jaromir was queuing up, so uh, thanks a lot. And now it's time for me also to thank all the speakers. Um, please show the speaker slide. Yeah, we had a fantastic lineup. Uh, we had uh, Cosmos and Karim in the first session. We had, uh, I have to look, <laughs> Priya was here talking about uh, Windows Admin Center, the cluster wizard. Dan was there for networking and Arimba. Uh, no, this was with Arin, I, I, Ariban. So uh, we had great sessions, met with uh, all the stuff. I, I'm so thankful that all you guys uh, took the time to present the new stuff about Azure Stack HCI. Udo uh, representing our sponsor was also a very good question. And I want also to thank our community supporters. Um, Manfred right next to me, uh, we were in his studio and uh, it was really great. And now they, we see the community supporters. Manfred, do we see them? We see them. No stress, it's yes. late. <laughs> <laughs> now we see them. So uh, Jan Torrell from Norway, great job. Didier, great job. Manfred, of course. Uh, Dave was here half the time. I, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't uh, the chance to get him live on, uh, but Dave is also doing the M MVP days. Uh, great thing, online event, and the next S2D days will be in early December. Uh, Dave moved them from uh, now uh, uh, to December because we had this event. Uh, Isadora, really great job uh, introducing uh, um, and chatting with us. Great. Jaromir, VS Lab, fantastic. Daryl, uh, thanks for showing up and doing the great work with the uh, Slack channel. And of course, Helmut, my friend from Austria, always funny. And I'm looking forward to Experts Live AT. Um, in January. So that's 
all I want to say, it's late, it's 10 minutes to 12. Um, um, thank you, thank the audience. We have still 130 people or 23 people live. This is a great outcome because most of them, if they are from Europe, they have to work tomorrow morning. So thanks for staying so long and we will hurry with the recording. So if you missed things, I hope you can watch them later. Manfred, last words? Yeah. We had not only had more than 300 attendees, we also had more than 200 questions in yeah. the Q&A. And I think this is a great thing that this was so interactive. So a lot of people asked and uh, it was great that the community supporters and also the presenters were able to answer most of these questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted now and it was great. So thank you all and uh, have a nice night or a nice day. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye, Carson. Bye bye, Didier. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. High five. high five to everyone. Great, great, great job. But we are still Good. live. So. I know. <laughs> Again, great job, guys. And go. Thank bye. you. Thank you.